This conference will now be recorded. Okay. <laughs> now, how do I get rid of the little... Oh, ah! Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, um, I will shut off the recording at lunch and then try to remember to put it back on this afternoon. <laughs> All right, so we were talking about rigid dressings, and um, I know Alex had said his dad has has been in the hospital and done some of these. Again, I have not worked at a hospital where this is common at all, but but it is recommended um, in the CPGs that were published by the VA last year or in 2017, I think it was. Um, but there isn't a lot of, of of information. There's not a lot of research on on the benefits of them, but what is out there does show that they're beneficial. Um, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Um, beyond rigid dressings, we also, oh, here's some advantages. All right, so I talked about this a little bit yesterday. It is gonna protect the wound from trauma. So if somebody falls out of bed, if somebody bumps into the bed rail, um, it's going to protect the wound better than any other, uh, especially soft type of uh, wrap on the, on the residual limb. It helps to keep the knee extended. So you can see in this top photo, they, especially in the transtibial amputees, they want to incorporate the knee into the rigid removable dressing or rigid dressing. It's going to help control the edema, encourage wound healing. Um, again, so there's something called an IPOP. Why do I always do this? I always forget to, because I call it an IPOP so often. Um, I forget what the ac actual acronym is for. Um, it's, a, it's immediate post-operative prosthesis. That's it. Yes. So I have seen these in practice. Um, a, a, a few times and so basically the this is <clears throat> right in the the OR this is uh, put onto the patient so it is a rigid dressing but a pylon and potentially a prosthetic knee some sort of um, some sort of componentry is attached to it I shouldn't say it's a prosthetic knee because I'm pretty sure it's just a pylon and a foot um, this is something that occasionally is done with folks so that they can immediately when they wake up from surgery they see a foot um, they believe there's some psychological benefit to having an IPOP placed on. Um, it allows for quicker rehab. Now, these folks can't go ahead and just start weight bearing, full weight bear through these things. It is a gradual weight bearing process um, that starts out with partial weight bearing at a certain percentage of their body weight. Um, and then they progress forward from that. But it is a nice way for people to get up and get moving quickly. And it, it does kind of get them used to having to wear a prosthetic leg. Um, Again, the disadvantages are these do require skilled fabrication. Um, so we, they have to be done by a surgeon who knows what they're doing or a prosthetist, somebody specialized in, in these devices. Um, they need to be maintained due to volume loss. So if um, with the uh, rigid removable or rigid dressings, um, they need to, there's gonna be volume loss. And so essentially if they start to get very loose, then things need to be changed. Um, potentially the patient needs to be recasted if it's before that five to 14 days. Um, and again, monitoring for skin breakdown. Now rigid removable dressings um, are something like down here in the bod on the bottom. So these essentially are rigid dressings, but they have Velcro um, so that the wound is more easily accessed. Um, I still don't see these used very often, even though they give the, the docs the opportunity and the nurses to take a look at the wound. So again, hopefully in the future, more research is done on the benefits of these types of things and, and how they do actually help with healing and with eventually getting the person um, into a prosthetic sooner than later. <clears throat> so compression liners are another thing that potentially can be applied right after surgery. Um, Again, I haven't really seen these in practice. Um, so they are used about seven days after surgery. So post-op seven days, they are a silicone liner. Um, they can be sterilized. They do provide gradient compression. So depending on how much uh, compression the surgeon, this, usually it's a surgeon, decides they wanna have on that limb. Um, it protects the distal end, helps the leg to start to adapt to that liner environment because eventually these folks are gonna be wearing, likely going to be wearing a liner with a prosthetic limb. And it teaches the patient early on how to don and doff that liner and helps to stabilize the distal limb. But again, I haven't really seen these in practice. I think they're a great idea, but um, probably underutilized. <clears throat> So at this time, we're still avoiding um, trauma to the incision. 
protecting the wound. What we have to be careful about in therapy, because we're getting these folks in and out of the bed and maybe bringing them down to the rehab gym, is that sometimes these wounds dehiss right in therapy. And there's a lot of blood and it's not, it's traumatic in that there's a lot of blood, but it's usually not dangerous to the patient. Um, the, the surgeon or the, the physiatrist or whoever's in charge of the patient at the time um, usually just makes sure the wound's covered back up and we sort of continue on our way. But it does happen pretty often. Uh, so I try to warn students that it's not unusual to have somebody in therapy and have their wound break open. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they didn't fall and that's what happened. Usually it's that <clears throat> we have them on a, a mat table and they just rubbed the wound the wrong way. And if it looks like this already in therapy, this is probably all going to come out and it's not usually an emergent situation. <clears throat> so one of the other things we make sure of early on in the rehab process is that we're preventing contractures. This is going to make your life as a prosthetist much easier if our patient comes to you with normal range of motion in all of their joints. Um, so with a transtibial amputee, we absolutely want to avoid knee and hip flexion. Now these folks are sitting a lot during the day. Um, we want them out of bed to help their cardiovascular system, but we also want to try to limit how much that hip is flexed uh, because that hip is going to tighten up right away. <clears throat> um, we, when they are sitting, we try to make sure that we have, especially if they're in a wheelchair, that they have some sort of uh, extension board or something underneath the limb to keep the knee, if they're a transtibial amputee, in extension. Uh, if we don't have wheelchairs, again, I think I've told you I've worked in urban hospital settings most of the time. So sometimes our equipment wasn't the greatest. Not all of our wheelchairs had leg rests like this. So we would essentially tuck a sliding board wrapped with towels and sort of taped up to make it cushiony. We would tuck a sliding board underneath the seat cushion and make sure that that leg was fully extended out onto the sliding board. So if you are visiting hospitals and you're on a rehab unit, <clears throat> and the therapists aren't aware of how to keep that leg straight if they don't have a leg extension on the wheelchair, that's a nice trick. Um, a lot of therapists know it, but it's good to know anyway. We also make sure that the nurses, this is a big one, because they want the patient to be comfortable, but we want to make sure the nurses know that there's no pillows allowed under the knee joints. They don't need to be propping up the patient to be comfortable under, um, under their knee joints. That's going to flex the knee and it's going to flex the hip. Um, we try to make sure that they stay in a supine or prone position for a prolonged stretch. If the person's healthy enough and is able to get onto their stomach while they're in the hospital bed, which isn't easy to do if anybody's been in a hospital bed, you know how uncomfortable those things are and how squishy they are. Um, I try to get uh, encourage them to lay on their stomach for at least 10 minutes, three times a day. That helps to stretch out the anterior abdominal muscles. It helps to stretch out the hip flexors. It's good for their back as well. So if they don't have a lot of breathing issues, our obese patients, our elderly patients might not be able to get on their stomach. But if they can get to their stomach, I recommend three, uh, three sessions a day of 10 minutes at least of laying on their stomach. Yes, question, James. Um, how, how long usually for those three sessions, how long do you usually recommend your patients to stay on their stomach for? At least 10 minutes. Oh, did you say that? I'm sorry. Okay. At least 10 minutes at each session. So okay. 10. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, if they can tolerate longer, then, then great. I, you know, I encourage them doing it longer. Uh, we also start to encourage gentle isometrics and active range of motion. So if they're laying in bed, we'll have them encourage them to reach their arms up over their head, out to the side. Um, isometrics are things like glute sets. We encourage them to squeeze their butt cheeks together and hold it for 10 seconds and then slowly relax as many times through the day as they want to do it. That's an easy exercise to do. It's not contraindicated for any of the surgeries. So butt tightening is a good one. Also thigh tightening. So kind of pressing their legs down into the bed, um, mostly on the unaffected side to begin with. So I'll have them work on just pressing their unaffected side um, knee down into the bed to kind of give that nice quad tightening and then relax. And again, we have them hold that for five or 10 seconds. Um, glute, glute contractions, glute isometrics, or what we call glute sets. Anybody can do that. They can do that on both sides. So we encourage that kind of thing. Um, let me think if there was anything else about, I don't think there was anything else about, uh, about the, 
the positioning. But essentially, a position of comfort equals contraction. This is what I tell the patients. If you're comfortable, you're probably not sitting in a position that you need to be in. Laying on their side is not a good position. Their, their hips are flexed and their knees are flexed. So trying to keep them supine or prone, no pillows under the legs. And it's difficult. Nurses want to make their patients comfortable and patients want to be comfortable. And we're coming in there telling them, you can't have this. You need to be uncomfortable. You should, not painful, but if your knee feels like it's in an uncomfortable position because it's straight, that's sorry, that's where it needs to be. So we kind of get a bad rap, us PTs. Most people call us physical torturists when we walk in their hospital room. Um, so they don't usually want to see us because they know it's not going to be something that they're going to enjoy. But complications from contractures, as you can see, now these are extensive uh, contractures. And plus, this person has a very short tibia. Um, but it can affect prosthetic fitting for sure. I see it all the time. Um, and actually, I would, you know, you would hope that this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. But I was just in a prosthetist's office back in the fall, and I saw him making a prosthesis to accommodate this type of knee flexion contracture in somebody. So it still happens, um, unfortunately. But it can cause undue pressure on the limbs. Um, and definitely uh, gait deviations are gonna result from this. This person is not going to have um, an easy time uh, getting into terminal swing and getting the right type of length and terminal swing because of this knee flexion contracture. They're gonna have a shortened step length on that side. With the transfemoral amputees, we certainly wanna avoid hip flexion and abduction and external rotation. So I talked a little bit yesterday about when they do the myodesis surgery, how they take the adductor magnus and they wrap it around the outside of the femur while they're bringing the femur into five to seven degrees of adduction. This is in turn to kind of help prevent some of this abduction um, sort of drift that we see in a lot of our transfemoral amputee patients um, and hopefully help prevent some of that uh, distal femur from knocking into the side of the uh, prosthetic socket when they're eventually in the prosthetic socket. So again, no pillows under the thighs. So we wanna avoid hip flexion with these folks, trying to get them um, to lay on their stomach if they can, even probably more important with these uh, patients than with our trans tibial patients. Um, avoid prolonged sitting. We want them sitting up a lot during the day, but not for three hours at a time. We want them to get out of the hospital bed and sit for maybe 15, 20 minutes, get back in for an hour, get back out for 15 or 20 minutes, get back in for an hour. You know, if they have that type of endurance, that's what we like to see. Um, no pillow between the legs. We do not want the legs separated out. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, we'll, make, we'll take a, a pillow or a foam roller or something like that and actually set it to the outside of the residual limb. So between the bed rail and the amputated leg. And that's gonna keep the legs closer together. It's not gonna let that amputated leg float out into abduction. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping them adducted as much as possible. Yes, Alex. Um, so it, is there a specific mechanism that causes the abduction rather than the adduction? Yeah, and I and I, yes, and we can talk about that because I don't I didn't think I talked about it too much. So there's um, the theory is it's it has to do somewhat with the muscle reattachment. Um, so there's been studies and they they were done back in the 90s um, that actually if surgeons believed if they didn't reattach the tensor fascia lata and the iliotibial band that they could help avoid some of this abduction flow. So if they didn't reattach the tensor fascia lata, then that would help with the abduction um, float that we see. Um, but we found out that if they don't reattach tensor fascia lata, it actually increases the patient's risk of getting a hip flexion contracture. Um, so there's different, there's different scenarios or different theories as to why this may or may not happen. Um, I think that, I don't know if, if they know for sure why it floats out besides the fact that it doesn't have a, a distal, a, a, none of these muscles have true distal attachments anymore to the tibia. And so reattaching the 
adductor magnus within myodesis is the best defense against this abductor um, drift that we see or this abduction drift that we see in the femur. So, but even talking to the surgeons who do reattach the adductor magnus, um, they still see that it does tend to loosen and start to float out to the side. So I believe for the most part, it just has to do with not having those true distal muscle reattachments. And this isn't seen in everybody, but it's pretty common that we see that the femur starts to float out to the side. So I think the best theory right now is that if myodesis isn't performed and the muscles aren't reattached to the bone, this is why we're seeing this. I don't think we really know, there's, no, there's not enough research out there to know how often the myodesis surgeries are being performed. Um, so I, I truly believe it's just because we don't have those anatomical attachments anymore because we don't see this in transtibial amputees. It's just that that femur's sort of out there floating. I don't, does that answer your question? <laughs> I don't know if we know for sure exactly why we, we, it happens beyond the fact that the muscles are not reattached. Is that a good enough answer? Does it? Sorry, we were muted. <laughs> um, okay. But I remember seeing this on my prosthetic assistance exam. It was mm -hmm. along with a hip flexion contracture, what other contractures do you normally see in a transfemoral amputee? And I hadn't even thought about that before. And I'm obviously the answer was abduction and external rotation, but I also didn't know why that would be. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's just because they believe it's from the surgical procedures, but again, people with myodesis, which is supposed to help prevent this, occasionally will still get that that um, that same abduction. I think it's just because the bones aren't there anymore. Um, and again, I think more research needs to be done. Dr. Clemens, if you were constantly trying to keep the thigh adducted, though, would that not promote some sort of like non-congruent forces on at the hip? at the femoral head and acetabular joint that you wouldn't want for longevity of that patient? It's actually not, you're not keeping it in any more a deduction than we normally would see with a closed chain gait pattern. Um, so it's not like we're making them cross their legs. So yeah. there's no, there's no risk there. It's just keeping okay. it from going out to the side. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So again, if these folks can get on their stomach, I encourage at least, three times a day for at least 10 minutes each time. Um, even, you know, right away in the hospital bed, if they can get over and, and it'd be great if they have a rigid dressing on because then you're not risking any sort of um, injury to the leg itself. But they're very, you know, people are nervous about moving around after they've got their leg cut off, um, they, rightfully so. So we try to encourage them to do what they can though. Again, encouraging gentle, gentle range of motion, trying to get them to do their butt squeezes, in bed um, and then thigh squeezes on the sound limb if they've got a sound limb. But again, hip flexion contractures, if you have seen patients with prosthetic limbs, this is an all too common sight. We definitely have that forward trunk. We have increased hip flexion in pretty much all positions um, with this lady during stance. And so it's gonna involve having to use these different type of adapters and extenders on the prosthetic limb to actually get that ground reaction force where we want it. And so this is where Alex, we were talking a little bit and we're gonna talk more um, later on about this flexion that's built into the hip socket, um, to the transfemoral socket. So a lot of times we do have to worry about accommodating a hip flexion contracture. We can see this socket is flexed probably, you know, 15 degrees in the frontal plane. This is where normally, if people with two legs were standing up nice and tall, where we would want you know, that, that line bisecting the thigh to be. But with somebody with a hip flexion contracture, it has to be way out here. And the knee needs to be accommodating for that. And so we'll talk more about that because that's gonna affect their gait pattern a little bit, but um, it's gonna keep them safe during gait, but it's not normal mechanics. They've got this hip flexion contracture that needs to be accommodated for by the prosthetist. Um, if it isn't, these are my patients 
who end up buckling at the knee every single time they put weight on their leg because the, the ground reaction force will constantly run behind the knee and provide a flexion moment at the knee, which we don't want. So we'll talk more about this as we get to more of alignment and how that affects gait. Question, do you have a question? No questions? Okay, all right. All right, so early mobility. So results of the amputation that affect mobility, obviously decreased proprioception. These folks have lost mechanoreceptors in their feet, mechanical mechanoreceptors in their joints. They have lost um, at least one joint, if not more joints. And so they're going to not be able to tell where their limb is in space. They're not gonna have um, as, as good of an idea of where their body is um, until they start to get trained. There's gonna be muscle atrophy. So again, I talked a little bit about the muscles that are cleaved during the surgery. So in a transfemoral amputee, obviously we're gonna have atrophy of the gastroc soleus um, and the, uh, the anterior tibialis muscles. In a trans, did I say transfemoral? That's a transtibial amputee. In a transfemoral amputee, amputee you're gonna have atrophy of the quads, atrophy of the hamstrings, but we're also seeing atrophy of the muscles that weren't cut during surgery. The iliopsoas, up in the hip flexors, the glutes, those muscles will atrophy. Um, uh, hopefully, if they're trained appropriately, they won't atrophy as much. But they're because of disuse, they tend to atrophy. There's possibly going to be restrictions in range of motion. We know that people with amputations tend to have tighter hip flexors. So they're not going to have as much hip extension, especially if they're transfemoral amputees. Um, they may have an increased lumbar lordosis. They may have increased... Uh, increased anterior tilt at the pelvis in the sagittal plane. That is not uncommon. Um, that can lead, we believe that can lead to some issues with low back pain. Um, the, they're going to have decreased muscle torque. They don't have that lever arm anymore. Um, and decreased balance. This kind of all plays into decreased balance. So these folks, again, are at an increased risk for falls. Um, this is just to talk about the the mechanoreceptors at the bottom of the feet, those Piscinian corpuscles, they're gone. Um, if these people are even a partial foot amputee, some of those are gone. So our vibratory sense, our first line of defense for balance is, is essentially not there anymore. And so this is not as much for, for you guys, but potentially as a reference for you, um, working with people or working with some PTs or rehab professionals in the future. This is sort of a general guideline of what we do with patients while they're still in the hospital usually. So the first day is bed mobility, teaching them positioning. So this is a nice reference for you all to potentially give to physical therapists that you're going to be working with in a hospital setting if they don't really have an idea of what they should be doing bedside with patients with amputations. Um, so again, this nut is not necessarily what I am going to be testing you all on because you are not going to be involved in teaching them how to do quad sets and glute sets and active range of motion. But this is a, a reference for you to potentially provide to some of the practitioners that are in physical therapy or even occupational therapy that you'll be working with if you're in a hospital setting. Any questions on this? I'm gonna get ready to move on to the next PowerPoint, I think. No questions right now? Good, all right. All right, so do, 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 let me see. All right. <clears throat> so I don't think I have the next one lined up. That was, that was six, so we're gonna go to seven. Dr. Clemens, for this, yes. for that slide you're just on, for all the different um, post yeah. All right. Would you say to would you say that that's worth spending some time studying, or is that just something to kind of know in general? No, I'm not going to have you guys. Uh, I'm not going to test you guys on telling me what the patient should be doing for exercise while they're okay. in bed. Uh, positioning, positioning could be important for you um, because you are going to see the patient in the hospital room. If you walk in and they've got a pillow under their knees, you should know that shouldn't be there. Um, but as for exercise prescription, I'm not going to worry about you guys knowing that. Okay. Good yep. deal. Just have it as a reference. So to know that if you do run into a therapist who says, I'm not sure what to do with this patient second day post-op, you can go back to your slides and know that, um, that you've got a reference for it from the lectures. 
All right, so I believe this is our next one here. All right, so care of the patient with amputation. All right, so again, the objectives for this, <clears throat> not all of them are gonna apply. I didn't change the objectives when I pulled slides out, so you're not gonna have to know um, all of the componentry, especially for the knee. The feet, I am gonna be expecting you to know some stuff about what we talk about with prosthetic feet. Um, we're going to talk a lot about volume management because that is definitely going to be in your all your all wheels wheelhouse um, with helping the patient prepare to wear a prosthesis um, in the future. And um, you don't need to worry about formulating an exercise program for each stage of recovery because I'm not going to expect you to be responsible for an exercise program. Um, Anything that I talk about with exercise is gonna be more of a reference for you all. Now, when we get to prosthetic gait and postural assessment, those type of things are gonna be, um, or you'll be responsible for. So um, with early mobility, so one of the things that we wanna make sure they do is obviously protect the sound limb. We try to make sure that they only log roll in bed. So this is something if you are seeing the patient in the hospital, you're gonna to need to make sure that you know because um, Usually we have them do log rolling, which is rolling to their side before they sit up at the edge of the bed. Usually, almost always, if they're a unilateral amputee, we have them roll toward their good leg, um, just so they don't put pressure on the residual limb. Um, if they are a bilateral amputee, what we don't usually have them do log rolling. We have them sit straight up in bed and then kind of have them gently scoot to the edge. We don't necessarily have them roll toward one side or the or, or the other. Um, so that is something that potentially is part of positioning that you should know because you're going to be having the patient do this, especially in the hospital room. If you're going to be having them sit up, maybe you want to see what their balance is like or get an idea of um, what how they're doing in sitting. Or maybe the patient's in sitting already when you get there. Um, when we do transfers, if the patient, uh, especially as a bilateral amputee, we have them, we consider using a sliding board. Um, it depends on how much weight they can put on their foot that's left if they're not a bilateral. And making sure that our patients, um, if we are going to have them stand up or transfer out of bed, that they have the proper footwear on, especially if they're a dysvascular amputee. We don't want them doing a pivot transfer and getting sheer forces through their foot while they're wearing just a hospital sock. That can be dangerous if they have an insensate foot on their, on their, on their remaining limb. Talking to them again about fall prevention, they're at an increased risk for falls. It's not an easy conversation to have with people sometimes. They've just lost their leg and now you're telling them that they're, they're probably gonna fall at some point and that they need to be careful of it. But they are gonna have a smaller base of support. Obviously, if they're a unilateral, um, they're going to have just that one foot now um, to be standing on. They're going to be deconditioned. Um, their center of mass has now shifted. So remember, it's about L5 to somewhere between L5 and S2 when we have two limbs. With one limb at a transtibial level, the center of mass has shifted up and over to toward the prostate or toward the resid toward the sound limb. At the transfemoral level, it's shifted up and over even a little bit higher. And then at the bilateral level, that center of mass is shifted all the way up into the trunk. And so as people lose body mass, it's going to change where their center of mass falls. So they're not going to feel balanced in the same way that they used to. Hopefully, once you provide them with a prosthetic limb and once they get to physical therapy, center of mass moves back to where it's supposed to be, at least while they're wearing their prosthetic limb. And that's sort of my job as a PT to really train them on how to get it back where it belongs. But also making a, a patient aware that um, they are gonna have phantom sensation and that that's normal, that they feel that their foot is still there and that that may change over time or it may not. Um, phantom pain is something they may be experiencing as well. Hopefully that will decrease over time. <clears throat> so causes of edema during the first four weeks. So again, the patients are out of the hospital usually at this point. Um, potentially have been transferred to a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home or a rehab unit, or depending on how healthy they are, they may have went home um, with home care until they're ready for prosthetic fitting. 
So there's going to be generalized edema just due and inflammation just due to the surgery itself. Uh, there's going to be different fluid accumulations, um, continued disease processes. This is going to be your folks with congestive heart failure or um, end stage renal disease. These folks are going to still have those diseases and it's going to affect how their um, edema responds in those first four weeks. So this immediate post-acute stage again is from, it, it runs from discharge of the, from the acute setting through eight weeks. Potentially they're not at home and they're at a rehab unit, but at this time, they still do not have a prosthetic limb. They're still healing. Hopefully they're in a shrinker. So this time is very, very important still to control the edema and the wound healing and really start to shape that prosthetic limb or that residual limb to get it ready to go into a prosthesis, hopefully within the next couple of months. So there's gonna be rapid volume change at this time. We're shaping the wound or we're shaping the limb, um, wearing that shrinker, hopefully now. Um, staple removal probably will have taken place. Um, healthy trauma, trauma patients with not a lot of comorbidities or other injuries may have their staples removed in 10 days. It could be, you know, um, almost a month for somebody with a dysvascular amputation to have their staples removed. So it depends on the patient's etiology on how long before those staples are out. And again, it depends on the surgeon, whether or not they're gonna allow a shrinker to be worn before staple removal. Some do, some don't. It depends on the hospital, depends on the person who did surgery. Um, geographically in this country, different surgeons, different types of surgeons do the surgeries. I know in, when I've worked at trauma centers, it's the trauma surgeons. When I've worked at a community hospital, it's the vascular surgeons. In some hospital settings, it's the orthopedic surgeons. Um, so really it depends on the hospital setting and the area of the country um, on which type of surgeon did the actual surgery. And they're gonna have different belief systems. <clears throat> Either way, um, movement is gonna encourage wound healing. So getting the patient uh, to do some range of motion exercises, getting the patient to, um, to make sure that they've been seen by a physical therapist is gonna help encourage that blood flow to the wound and get it healing. Um, if they, we're still continuing to do contracture prevention as well, trying to get them on their stomach, depending on where they are. Um, this is one of the positions I like to get people in, on your stomach, if they're comfortable enough, propping on the elbows. That's gonna give even better stretch to somebody with a hip, uh, into their hip flexors. Um, and then I would roll a towel under the residual limb and place it at the end of it to be able to get a better stretch in that hip. Um, but if they haven't already started to mobilize their scar or where there's, even with staples in, they can start some scar mobilization. And we're gonna talk about that, I think again, in the next couple of slides. But that is something that you all can educate the patient on as well. Um, so again, contracture prevention. So we can see the difference in the wounds here. So four days after surgery, this is actually a pretty good wound closure. It looks really nice um, to four weeks. So there's a big difference. Now this limb needs to be shaped a little bit better. I, I'm not as happy with the shape as it, as it could be, um, but we see that the, there's a big difference and that the limb can heal very quickly. Um, we get concerned a little bit about <clears throat> the laying down of collagen. Collagen in the joints can start to be laid down within 72 hours. And when collagen is laid down into the joint tissues, the joints are gonna get stiffer. So that's really why we wanna make sure that their knee is nice and straight um, if they are, if they are a um, uh, transtibial amputee and that they're stretching out the hips no matter what level they're at. <clears throat> With mobility and exercise, so one of the things that we're able to do at this point is the amputee predility, mobility predictor, no prosthesis. So this is something that if you, we're gonna talk about this when we talk about outcome measures, but as a, a physical therapist of a prosthetist wanted to do, wanted to get a good idea of the K level on this patient, I might be administering the AMP no pro. Um, so again, we'll talk about this more with outcome measures, but this is appropriate at this stage if the patient um, has enough endurance to do the test. We start to teach them gait and with an assistive device and transfer training. Um, it might be with crutches, depending if they're a higher level, stronger, younger amputee, or it's likely gonna be with a walker. Definitely wheelchair propulsion, because every amputee, no matter 
what level they're at and no matter how strong they are, they're gonna have a wheelchair and they're gonna use it sometimes. Even my 25 year old trans tibial amputees still use wheelchairs occasionally and they're going to get one prescribed to them. Um, desensitization exercises. <clears throat> so that's what this lady is doing here. So this is something that as a prosthetist, you should know about. You want your patients to be desensitized on that residual limb so that when they go to put a liner on, when they go to put weight down into their prosthesis, that limb has already been toughened up in a sense a little bit. So desensitization exercises, basically what we do, is anybody familiar with these? Do you don't know, you don't have them beat it with their fists. <laughs> so what we usually do as physical therapists, as soon as the patient, um, as, as long as the wound is looking like it's it's healed up pretty well, they may or may not still have their staples in. I will have them start desensitization exercises. So essentially it's just gently touching their limb with their hands, gently just rubbing it with their hands, taking a cotton ball and rubbing a cotton ball along the skin. Um, you can avoid this, the actual scar or incision line at this point if it's still got staples in it. But making sure we usually start out with a cotton ball and then after the staples are out, we'll go to things that are a little bit more um, abrasive, like a, a Kleenex or a tissue, and then progress from there to maybe a towel where they can rub it on their limb, pull at the end of their limb. So wrap the towel. What she's doing right here is wrapping the towel around the end of her limb and pulling into the bottom of the residual limb a little bit. So getting a little bit of pressure through that limb. Um, also, and then after we use a towel, maybe we use paper towel. So we get a little bit more abrasive on the skin as the person continues to heal and as the scar you know, continues to look good. Obviously, if they have an open wound, if things aren't healing well, I'm not having them get as abrasive with that residual limb. Um, but I do encourage that people look at it, that, touch, they, that they touch it. I've had people come in to, to outpatient physical therapy with their prosthetic limb ready to do gait training and they say to me I don't even want to look at my leg so I know they haven't touched it which means we're going to have an issue when they put their leg into that socket with 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 discomfort and with pain so desensitization exercises are very important for uh, hopefully they're getting this instruction in physical therapy but if they're not in PT and even if they are, you as a prosthetist needs to re-emphasize this to them. Start with a cotton ball, move on to a tissue, move on to a towel, start to get some pressure, even with their hands through the bottom of that stump, up into it a little bit so that they're ready to put their leg into a prosthetic in the next month or two. Um, and again, if they haven't started scar mobilization, they should be starting scar mobilization with as soon as those staples come out. Um, so basically scar mobilization, if you've ever had a scar, you might have already done it. Um, you basically take two fingers over the actual incision line it, when it's healed. So I usually don't have them do it until the staples, is, the staples are out. And I have them do up and down motion, side to side motion, circles one way, circles the other way, all along the scar line. Now your patients, I talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. If your patients have have skin grafts so now you've got a much larger area of scar tissue again move it side to side move it up and down move it clockwise move it counterclockwise this should be to patient tolerance it doesn't have to be a lot of pressure but you should be able to see that the skin is moving a little bit and again this is going to help with desensitization so i think that that's really really important and um that you guys need to make sure that you're teaching your patients scar mobilization and desensitization exercises as soon as it's appropriate, because that's gonna benefit you as their prosthetist. So again, I'm gonna be working on retraining where their center of, mo center of mass is gonna be located um, and also um, educating them on fall risk. Oh my goodness, I think the building next door is dogs. I don't know if you all can hear them barking. Um, all right, so intermediate recovery stage. We have now moved on 
to a point where they're ready to start being fitted for their prosthetic limb. So this usually happens two to six months after surgery, you know, about eight weeks. Like I said, some people can go, go into those eye pops and they're, you know, into a prosthetic type device early on, but I don't see it very often. It's usually about eight weeks after surgery that we start to see they're ready to be fitted with a prosthetic limb. And again, this depends on healing rates. The more comorbidities they have, the less likely they're gonna be ready for prosthetic fitting at two months. All right, so still gonna have rapid volume changes. Now this is going to be influenced as well by the fitting of the prosthesis. Now we have constant pressure and a lot of it over the wound, over the um, residual limb. So causes of volume changes after two months um, post-op are gonna be continual, continued limb muscle atrophy. So you all as the prosthetist at this point are gonna have a lot of visits with this patient for the next few months. There's gonna be a lot of atrophy happening in the muscles. Um, the first prosthetic fitting when they start to get their limb down into the prosthesis is gonna encourage uh, a, uh, any type of fluid in the limb to kind of be pushed out. So that's gonna be a change in what they're used to um, when it comes to volume. Again, continued disease process. If you're dealing with folks that have comorbidities that affect their uh, fluid volume, like congestive heart failure, like end-stage renal disease, you're going to see that this is an issue when you go to fit the prosthetic. These patients can be a challenge. Um, weight loss and weight gain. More than likely, these folks are heavier than they were when they went into surgery two months ago. They've been sitting a lot. Even my healthy young folks sometimes will gain a good 15 to 20 pounds in that two months time. They're just not moving the way they used to. But once you get them up and moving again on a prosthesis, you better be ready for some weight loss because they're gonna get active again. So having to deal with this type of thing um, with their first few months of prosthetic fitting is gonna be an issue as well. It's still The limb is still healing, it's in the remodeling phase. Um, we do know that after about 14 weeks of healing that the scar tissue is not going to respond to mobilization. So we really wanna make sure that in those first you know, few months that they've been healing, that they're still working on that scar tissue, that they're keeping it mobile. If you get any adhesions under these scars, you all are gonna have a more difficult time as a prosthetist because they're going to be painful under that scar tissue. If it is immobile, any friction they have within the prosthetic socket is going to translate right up into their residual limb. So make sure they've got good techniques for scar mobilization, um, especially in those first few months, because after a while, it's not gonna make a difference. So the preparatory prosthesis, um, again, what did I write here for? Donning and doffing the prosthetic limb. Um, so, I, I'm not sure where my train of thought was going there, sorry. But again, we're still having to work on wound healing. Um, knowing that their limb is gonna be in more of an enclosed environment, a lot of these folks end up having skin issues. So 36 to 66% of them end up having issues with their skin once they start to wear a prosthetic limb. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the lecture. Um, now that they're gonna be in the preparatory prosthetic, um, teaching, that's what I was talking about, teaching them to don and doff the prosthesis. You guys will do your job and you will teach them how to put this leg on and take it off when you give it to them in their, their, in their um, when you're at your clinic and you've given them the leg. I can guarantee you that half of them, after one session with you of teaching them to put their leg on and off, totally forget how to do it because they get to physical therapy and they bring their leg to me in a black plastic bag and they say, I got this thing and they're usually sitting in a wheelchair and they hand me this leg and they can't remember how to put it on. So making sure that you really try to reinforce with them how to put the leg on and off, maybe have them do it a few times and make sure there's a family member around because they forget how to do it. Now in PT, hopefully the physical therapist knows how to do it. And I feel like that's my job as, as a, a physical therapy instructor and professor to teach my students to know how to put a prosthetic leg on and off. 
but these folks may have skin issues. Um, they're going to have to go on a wearing schedule once they get this preparatory prosthesis. I talk to them about it in physical therapy, but really the wearing schedule comes from you all as prosthetists. Now, in general, um, the wearing schedule that I tend to give patients is I have them on the very first day that they have their prosthetic limb or, or that they're gonna start wearing their prosthetic limb, I have them wear it for 15 minutes, three times a day. So I have them, usually the three times a day, I make around breakfast, around lunch, and around dinner, because it's easy for them to remember those three times a day. So I say wear it for 15 minutes you know, before breakfast, take it off, and check your skin, okay? Wear it again for 15 minutes before or after lunch. Take it off and check your skin. Wear it for 15 minutes around dinner time. Take it off, check your skin, okay? If there are any spots that don't that are red and it doesn't go away within 10 minutes, then make a note of it because we have to let the prosthetist know. So when they have this on for 15 minutes around breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if they are safe, I want them doing something in it. I want them standing up in the prosthetic limb. I don't want them just sitting in their wheelchair. Now, this is my own personal opinion um, because I wanna know if we're having fit issues with this prosthetic. So I want them standing up in it. If they are safe to walk with a family member with an assistive device, I want them walking in it a little bit. And then I want them checking their skin. If day one goes great, then I have them increase it 15 minutes the next day, half hour at breakfast, lunch, and dinner then the next day, 45 minutes. So they're slowly building up. Um, some of these folks are gonna be able to build up much faster than others. Now, you as a prosthetist, and you may learn from other instructors and professors, different suggestions for a wearing schedule. That is my preference. That is sort of kind of what I learned from the prosthetic experts when I was learning all of this early on. You all will find a way um, that, you all will find sort of a schedule that you prefer for your patients. Um, and again, some of these folks are gonna be able to start wearing it much faster and much longer than others. But the important part is checking their skin, especially early on for spots that don't go away within five or 10 minutes. Those red spots are gonna need to be addressed by you, um, the prosthetist. So again, volume control. Um, Atrophy is going to contribute to volume control and it's also gonna to contribute to decreased strength. So hopefully they are doing at least some sort of home program with the physical therapist um, and they're continuing to try to strengthen. Sock ply management. As a PT, I know a lot about sock ply because I'm an amputee specialist. Many physical therapists don't know about how to manage sock ply with their patients that are amputees. And so a lot of this sock ply education is gonna come from you as the prosthetist and knowing how many socks this patient should have on, um, how many, how, how the patient should know when to add a sock. Um, it, usually what I tell patients and what I teach students is if you're having pain, if the patient is having pain, the first line of defense is to try and add a sock. See if that helps with some of the pain. Maybe they're sinking down into the prosthesis a little too much. Maybe the fit is a little bit too loose. Um, and when it comes to sock ply management, sock plies come in different um, thicknesses. Um, so they range usually at one ply, which is very thin, like an actual sock that we would put on our foot, not a tube sock, but maybe more like a nylon sock. Um, one uh, ply, three ply, five ply is usually typical. Certain companies will make different plies um, and over the years, companies have changed how many sock ply, um, how, they, how they decide to um, create their socks and make sock ply. In the good old days, every sock had a, a yellow rim to it or a green rim to it. And we were, able to we were able to differentiate how many sock ply each one of these was by the color of their brim. Nowadays, they usually put the number on it to let you know. Some companies don't do a colored brim, some do. Um, but essentially one, three, and five are your standard sock plies. The higher the number, the thicker the sock. Um, and so teaching a patient how to manage their sock ply, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it a whole bunch in the lectures right now, because I think you're probably gonna get some of that once you get more into your prosthetic courses. But knowing that that is how we manage volume change. 
if this person's been wearing um, their their new socket for a week or so, it's probably pushing a lot of fluid out of the limb, which is what we want. But now the socket's going to be loose. How do we adjust that socket? We work on adding socks to fill up some of that space between the person's limb and the socket itself. Do you all have an? I, and I know some of you have got experience with this, but does that is that sound clear to you all? It's hard to to explain like where the sock goes and how the sock ply is managed without being in class with you and having an actual prosthetic <laughs> limb with me. You know, it makes sense, but how, how much ply would you usually go before you definitely have to change the socket? Because I, I've heard anywhere between 15 and 20. I don't know how true that really is, but I know is if it, it gets 15, yeah. it's really time to change yeah. that. It's, it's prosthetist dependent. What, the prosthetist that I've worked with in the past, if the, if the patient is constantly wearing between 8 to 12, probably closer to 10 to 12, if they are always wearing... Get 10 ply a sock or a, or above it's time to get an maybe not a new socket but it's time to adjust what's going on inside the socket so maybe they go back and they get some uh, pads put into the socket or maybe the socket is built up on the inside with some different materials so they don't necessarily need a new socket at this point but if they're riding at 10 ply or above consistently then i'm going to send them i'm going to give the prosthetist a call and say listen i think we need to get some adjustments in this socket. And usually the prosthetist can build up the inside of the socket with different materials and we can bring them back down to maybe, you know, two or three ply as they continue to lose volume. Um, so that's sort of my guideline. That's what I've learned from the prosthetists that I've known in the past. So around 10 to 12, I do not like to see them going higher than that consistently. I, I think you're essentially putting them into a bucket if you're riding at 15 ply consistently, that's not functional for the patient, in my opinion. Um, so in my experience with this, it's it's really not as much like the sock ply. You, you can't just say like, oh yeah, once they hit a certain amount of socks, it's time to make a new socket. It depends on one, their daily volume change. Like we had one guy, I think I told you guys about, um, he would start the day off um, with zero ply, just the liner. And then by the end of the day, he'd be in like 27 ply. And that was every day. And it's just because yeah. he had such fluctuating volume. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes he would have to change legs. Like we would have a smaller socket for him and a bigger socket for him. But um, yeah. Medicare hates to pay for stuff like that. But it's mainly dependent on the shape. Like we just talked about a couple slides ago with the mus muscle atrophy, how it goes from cylindrical to kind of triangular shape because of that, uh, the shape of the tibia. Um, but yeah, there, there's a few different things you can do as far as volume control. Like Dr. Clemens was saying, you can add some material to the inside of the socket. So um, like you can do a wash liner, which is basically like you mix up some resin and add some more resin to the inside and keep spinning it around and get an even coat of resin to just take up a little bit more space in there so they don't have to wear the socks. But you can only do that to a certain extent because like she was saying, you don't want a bucket on them or some heavy uh, socket or anything like that. Um, but it all goes by measurements. So you'll, you'll take the measurements circumferentially down the residual limb by an inch. And depending on how those circumferences changes, that's usually what determines when they get a new socket. And that is kind of according to Medicare because it's just hard to prove to Medicare that they need a new socket. Yeah, we try to, I think that the example of somebody going from zero ply to 27 ply is certainly an outlier. That's not something yeah, that, we, yeah, that we normally see. So for, sure. for the, the most part, um, and I'm going about you know, my years of experience on the, on the many patients that I've dealt with, it's usually, we'll send them back, the prosthetist will build up the interior of the socket so we can bring the sock ply down. But there's gonna, and we try to keep them in the preparatory prosthesis for a good, you know, few months. If you're working, and if you are a prosthetist who's worth their salt, you're not gonna hurry and try to make the definitive prosthetic right away. Now, there is an advantage to that because you get paid sooner. But the, the prosthetist that I work with that I have a lot of respect for, 
we really try to stretch out as much as we can. We try to get as much out of that preparatory prosthesis as possible so that we know that they're really ready for their definitive limb and so that they don't have to keep coming back to the prosthesis or to the prosthetist every you know week to get changes in their in their definitive prosthetic. So for the most part, you do what you can. Again, my ground rule is if they're riding at 10 ply or above, we need to do something to the socket to get that sock ply down because we're not getting it, it's not fitting like a glove anymore. These things should be fitting like a glove um, to really get the maximum benefit for the patient and the best biomechanics out of our gait pattern. And usually you wanna start like when you're fitting the socket um, and different processes think about this differently, but I know my dad goes for a three ply fit at first, especially mm -hmm. if they have volume changes. And that's mm -hmm. just because, um, you know, if you fit it to a zero ply, like fit it to where they're not wearing any socks and it fits perfectly. Well, then what happens if they yeah. eat a salty dinner, like we were talking about, and they increase volume, then they can't even get into their leg. And that's just time away from the prosthesis. So, yeah. um, you want a little bit of variation in there with the socks. The socks are very helpful. And that's like the number one complaint of prosthetic discomfort is just the patients don't know um, when to add socks and when to take right. socks and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, and I think that's where you all are going to come in um, as the educators on that, especially because a lot of PTs might not be familiar with it. So if they're going to physical therapy, the PT might not be as familiar with sock ply management as they should be because they don't have somebody like me teaching them prosthetics. There's a lot of the PT programs around the country, you know, the students are getting maybe a day and a half of amputee rehab. And it's hard to teach them everything they need to know in that time. Um, so you, you all are really gonna be sort of the educators on making sure these patients know that if they're having pain, the first line of defense is to add some sock ply. Um, but hopefully the PTs have an idea as well. All right, so when we talk about the first prosthetic fitting, again, the muscles in the limb are beginning to atrophy. The fitting is gonna increase that positive pressure on the limb, so um, plus they're gonna be in a liner. Um, you're not gonna do a direct skin fit on somebody right away um, or some sort of sleeve. Uh, they're gonna have this hard socket. They're gonna be weight bearing through this limb now, which they haven't been doing for a couple of months. This is all gonna result in volume change more than likely, unless they've got a comorbidity that really affects their volume, like congestive heart failure, like end-stage renal disease, they're gonna have volume loss for the most part um, on this limb. So again, the prosthetic sac, the three goals of it are gonna be to cushion forces to help accommodate those volume changes that we're going to see, potentially to wick away moisture, but usually the patient is in a liner and not directly fitting right into a sock. Um, they are made of cotton or wool or some sort of uh, acrylic fabric, and they're sized according to the limb shape and their circumference and the limb length. So there's lots of different sizes and lengths to be um, to be giving to the patient. Um, again, the thickness, they could be color-coded. They may not be, um, but you all, as you get into practice, will know exactly what to do. Sometimes we have to write the number on the patient's sock for them so they know what ply to be putting on. And I always, always, always encourage my patients when they come to therapy, make sure they keep extra socks in their glove box. Because when they're in therapy and we've been up working in the parallel bars for 45 minutes and they're having pain because they now have lost volume from all of our exercise and now they're hitting the bottom of the socket, if they don't have prosthetic socks with them, then we're probably done for the day. Now, I always had extra socks in my desk drawer because I saw a lot of amputees, but most therapists aren't gonna have that. Um, so making sure that your amputee patients, especially early on, are carrying some extra sock ply with them if they're going out into the community. Keep it in their glove box, keep it in their backpack. Um, make sure that you as the prosthetists are providing them with lots of socks as well. Um, uh, hopefully, I know, I, I'm not sure exactly how many is allowed, um, but I, as far as I know, the processes that I've worked with are pretty free with distributing socks to their patients. Do you have any input on that, Alex? Um, yeah, and that's kind of another Medicare thing, but um, I think it's every six months or every year you can get new ones, and it's pretty easy to bill 
um, for six or yeah, 12, 12 multiply and 12 single ply. So okay. you give them 12 single ply socks yeah. and six five plies and six three plies. Yeah. And then yeah. So, yeah. come back in six months yeah. or a year and okay. read up that prescription. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was pretty generous. I don't usually have people having trouble. And a lot of the prosthetists that I work with have extra socks lying around anyway. And so yeah. they'll just kind of give them to the patients. Um, so it's cheap. usually. So if someone wants to come in and buy more, like yeah. with caps, they can do that as well and usually afford it. So encourage them to always have extra socks on them. Um, it just especially early on, if they're out, if they're going to therapy, if they're going to be out in the community, because they're going to need it. They don't want to get stuck at the mall whenever the mall's open again, you know, out with their family and all of a sudden start having a lot of pain, you know, they can just add a sock and be, be comfortable. All right, so again, I'm not gonna go over a lot of prosthetic components, but I'm gonna go over at least a, a fairly good overview of prosthetic feet because this is something that really is going to affect their gait pattern. Um, all right, so let's go through this and then I'll end up giving you guys a break in a little bit. So this is just a general definitive prosthetic fitting overview. We've got the socket, we've got some knee componentry, we've got a pylon, we've got a foot. You all pretty much probably know that as already. So implications of the ground reaction force in both orthotics and prosthetics. This is a nice schematic that gives you an idea of what's going on at these different joints because of what where the ground reaction force is. So again, here, add initial contact. Where's my cursor? There it is. Add initial contact. That ground reaction force is running up in front of the knee. We've got that nice extension moment. We've got a flexion moment at the hip. As the patient comes down into loading response and starts got, has got foot flat, that ground reaction force comes immediately posterior to the knee. Now we have a flexion moment at the knee. Okay, this is where it can get dangerous when it comes to anybody with a pathology. That flexion moment at the knee, if they don't have good quads, if they don't have a properly aligned prosthetic limb or the strength to be able to get their prosthetic limb in alignment, especially if they've got a prosthetic knee, we've got a flexion moment. They're gonna go down or they're gonna feel super unstable. All right, so this point in gait is really important. That loading response. Remember at loading response, we've got tons of muscles firing. We've got the quads, we've got the hamstrings, we've got the AB ductors. We've got everything firing to get that limb ready to take weight. So if their prosthetic is not aligned at this point properly, they're gonna end up with instability and they're gonna end up with gait deviations. So this is a really, really important. But this is a nice schematic so that you know where that ground reaction force is moving um, during gait and making sure that the prosthetic limb is aligned appropriately so that these uh, forces are optimal for the patient to have uh, the optimal gait pattern that they can. So when we start to talk again about functional levels, this is just kind of a quick overview again of our K levels and what type of things, um, what type of prosthetics can be prescribed for certain K levels. Now, again, we're not gonna go into knee joints all that much, but again, knowing that the lower the K level, the less fancy the prosthetic component that they qualify for. Um, so at a K1, um, they're not gonna get anything that's really going to influence a nice gait pattern. In fact, they're gonna get stuff that basically allows them to just get around the house a little bit, and they're gonna have gait deviations um, for the most part if they're at a K1 level. Um, so as we move up the chain, they are able to get uh, nicer componentry. Again, by the time they get to a K3 level, they're able to have those carbon fiber feet, they're able to get microprocessor knees, they're able to get pretty much anything that they need. Um, and then at K4, they can get a few additional things as well. So the prosthetic foot and the prosthetic ankle systems, what they function to do basically is to simulate our, uh, our muscles and our joints in, the, in our lower leg. So we're looking for them 
to simulate the anterior tibials, the, the plantar flexors or the gastroc muscles, those very important muscles that are controlling how we load our limb during um, loading response and controlling how the foot comes to the ground. Um, we want it, the prosthetic foot to be enable a smooth rollover during stance for them to be able to, to transition through double limb stance in preparation for swing. Um, shock absorption. We want these feet to be able to control um, plantar flexion during loading response. Um, allow compliance with uneven ground if they need it for balance. Uh, providing toe clearance during swing. We are not going to see excessive plantar flexion with a prosthetic foot. Prosthetic feet don't plantar flex. They pretty much are only moving into dorsiflexion. Some of them plantar flex a little bit. It certainly is not to a normal extent. Um, but enhancing their cosmetic appearance as well. Um, we want them to be able to have a foot on their prosthesis and not just have them walking around on something that I guess maybe a pirate would have worn, like a, just a, a regular old peg leg. So certainly it gonna, it's gonna provide pros, uh, cosmesis. So the different types of prosthetic foot designs that we're gonna talk about, non-articulating feet or the satch foot, solid ankle, cushioned heel. This is gonna be the basic foot that we, uh, that the most basic foot that we see, but very common still. Single axis, multi-axis, dynamic response. I think I pulled hydraulic feet out of here. And I do talk a little bit about the powered prosthetic, um, powered ankle. So satch feet. Um, this was developed way back in the 50s, but is still used to this day, mostly for people who are gonna be lower level or your K1 amputees. We also see this foot a lot in more third world type countries. It's low maintenance, it's lightweight, it's inexpensive. They can get it dirty. Um, it's very durable. So when I was in Haiti, I mean, this is the foot we gave people for the most part. And a lot of those folks were younger and strong and they walked okay in it. Um, so it is a good foot to have uh, in certain situations. Um, so uh, the disadvantages for this foot, and there are, are many of them, it provides poor weight bearing support over the toe area. So with a satch foot, and because I don't have one to show you or to pass around like I would in class, um, we'll go down to this diagram here. So a satch foot essentially is, um, is a firm wooden keel. And here's the keel itself right here. And the rest of it is surrounded pretty much um, by foam or some sort of type of rubber material. So the keel, if you look at it, you can see that the keel itself ends right about where? Uh, probably just short of where the metatarsals of our foot would end, okay? So all the rest of the area out here beyond the keel is this rubber foam. So we essentially don't have a toe rocker in this foot. So the person is unable to balance over the toe rocker of this foot if this is their prosthetic foot. So essentially they tend to collapse uh, the foot tends to collapse after they get to maybe the, the forefoot rocker. And we aren't able to get them to balance over a toe rocker, which means their contralateral step. This foot, as it is in terminal stance, does not have a toe rocker. So their contralateral step is gonna be shorter or their sound limb step is gonna be shorter. They're not able to balance over this prosthetic foot. There's no toe rocker. All there is is this soft foam. So it's gonna induce a gait deviation on the sound limb. The sound limb is gonna have a shorter step because we don't have a toe rocker in this foot. Um, so the keel will simulate an ankle rocker and give some resistance for tibial advancement, but it's not going to be able to induce a toe rocker. And again, we're going to have that shortened sound limb step on the contralateral side. Now again, at loading response, the compression of the foam back here in the heel is gonna mimic what our eccentric dorsiflexors are doing. So remember, during loading response, our foot is gonna come down, if this was a foot, if this is my foot, I'm gonna come down on the heel and my eccentric dorsiflexors are gonna nicely lower my foot down onto the floor. 
Okay, so I've got those the the muscles in the front of my leg. This is normal gait. Back to remember normal gait now. The muscles in the front of my leg are going to come down. Are going to allow my foot to nicely come down to the ground. So the heel of this prosthetic foot is going to function as those eccentric dorsiflexors. It's going to allow the foot to gently come to the ground. Now, ideally, it's going to allow the foot to gently to come to the ground. If this heel on this cushioned heel foot is too soft, my foot is gonna to come to the ground much too quickly, okay? So I am gonna come into plantar flexion too quickly if my heel of my foot is too soft. If I come to the ground into plantar flexion too quickly, what am I potentially gonna see happening at the knee? If I come to the ground in plantar flexion too quickly, What's going to potentially going to be happening at the knee joint? Flexion. Plantar flexion couples with what at the knee joint? Knee extension. extension. Okay. So if I have too soft of a heel on my satch foot, if I don't have the right category of foot for my patient and the heel is too soft, I'm going to come into plantar flexion too quickly and the knee is gonna be forced into some extension. So that is a deviation that I might see if the heel of my prosthetic foot is too soft. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So conversely, if the heel of my prosthetic foot is too hard, so let's say I come down and the heel is too hard and isn't allowing my foot to come into plantar flexion, but instead my foot sort of falls into um, falls to the ground into more of a dorsiflexion position. If my heel is too hard and I come into too much dorsiflexion at the ankle, what am I potentially going to see at the knee? Flexion. Flexion. Okay. So this is gonna play into what we see in some of these other prosthetic foot designs as well. Too soft of a heel is going to lead to too much plantar flexion and extension at the knee. Too hard of a heel is gonna lead into too much dorsiflexion at the ankle and flexion at the knee. Um, would that cause like a foot slap as well, like a prosthetic foot slap? It could, it could. I don't, it, yeah, it probably isn't gonna be that much to where you're gonna heel it, feel it slap or hear it slap down, but you might see that it's a foot slap if the heel is too soft. Um, could you repeat, I'm sorry, because I was trying to take notes on the PowerPoint or the uh, PDF, but it wasn't working, so I needed you to pay for, could you repeat that? Yep, so again, if our, the heel, if our heel of our satch foot is too soft, it's gonna allow the foot to come into plantar flexion too quickly. Oh. If we have plantar flexion at the foot and the ankle, we're going to see too much extension at the knee. If the heel of our satch foot is too hard and is not allowing compression into plantar flexion, then we're gonna to have too much dorsiflexion at the ankle. And in turn, we're gonna to have too much flexion at the knee joint. Does everybody see how that can happen? That uh, now, I thought that the uh, K1s had no ankle mobility in them. So yeah, I mean, it. it provides <laughs> some mobility. It provides an ankle rocker, Okay. the sash foot does. So what it doesn't really provide is that forefoot and toe rocker because it's all foam at the end. But yeah, they have some movement here to allow for that pylon to come forward. Okay. Yeah. So make sure you understand that because it's going to play into the rest of the feet that we talk about. And it also is going to play into what we see during gait. Okay. Especially important with our patients with prosthetic knees. Okay. What's going on at the foot is going to directly affect that prosthetic knee. Somebody with an anatomical knee, like a transtibial, usually can accommodate for a 
a, a, a prosthetic foot that's not behaving the way it should. They'll have gait deviations, but they won't fall. Somebody with a transfemoral amputation will fall if we aren't getting the right biomechanics, all right? So sometimes I would see the these type of prosthetic feet, satch foot, even on my high level folks, now this was back in the good old days when I think we could do a little bit more with prosthetic prescription, but certainly with my patients with bilateral amputation, when we were getting them up and getting them to learn to walk, we might make two preparatory prostheses, both with satch feet, just to get them up and get them moving. And what's nice about that is um, they can, they will end up getting, having an extra pair of prosthetics to actually like throw in their closet if something happens. Because as they move to their definitive prosthesis, we get them nicer componentry. They still have these old satch foot prosthetics that they can put on if they wanna you know, go out and work in the yard or things like that. That doesn't always happen anymore, but it, we used to be able to do things like that. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next type of prosthetic foot, which is a single axis design. Um, so a single axis design is designed uh, to allow more dorsiflexion, plantar flexion in the prosthetic foot than we may have seen with the satch foot. Um, this is done by incorporating bumpers into the prosthetic feet. Now, I forgot to tell you this in the beginning. There are probably 700 to 900 different kind of prosthetic feet on the market. There is no way I am gonna be able to talk about every different type of single axis design or every single type of dynamic response design. I'm gonna kind of highlight the mechanics behind the different designs, but especially if you already have been exposed to prosthetic componentry, there are hundreds of different kinds of prosthetic feet and every single manufacturer will tell you why that particular foot is the best one. So just keep that in the back of your head as a caveat as I talk about these different designs. Um, I'm trying to give you a general overview of the different categories. There are certainly many, many, many different hybrids out there on the market right now at this point, and there'll be a hundred more next year. Um, so single axis designs, do you, oh, do you have a question, Bryce? We're good? No? Uh, yes, I was just gonna say like these ones that we're going over, I mean, is it just important for us to know um, like how they differ as far as like, um, yeah, like knowing in the last, the last one, the like the knowing the keel and how it uh, is important for shaft progression and then or yeah, shank yeah. progression and like how this one incorporates bumpers and stuff. Like we're gonna be tested, I guess, on sort of just the specifics and how these are important and how they simulate planner and dorsiflexion and stuff. Yeah, you're gonna, yeah, in general, know the generalities of each foot and how they can affect gait. That's pretty much how I'm gonna be looking, what I'm gonna be looking for you all to know. How will, don't just memorize that a single axis foot is a dorsiflexion and plantar flexion bumper. That is not going to be the question I ask, okay? I am yeah. going to be asking you what happens during gait with this type of uh, foot or with this type of scenario, okay? So understanding the mechanics of each one of these feet and the advantages and disadvantages of each one of these feet is going to be important. So I have a lot of like anecdotal stuff that I tell you all, well, it's not really anecdotal, it's just that I don't fit everything that comes out of my mouth on the slides. And so, you know, taking notes, especially during this point in time when I'm giving examples, I think it's gonna kind of help solidify these things in your mind um, because I, I don't really have examples on the slide. It might make more sense listening to me talk about it than, you know, than just reading what's on the slide. But certainly knowing the advantages and disadvantages of each of these feet is gonna be important because you're gonna to need to know that for your patients. You all are gonna be in charge of helping prescribe what's best for them. So you better know what is best for them. Okay, so single axis design. So again, this is gonna, this is designed to, more, to allow more plantar flexion and dorsiflexion than the satch foot. And it's done with the use of bumpers. So the posterior bumper, and you guys can go and Google single axis designs or take a look better yet, maybe go to like different um, different manufacturers and look at what they're calling single axis design because Google images doesn't always have the right images. But in general, there's a bumper that's posterior 
and there's a bumper that's anterior, some sort of bumper um, that are going to be uh, in effect substituting for eccentric dorsiflexors and eccentric plantar flexors. Okay, and so I listed that here. So that plantar flexion bumper is going to mimic what happens with our eccentric dorsiflexors. So that posterior bumper is going to mimic what happens as our foot slowly comes to the ground. And then our, eccent our dorsiflexion bumper is gonna mimic eccentric plantar flexors. So as we roll over the foot with the tibia, it's gonna mimic what the plantar flexors would do, how our plantar flexors and normal gait controlled tibial progression. That's exactly what this bumper is designed to do, okay? Um, so let me get through this and I'll start giving some examples. So, um, so shock absorption at loading response um, comes by uh, what is being done at the heel and at the plantar flexion bumper. Um, these feet are prescribed in accordance with how much the patient weighs, what the patient's activity level is, and their need for stability. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. The advantages of this foot is that you can adjust the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion rate by adjusting the bumpers. And so we can make it a stiffer bumper if somebody's heavier or higher active, or we can make it a softer bumper if somebody is a little bit, um, needs a little bit more stability. So for example, as somebody is coming down into loading response um, and into heel contact. So again, this bumper back here, our plantar flexion bumper is controlling how quickly the foot comes to the ground. So if it's at the ideal durometer for our patient, that foot is coming to the ground at a nice, uh, coming to the ground at a nice speed. If this bumper is too soft, the plantar flexion bumper is too soft, that foot, again, it's mimicking eccentric dorsiflexors. That foot is gonna come to the ground too quickly, okay? So if you have too soft of a plantar flexion bumper, the foot's gonna come down too quickly to the ground. So it's gonna have a plantar flexion, um, it's gonna to be too much plantar flexion at the ankle, which again is gonna um, end up being what at the knee, if there's too much plantar flexion at the ankle. Extension. I read lips, extension, yes. So if our plantar flexion bumper is too soft, we're gonna to have um, too much plantar flexion, at loading response or too quick plan too quick of plantar flexion at loading response and we're going to see some extension at the knee now if you have a patient who might be uh, might not have very good balance then you might consider putting a softer plantar flexion bumper in that foot on purpose oh look at the doggy um, so that you want that foot to come to the ground quicker and you want that knee in an extension moment because it's more stable for that patient. So if you've got somebody, maybe a little old man who's a little not as balanced as, as you would hope to be, maybe you want a quick, you want a softer plantar flexion bumper in that foot to allow his foot to come to the ground quicker and to encourage knee extension so that he's more stable. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if you've got somebody who's super active, big guy, well, A, they'll probably not be in this foot, but if they were, if they didn't have insurance to cover a nicer foot, then you might want a firm bumper because he's gonna come down hard and fast on that plantar flexion bumper. So you want a nice firm bumper to handle his weight and handle his activity level, okay? Now, um, if we have somebody who, uh, um, if we have a, if, so we've talked about the plantar flexion bumper, the, the reason that we might wanna have a softer one and the reason why we might wanna have a harder one. The dorsiflexion bumper, on the other hand, is gonna allow for tibial progression or pylon progression over the foot. So it's acting, as our eccentric plantar flexors or those muscles on the back of our legs. Remember how those controlled tibia coming over the foot. Now, if our dorsiflexion bumper is too soft, what is that going to do to our tibial or our pylon progression over the foot? Is it gonna make it too fast or too slow? 
too slow. If our dorsiflexion bumper is too soft, too fast. So that, it's going to make it so that pylon comes over the foot a little too quickly. So the person in stance is going to progress into dorsiflexion too quickly. So by mid stance, they might not be at tibia vertical or at pylon vertical. They might be progressing into dorsiflexion a little too quickly if that dorsiflexion bumper is too soft. If they progress into tibia, if the, if the tibia progresses too quickly over the foot, we are gonna have a dorsiflexion moment at the foot and ankle. What are we gonna see at the knee if we have a dorsiflexion, if we have too much dorsiflexion at the ankle? Flexion at that point. We're gonna have too much flexion at the knee, okay? So these people during mid stance, instead of having zero to five degrees at the knee, are gonna to have too much flexion at the knee because they're too dorsiflexed at the ankle. So you wanna make sure that this dorsiflexion bumper is the right durometer that we aren't encouraging early dorsiflexion during mid stance. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know if you said it before, but what are these bumpers usually made out of? <sighs> There's some kind of, you know, I the ones I have seen are made out of a really, really dense rubber. Um, yeah, and again, it depends on the design. Like um, they can be. You're talking about? Somebody else have a question? Sorry. No, I was saying, is it like more like a vulcanized rubber? Is that? Uh, it's know. really, really hard. Yeah, kind of, I'm saying kind of like a hockey puck a little bit. Something like that or a little softer? Not really that hard. Uh, right. But like your, your different drawers are going to be, you know, your uh, higher drama ones are going to be a little harder. Mm -hmm. like, so when I pass these feet around class with my students, they all try to like get the bumpers to squish and you can't do it just with your hand. It's It requires hundreds of pounds of body weight or, you know, depending on the patient um, to get these bumpers to compress. You can't just squish it down with your hand. They're pretty firm. But again, that's something you're going to learn more as you get more into prosthetics and that's not even something that i teach i don't teach about and i don't really even know about um a lot about durometer and things like that so you're going to learn more of that but the basics are that there's this plantar flexion bumper and there's a dorsiflexion bumper and they oh. should be appropriate for the patient's weight activity level um or help you know instability level but um as for pres prescription of what those durometers are, that's going to be up to you guys. Um, so those bumpers, I don't mean to cut you off. But the, so the bumpers are going to keep us at what? 10 degrees plantar flexion, I'm guessing, and like 20 degrees dorsiflexion, something like that? Or, <laughs> I think it really depends. I, I, it, I don't have that answer in particular. I think it's going to be dependent on, um, ideally, if you've got a patient who's, you know, ideally you want to encourage normal gait mechanics. So whatever durometers will get you normal gait mechanics. So I guess I don't really have a, an answer to that question in particular. You want to mimic normal gait mechanics. So what dorsiflexion would be at, at mid stance is what you want to be mimicked in this foot normally. And, but again, depending on the durometer, the bumpers, um, that could, that potentially, you know, could change. So again, um, going back just to review, if you have a patient that you want stability for, that you want knee extension for, you might want to put a softer plantar flexion bumper in there so they come to plantar flexion more quickly and they have a knee extension moment at the knee. This would be true for somebody who's a transtibial that may be unstable. Certainly you might wanna consider this for somebody who's a transfemoral who's first learning because you want them to feel stable on that prosthetic knee. Um, disadvantages of this foot is it doesn't really provide inversion and eversion. Um, there, uh, there is incre increased maintenance with this now. The fancier these feet get, the more maintenance they get. So this takes more maintenance. There's more things that can break versus a satch foot. 
And the fancier these feet get, the heavier they get. So it is gonna be heavier than a sash foot is going to be. So I think this is, let me see where we're at in the lecture. Oh, we already talked about this quite a bit. All right, um, let's go ahead and before we go into multi-axial foot design and let some of that sink in, let's go ahead and take like a 10 minute break. Does that sound okay? Yeah. And it is 10.37, so let's come back at 10.47. Okay. Okay, get some coffee. All right. This conference will now be recorded. Yeah, so you guys might have to remind me of all of this because I'm not going to remember. All right, uh, close. Whenever I shut the recording thing off. So. Anyway, all right, so multi-axial um, feet. Again, some people are going to... Oh, do you have a question, Bryce? I just really fast, uh, before we moved off of it, I wanted to ask, so any sort of foot design that's going to have movement in all of the planes, is it going to like take, I guess, be sort of like a longer... PT period for the patient like really gets used to working on it as opposed to if they were using a foot that didn't allow for inversion or eversion? No, no. It's really going to be, ideally, you all as the prosthetist have put them in the foot that's most, that's going to make them the most functional. Gotcha. And so um, as a PT, I'm going to train them to use their entire prosthetic foot, um, depending on what type of foot it is. Um, no matter what. So if they come to me with a satch foot, I'm gonna get the most out of the satch foot that I can. If they come to me with a multi-axial, then I'm gonna get the most out of that foot that I can. Um, so I do take into consideration that maybe they've got these different foot designs um, and that's in the back of my mind, but I'm certainly gonna try and optimize their mobility no matter what they're in. All right, so we'll move on to the next type of foot. So the next type of foot is a dynamic dynamic response foot. So again, a million of these out on the market. Uh, most of them are carbon fiber. The rush foot is the only one that's more a little bit more uncommon. This is made of like a glass polymer, I think, based on some of the um, materials they use off the space shuttle, I think it was. It's a great foot. People, you, I see this a lot. You'll see this one when you go to conferences. Rush is always there, and this foot is pretty easy to spot because it is like yellowish white in color. It's not carbon fiber. Um, is that freedom foot on the top left? Is that the one that's most common in dynamic response? Because I've seen a lot more of those than anything else. These are all Oser. This one's an Oser foot, and this one's an Oser foot. I was going to say this one, the one on the top left looks like more like the freedom foot. This one? Yeah. That's uh, a very. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of them have very similar designs. Um, this is a Veriflex, and this is a low-profile Veriflex. So those are both Oser feet. Gotcha. Okay, no wonder they look very similar. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what foot this is. Again, there's so many different feet out on the market. I'm very familiar with Oser because I do some teaching for them. Um, and Rush again is one to ease that's easy to spot. Um, I, I I have certain the prosthetists that I work with, and you guys will be the same way, and, and any of you who have worked in prosthetic clinics already know that prosthetists have a few of each type that they prefer, and that's what they're going to prescribe to their patients. Um, for the most part, they have a handful of feet um, that they like, that they uh, work well with, and that's pretty much what's going to go on their patients. And you guys will be the same way. At least that's been my experience. You're not going to be worried about picking from 700 different type of feet. You're going to have your your several feet that you usually choose from, and that's what you're going to prescribe to the patient. So just going <laughs> off, off of that alone, like with some of this is with some of the processes that you've seen. Do they have like these individual these types of feet that they use the most in their offices and kind of just attach them to the bottom of the socket and then just no, have the feet have, them to oh. see when they're most comfortable with based off the category? Um, occasionally, but the that's the thing is usually you have to have the right size foot for a patient. So mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, not because I work in research, I you could usually can call up Oser and go, hey, send me five of this feet in five different sizes at five different categories. Or I can call Autobach and say that, and I get it um, in the mail, and I can try it out on as many patients as I want. So 
or as many subjects as I want. And a prosthetist, I don't know if they necessarily have that advantage. Um, as certainly, I don't think they have the ones they can just pull off the shelf because you have to match the category and the size of the foot. But maybe some of you who have worked in prosthetic clinics, do you at all have that opportunity to switch out some feet and give people the opportunity to try different things? Um, the only scenario when that occurs is when you have like a sample foot or something that was like off of someone's old prosthesis. But um, you really don't want to put a patient on a used foot because if that foot breaks or something and the patient falls, it's like really your fault. Um, you you only want to put a patient really on a brand new foot or a foot that they got. Like you can put that patient's old foot on a different socket, no problem. Um, but usually you order a foot specifically for a patient. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't work out, you can send it back. Right. You can fire that it wasn't working with the patient or it was maybe a size too big. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to try a different foot or a different size foot or, or whatever like that. But it's usually not something that you keep on the shelf, like Dr. Clemens was saying. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because I know I know of the old feet that that patient has with a brand new socket that they're, you're making for them. Yeah, that I knew already. I just wasn't sure. Like starting out, say, like for instance, Alex, if your father just had like a sample foot of each category and kind of see if that one, like, how do I, how do I put this? More like a, a baseline of what he's looking to do for that type of patient and then vary mm -hmm. off from there whether they need more uh, flexibility or less. You know what right. I'm trying to say? I'm probably yeah. running out words like, right most now. Time, like, most of the time, the prosthetist will just know what yeah. what they want to try it at least first. And then, like I said, if it doesn't work out, they can send it back and try another foot. Yeah. But, I mean, there are some instances where a patient will come in and have a completely broken foot and they'll need something because they don't have any other foot. And you can mm -hmm. plug a sample foot on them until the new one comes in or something like that. But you have to be really careful when you do that. Yeah, I I think that um, there is a fair amount of research. Um, the the DoD specifically has been funding research in the last several years to help figure out prosthetic prescription. So to help look at the characteristics of an amputee and have the prosthetist be able to narrow down what is going to be the most uh, functional prosthetic foot to prescribe for that patient. That research is all still ongoing, but the I, but what what I think that that the prosthetics and rehab prosthetic rehab fields in general are trying to do are set up algorithms and say if your patient has this 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 and this this is going to be the best prosthetic foot for them, and we're we're not there yet, but there's a lot of research going on to help guide prosthetic prescription, and there's a lot of money being thrown at that right now. So I would expect expect or suspect in the next few years that we're going to start seeing some of these algorithms come out and i'm going to talk uh, i'm probably not going to talk a little bit about them never mind <laughs> but there is research going on to help guide prosthetic prescription um and i know that that research has been funded in the last couple of years through the department of defense so eventually it might become a little easier and it won't involve so much guesswork um so again, so let's go back. Now we're starting with the dynamic response design. Um, these are also referred to as energy storing feet. Um, uh, energy, energy storing and dynamic response are gonna be the two main, um, main terms that you hear for these type of feet. They're often made of carbon fiber. They're for more high activity, community ambulation. This is a K3 or above foot. Um, it helps to absorb forces during loading and is released the stored energy during pre-swing. So this is going to provide the all elusive push off that we are looking for or gastroc recoil if we talk about what Jacqueline Perry's gate study was. Um, so it's looking for that push off in terminal stance and pre-swing. These feet are designed to provide that by storing energy during stance and then releasing the energy at pre-swing. There are tons of different designs of this. They do incorporate a nice long foot plate, okay? And so this foot plate is designed to allow for the amputee to have both 
rollover of the uh, forefoot rocker and the toe rocker. So as a PT, my job is to get them to use their entire prosthetic foot during gait. If they can incorporate and engage the, the forefoot rocker and the toe rocker of their prosthetic foot, they're gonna have a nice, long, normal step length on their contralateral limb or on their sound limb. That is very, very important. That is gonna help provide more of a normal gait, gait pattern for these folks. My job as a PT is getting them to learn to, to be stable and to balance over their forefoot and over the toe of their prosthetic limb so that they can get a nice long step on their contralateral limb. Now this is important for all people with amputations so that they can have a nice normal step length on both sides. But where it might be really important is somebody with diabetes, somebody who's got a, an at risk intact foot. So let's say they're an amputee on one side and their intact limb is at risk. Maybe they've got an insensate foot. I wanna teach them to roll over the forefoot rocker and the toe rocker of their prosthetic foot so they can take a nice, long, soft step length on their sound limb. I don't wanna encourage a hard, short, fast step length on their sound limb. All I'm doing is introducing shear forces into that insensate foot. So in saying that, many of our amputees are diabetics but many of them also might not be at this K3 level. So saying that only K3 amputees are allowed to have these dynamic response feet is potentially doing a huge disservice to some of our diabetic or, or more dis dis um, debilitated amputees who are at the K2 level because they are not able to get feet where they can actually get some of that energy turn and get some of that dynamic response. And so there's more research that needs to be done. There is research showing that people who are at a K2 level, when they're put into K3 level componentry, actually improve to being a K3 amputee. There's just not enough out there right now for the insurance companies to always reimburse for K3 componentry in somebody who's defined as a K2 amputee. But we can see that this type of foot would definitely be beneficial with proper training to somebody who's got an at-risk foot. It's gonna help them take a nice, long, soft step length on their sound limb. Um, so disadvantages of this type of foot, it's less adaptable to uneven surfaces than the, than the multi-axial foot's gonna be. We're not gonna see quite as much inversion eversion with this foot design. Um, it may feel stiff and unaccommodating to somebody who's used to a multi-axial foot. So somebody who's a higher level amputee who hears maybe these great things about dynamic response feet and then switches to one of these might think it's too stiff for them because they're used to motion in all those different planes. Conversely, somebody who's in a dynamic response foot who switches to a multi-axial foot, they're the ones that think those multi-axial feet are a little too wiggly because they're used to a little bit less of an accommodating foot. Um, they are expensive. They're more expensive than the other foot designs that we've seen. Um, there is more maintenance to them at times and cosmesis. So sometimes, especially with these J-shaped type feet, this type uh, of foot can be hard sometimes to accommodate in a cosmetic cover. And so people who want a cosmetic cover with their prosthetic foot depending on the J shape or depending on the design, um, might have a little bit more difficulty. Um, usually, especially higher level amputees won't put on a cosmetic cover, so they don't really care that people can see um, parts of the, the pylon or part of the foot. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, um, this is obviously not an everyday leg. This is something that we see on our runners or people that are doing definitely some sort of running activity. Um, that foot, I, it could be the cheetah, it's hard to tell, but that's definitely one of the, the running feet that we see on the market. They all have this J-shaped design to them. Um, so powered feet, I just do wanna touch on these because we do see these powered ankle designs or powered foot systems. 
These are incorporate artificial intelligence software to bring um, or to predict where the foot position is in space. So one of the feet that has been on the market for a while is the proprio foot, and that's an OSER foot. I know there are other ones on the market. I'm just not quite as familiar with them. The proprio foot itself provides power toe lift during swing. So it provides a little bit more dorsiflexion and lifts the toe up during the swing phase of gait. Um, it is able to sense if somebody's walking on um, a tile floor versus walking on grass. Obviously we need a little bit more toe lift on an uneven terrain or on a terrain with some sort of uh, obstacle on it. And this foot can provide that. It is programmed by the prosthetist. Um, so you would program this in your clinic with the patient and um, hopefully it provides them a little bit more function um, in, with walking um, and provides a little more foot clearance if that's what we're looking for. Sensors are used to monitor the environment. So like I said, if they're walking in grass, um, we're gonna see a video next on the biome. Well, it used to be called the biome. Now I can't, now I don't remember what they call it. Um, but this is actually a robotic foot that mimics um, both dorsiflexion and plantar flexion and will provide push off. Um, the biome, I have not, I've seen it on patients. I haven't seen it on a lot of patients. The proprio foot, I have seen on more patients. Um, advantages of this, again, are improved ankle foot dynamics during gait uh, and shock absorption. The disadvantages are the cost. It is expensive. We could not take these feet to Haiti with us. There was nowhere for people to charge them. Uh, when they live in a, a tent city, you're not going to have access to electricity. Um, uh, noise, there might be some sort of noise. I think the biome was noisier than it is now. There's a lot of different um, uh, versions of these feet out on the market. or Well, they've, they've come a long way, I should say. They're probably on version three or four now versus being on version one where we had more of these issues with noise and cosmesis. They try to get them a little bit smaller in design because they are bulky. They've got a battery in them, so they're going to be bigger. There is maintenance. So again, can't be walking in a pond while wearing this foot. You will ruin it. Um, and it, so again, it may be affected by environmental conditions. And that's another, well, beyond not being able to charge it in Haiti, um, those folks are walking in mud and dirt all the time. Not appropriate for this type of foot. If you've got somebody who likes to be out in their garden or is a farmer, probably don't wanna be putting them in a proprio foot. Um, maybe if they have enough money to buy a proprio foot to wear in the house and then wear their farming foot while they're out on the farm. Um, this isn't the type of foot you wanna put on somebody who's gonna get dirty a lot. So would this essentially be when the uh, when the power kind of goes out, would it just become a, a heavier single axis foot in that case, or the whole thing is just completely stiff? You know, when this foot goes dead, I am not sure what the, all of the knees, when they go dead, when the microprocessor knees have a default to them, they're either default free swing or they're default stiff. I'm not mm -hmm. sure with the proprio foot, actually. I would assume that it just defaults to like a, oh, I don't even know. That's a good question. Nick, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm thinking it's just going to lose the extra power and to give that little, that little to extra. Give a little bit of a lift. Yeah, I would assume it kind of defaults to a neutral position. Um, mm -hmm. It certainly isn't going to drop down at the toe. I I wouldn't think. But that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. We always talk about what if your prosthetic knee loses power. I've never talked to anybody about their prosthetic foot losing power. I might have yeah, to look that one up. It, that's what I'm saying, because if it's it should just be a single axis then for at yeah. least I'm and just what I'm thinking with that. So like you said, if it's got a default, I'm, I would assume the default's kind of like a swing. Yeah, I would I would think the default, I don't even know if it'd be a single axis. I don't even know if it would have move it into dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. It might just be a stiff ankle. I'm not sure. I will ask my prosthetist friend because I do not have the answer to that question. All right. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go ahead and watch a video um, on the biome, which again is a prosthetic foot that provides both plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion being the one that the proprio doesn't provide, so it provides some push off. In this video, um, the developer of this foot is Hugh Her. You may have heard his name before. He's up at MIT. He runs the robotics lab up there. Um, and uh, he himself is a double amputee. I think he was a climber and lost his legs climbing. But um, just a pretty neat way. I think they call the new foot the Empower. That's it. It used to be the biome, and I think it's called the Empower. So I'm just going to play this video. Hopefully, you can 
hear the audio on it. The fact that I can design a part of my body with synthetics and normalize my biomechanical capability is very inspiring to me. From this experience, I realized that technology has the power to heal, to rehabilitate, and to even extend human experience capability. Through advancements in bionics, I feel strongly that we will end disability in this century. With Empower, we are now one step closer. The Empower ankle has a compact and refined design with an integrated battery that gives users more freedom to look and feel their best. The Empower battery provides 50% more runtime than the Biome T2, giving users more energy to walk farther and faster while enjoying wherever life takes them. The bio-enhanced algorithm enables users to walk smoother and more naturally across any surface while reducing joint forces, which can lead to pain and osteoarthritis. The Empower Ankle is designed with weather-resistant materials, providing users with reassurance when exposed to rain, snow, and dirt. The lighter, low-profile battery and charger make them highly portable and easy to store. The battery charge indicator enables users to check the battery with the touch of a button. It also gives users more flexibility to easily move in tight spaces. The Empower Ankle is the only prosthesis that controls ankle power, resistance, and flexion in real time for stability across any surface. Ten years ago, when I invented the Biome Ankle, my main concern was enabling people to walk like they did before their amputation. Today, we've advanced this core technology into a more intelligent, refined, and easy-to-use platform that seamlessly integrates with the human body. This is our Empower Ankle. So the Empower is one of those ankles, and this is the most recent version of it um, that it is more waterproof. I don't know if the proprio foot has become waterproof or not. I do know they're doing a better job with getting knees to be waterproof as well. Um, some of the newest uh, um, versions of the different knees that are out there are, uh, more, are more waterproof than they used to be. So this next video is also out of MIT. Uh, out of Hugh Her's lab. And I think this was the surgery that Alex and I were discussing the other day. I think that both he and I saw this speaker at the same conference. Um, so this is just an interesting, again, I'm not gonna test you on this, but I think it's something that's interesting to know. So it's a new surgery that they've been doing um, up in the, uh, the New England area to try and get um, a little bit more natural control of prosthetic limbs being able to have more of this brain limb interface. Um, so it's an interesting video. It only takes a few minutes. And so I'll have you watch this as well. My name is Tyler Kleitz, and I'm an inventor in the Lemelson MIT Student Prize Competition. I love the development of the agonist the antagonist myoneural interface, a novel amputation paradigm and control architecture for advanced prosthetic limbs. Constrained by limitations of the clinical amputation surgery, previous approaches to neural control of prosthetic limbs have been focused on one-way communication from the brain to the prosthetic device. One of the primary types of feedback that's missing from these previous systems is called proprioception. Proprioception is the sense of the relative positioning of our body parts. In other words, it's what allows me to close my eyes and touch my fingers together. I can do that because I can sense where my fingers are in space as I move them. I wanted to find a way for people to feel truly connected to their prosthetic devices by restoring proprioception. The agonist-antagonist myoneural interface, or the AMI, provides two-way neural communication of joint position, speed, and force from a prosthetic limb to the brain. There are two primary innovations in this invention. The first is a new surgery that involves manipulation of muscles within the residual limb. Opposing muscles are linked together to recreate the dynamic muscle relationships that are essential for joint feedback. The second innovation is a new robotic control system, which would allow a person with this new surgery to control any robotic foot ankle in such a way that it feels like their own leg. The device shown here is a prototype of such a prosthesis that we use for experiments in the lab. To date, this surgery has been performed on six people. Several experiments have highlighted the unique benefits of the AMI system. 
Our patients are able to make an experimental prosthetic leg move naturally and feel it moving as if it is a part of them. I expect that this invention will revolutionize the way amputations are performed. It is my hope that this approach will reduce incidents of falls and other complications associated with prosthetic use and, perhaps more importantly, allow persons with amputation to feel a real connection with their prosthetic device. This slide here. So um, I thought that was, I think that's a, a pretty interesting, um, they're doing all kinds of interesting surgeries around the country. All of them are still in the sort of the research phase and, um, you know, aren't open to everybody. Um, but I, I, I think that it is an interesting thing. I was just getting, I got thrown off watching this video because I just realized their stairs don't have a platform at the top. They're having these patients walk upstairs that they could like fall over the edge. That threw me off. That's not safe. They should have <laughs> built, they should have put some money into their grant and got a real set of stairs in their pair in their in their lab. Anyway, if you saw the part where he kind of shook the roll of tape off of his foot, I think that when I saw the um, gentleman, the student who's now I believe graduated um, present, he said that the the subject actually didn't realize that he had didn't didn't see that he had stepped on something, but he actually felt that his foot didn't land flat on the ground and and just instinctively started to shake the prosthetic foot because his brain thought, oh, I got something on my foot, I need to shake it off. And that was really kind of cool because it, it, it provides that proprioception. This person knew that they had stepped on something. And, and, and so that fits huge for anybody who's going to be wearing a prosthesis to be able to tell where their limb is in space is really going to be helpful when it comes to fall prevention and safety and stability and things like that. Yeah, Dr. Clemens, that was the guy that I was talking about. And uh, I actually have the video on my phone from where I recorded him playing that video at the conference. I think I showed, I think I showed you guys, didn't I? Maybe. A while ago in class. But yeah, I that has stuck with me. I, I thought that was so cool, especially the tape thing. Yeah. Like shaking the tape. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't say in this video that it was unintentional, but he did yeah. when he spoke at the conference. And uh, I had seen, I had been showing this video prior to, and then I saw him in real life at the conference as well. Um, yeah, so pretty interesting stuff. Okay, so residual limb volume management, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well as we start to talk about the prosthetic design. Now, again, I skip over a fair amount or all of prosthetic socket design in this class um, because you're going to be getting that in school. Um, so if I if I have something that doesn't make sense because I say it and I'm assuming that you know something about the socket design, please ask me and I'll try to clarify as much as possible. But um, socket design is really sort of the um, sort of like your wheelhouse. You know, uh, prosthetic componentry um, is manufactured by engineers and um, and it's pretty standard. Whereas socket design is all over the board. Uh, there's so many very uh, ingenious designs around the country and around the world. It's really where the art of prosthetics comes into play. And so um, I feel like you're going to learn a lot more about socket design in your program than, than I could tell you about. But again, if you have any concerns over what I'm talking about and how it and with regard to socket design, you can ask me and I'll try to clarify as much as I can. So when a patient finally is wearing a prosthetic limb, they are going to be in some kind of socket, more than likely, um, unless they have osseointegration, which we don't talk about. That's a socketless prosthetic, but they are probably going to be in a socket. So one of the things that we're really going to have to watch, obviously, is their volume change because it can affect um, how they walk, how they move. It can affect what I do with them in rehab. Um, presentation of volume change in a patient could be that they're complaining of pain, that there's redness over areas of the residual limb that there shouldn't be. Maybe they're having numbness and tingling. Maybe they're developing blisters. The height of the prosthetic. So if you look over at the little diagram over to the right, you can see that when I take a view of their iliac crest level, 
the side of the prosthetic limb, if it's too short, maybe they've sunk down in the socket because they've lost volume, that iliac crest level is gonna be lower on that prosthetic side if they've sunk down into the socket due to volume loss. Um, the prosthesis may be unstable. That means it might be too loose. So they need to add some socks to, to fill up some of that space within the socket. There could be pistoning of the prosthesis. So they might be coming out and in depending on the socket suspension. Um, they might, and we don't want that happening. Um, and then there should be, there probably would be rotation of the prosthesis. So again, if it's not fitting snugly enough, the, rot the prosthesis is gonna rotate. I don't know how many times I've had patients walk into my therapy gym with their toes turned out 45 degrees. And I'm like, what are you doing? You need to put some socks on. Your leg is rotating, especially if they drove there and they get out of their car and they aren't really paying attention to what's going on. Um, so certainly that, that those are all things that can happen with um, changes in volume. So clinical presentations of volume loss, the patient may complain that the socket feels too tight. Okay, why do you think they might complain that the socket feels too tight when they've lost volume? Any ideas? Okay. So if they've lost volume. Would that be they like can... they would have sunk lower into the socket? Yeah. Yeah. So they've sunk down into the socket. So I put the solo cup there because that's kind of what a socket shape is like. Our, our limb is conical. Um, so if I've lost volume, I'm going to yeah. sink deeper into the socket and the socket's actually going to feel like it's squeezing my leg more because I'm down inside of it a little too much. And so that's where they might, they might actually say my socket feels too tight, where really they just aren't being suspended the way they should be in the socket. It's not too tight. Um, they may have pain at the distal end. So they're getting pressure on the distal end of the tibia or the distal end of the femur because they've sunk down in that socket too much. Potentially they've got some increased sweating. Um, because they've got all these changes going on and now they're pressed down into that socket a little bit too much. So pressure over the residual limb, there's going to be areas of the residual limb where we expect to see pressure and they're pressure tolerant areas. So those are in blue on this diagram. And again, you're gonna learn a whole lot more about this if you haven't had to learn it already. And then there's gonna be pressure intolerant areas. Those are gonna be the areas that we don't wanna see redness on, or if redness go away five to 10 minutes, those are areas where we need to address prosthetically, um, potentially with different types of um, um, ad adaptations to the prosthetic socket. Hopefully, um, as the patients are, are being fitted with their check socket and you are going ahead and you're, you're, you're sort of taking an, uh, all of this type of thing in, you send them home, potentially with their check socket, which I don't even remember if I talk about a check socket in here or not, I might've pulled that out as well. But um, initially you're gonna, you're going to fit them with a check socket, which is a clear socket design. And you're gonna be able to see some of these areas and hopefully get a definitive um, answer as to, are these areas that are pressure intolerant or pressure sensitive, are they getting too much pressure? Um, you'll usually send the patient home with their check socket for a little while and have them sort of monitor these areas, making sure that that redness that shows up there is gone within five or 10 minutes. Um, but again, the posterior part of the leg that, is, that isn't on this picture, the posterior part of the, the, the leg in a transtibial amputee that are pressure tolerant are gonna be the popliteal fossa and the femoral condyles and the pressure intolerant areas are gonna be where the hamstring tendons come into attach. We don't wanna put a lot of pressure over that. It's gonna be uncomfortable for them. So in looking at transtibial design, again, troubleshooting pressure areas. Um, if there's general pressure, pinkness in pressure tolerant areas, that's normal, okay? We don't want painful redness in the pressure tolerant areas. But if they take off their limb and we see that there is some pinkness over those pressure tolerant areas, we're not really that word worried about it. Again, the redness should dissipate within five to 10 minutes or 10 to 15 at the most. Um, and the position of the red area may be indicative of too many or too few sock ply. So if we see that the, um, that the redness is falling a little bit 
uh, superior to where we would normally expect to see it, that might indicate that they're sinking down into the socket too much. If the pinkness and the redness is a little bit inferior to where we would expect to see it, they may not be down in the socket far enough. And so knowing where those pressure tolerant areas are and keeping um, um, monitoring where that redness is located can be important as well and give you some indication as to whether or not they are um, wearing the appropriate amount of socks. So again, in, um, in the transtibial amputee, we're gonna see some of these areas, if they've lost volume, having too much redness. So the pressure tolerant areas in this case should be more of the patellar tendon, which is down here. If they've sunk too low in the socket, we might see redness right at the distal patella. Um, same thing for here. These are gonna be our areas that we see a lot of complaints on in our patients with transfemoral amputation. Certainly over that pubic ramus, and I've talked a lot about that lateral femur and how we get lots of complaints of people complaining that the lateral femur or that the distal femur is hitting the lateral border of the prosthetic socket. Um, if they're down too low in the socket, this is gonna get worse and this is gonna feel worse. So we've gotta make sure they've got good sock ply management and they've got appropriate suspension within those sockets. Those are big areas of complaints. Um, in our patients. Any questions on this right now? Uh, yes, Dr. Clemens, back uh, two slides. I believe you, you uh, had at the bottom pre the, about the pressure of, of the over the residual limb. There you go. Um, so tolerant pressure areas being the popliteal fossa and the femoral condyles. Cond so that's these right here, the femoral condyles. So the posterior part of the femoral condyles are considered pressure tolerant. That's where we would be expecting you're gonna use those for suspension and that that um, it's okay if there's some pinkness over those areas. That's where you would expect to see some pinkness because that's where we're applying some of our suspension um, using the transtibial socket. Now again, this is transtibial. And the hamstring tendons being intolerant right. to pressure. Yeah. So those hamstring tendons are going to come in and attach um, somewhat laterally on the uh, femoral condyle. So you want to make sure um, that you know anatomy-wise, and you're going to learn this as you go to make your sockets of where they're going to teach you how to define where your pressure intolerant and pressure intolerant areas are as you make the socket itself. So again, these are just like general terms that I teach. You may learn this in more detail um, as you go on to learn to make prosthetic sockets. Okay, yeah, I was just looking at it as far as like, in terms of the insertion points for those hamstring tendons of like the semimembranosis and biceps femoris and where those would sort of affect pressure, but I don't know. I was just trying to get like a mental image of why that would not be a very good idea pressure wise. Yeah, and I mean they even if you if you rub over the area where your hamstring tendons sort of come into your um tibia, even just pressing on my own, it's a little it's a little tingly, it's a little sensitive. You don't want a lot of pressure over that particular area. You want to try to grab the bones versus some of the soft tissue. Now there is soft tissue all around our bones. But it just tends to be one of those areas that is gonna be a little bit less tolerant to, to pressure. So like even palpating them on yourself, they have that little twingy feeling, at least on my leg it does. Okay, all good, thank you. Yep. All right. So again, clinical presentation of volume gain. Is this all I have on this slide? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so somebody who's, actually gone up in volume. Again, maybe they're one of those patients that has end-stage renal disease or has congestive heart failure or ate a really salty meal the night before or drank too much beer. Um, so they, somebody who can't get their leg on, they can't get their leg on in the morning, they've got pressure or volume gain. So they're unable to put their prosthesis on. When they do get it on, it feels tight or it feels throbbing. They're gonna have redness distal to the pressure tolerant area. So again, we're gonna see this pinkness or redness 
distal to the areas we would normally expect to see it. That means they're not getting down into the socket as far as they should be. Um, there might be pressure over the tibial tubercle. Um, again, because it's raised up a little bit, it's gonna be in the wrong area of the socket. Um, the end of the limb, red or weepy. So this is with consistently not being down inside the socket. We're not gonna see this you know, particularly with one day of them not getting to the bottom of the socket. Um, what do you mean by? Oh, go ahead. What? No, what, what do you mean by weepy? I'm not. I'm not 100 sure what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about something that we see with somebody who doesn't have good distal contact in just a few minutes, and that's where I'm going to talk about the weepiness. Gotcha. <laughs> um, the prosthesis is maybe going to feel too tall. Okay, so they're not able to get down. You've made them. You're a great prosthetist and you made that prosthetic limb so that their iliac crests are just at the exact right height. Well, now their limb is too fat to go into their socket all the way. So they're gonna be too tall or it's gonna feel too tall on the side of the prosthesis because they're not sinking down where they need to be in the socket. And they're also gonna feel potentially unstable, especially at this transtibial level. If you've got it so that that socket design is grasping where it needs to grasp to keep them stable, and now they're not getting down far enough, they're a little too tall, they're not in the socket where they should be, they're gonna feel off balance. So here's where we're gonna talk a little bit about skin issues due to prosthetic wear, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that weepiness. Um, so again, I touched on earlier, you know, these folks have got to be desensitized by the time you decide to put them in a liner and certainly by the time you decide to put them in a socket they should be ready to take some weight on that leg that leg should have some um they should have had some input over the previous weeks and months they should be touching it they should put putting cotton balls on it they should be rubbing it with a tissue they should be taking a towel and pushing through the end of it to get some weight through that leg but, but despite all of that we still send, tend to sometimes see that there's gonna be skin issues in these folks because now they're in this closed environment. We don't normally walk around with a, you know, a silicone liner on our legs. It, it takes time for their skin to get used to this new, new closed system, um, that new, new closed environment that it's in. So one of the things that we do tend to see, um, not super common, and I hate to see it when I do see it, is um, negative pressure hyperemia, which eventually can lead to something called verrucous hyperplasia, which is actually a precancerous position. So in answering your question, Rich, if somebody doesn't have good distal contact in the socket, they're gonna have some pistoning up and down over time. And it's gonna develop this giant area of redness, almost like this giant hickey, where a blood has been pulled into this area over time. If this continues to happen and they continue to not have good distal pressure in their prosthetic limb or good distal contact, appropriate distal contact in their prosthetic limb. Over time, this area is going to start to weep and ooze and become very cracked and dry and it can become infected and it can become a precancerous condition. Um, I have only seen this in a couple of patients I'm getting a slow network connection. So obviously, when I see this in my patients, I start to really get concerned over what how the prosthesis is fitting. We should not be seeing this type of redness at the bottom of the socket consistently, redness that doesn't go away. If we have some pinkness at the bottom of the residual limb and after 10 minutes it's gone, I'm not too worried about it. If it's not uncomfortable, if it goes away, it's probably appropriate pressure. If I see this and it's pretty pink and it's not going away and, I'm, and I ask them how long they've had it, then I get a little bit concerned. There's not good distal pressure, not good appropriate pressure in the socket. For some reason, they're not getting it. Um, either there's not enough socks, either the socket isn't fitting right. It can lead to this weepy, oozy type of, of hyperplasia that we might see. Any more questions on that, you think? No, that, that, yeah, that pretty much explained everything that I needed. Thank you. Okay. So other things that we might see, allergic dermatitis. This is going to appear over the entire limb. Now, most of the, the liners are, may, are hypoallergenic, but you're still potentially going to have some patients who have some sort of reaction to the liner. When it's a reaction to the liner, we're going to end up seeing it all over the limb. 
okay? Um, not necessarily just in one spot. Contact dermatitis, this is due to something like tape. Maybe they had a little bit of a sore and they had a bandage over it um, and still, you know, we're putting their liner on, took the bandage off and now they're, they've been allergic to something. This isn't necessary, this is not due to the liner, okay? This is due to something else that they were in contact with. The liner would be all over the skin. And then something that we see pretty commonly is folliculitis. So this is essentially an infection in the hair follicle. So people, because we're in this closed, they're in this closed environment now, they've got a liner on their skin, it's rubbing, it's tugging at the hairs of their skin. They aren't allowed, women are not allowed to shave their prosthetic or their residual limbs for a while um, before, uh, as they're learning to wear their prosthesis. Um, and really, I think it's up to the doctor and the, and the and working with a prosthetist to decide when they can go ahead and start doing that again, or if they wanna end up getting it waxed or lasered. Um, but they end up a lot of times with these infected hair follicles. So it's something to, to consider. They can get painful and they can get infected and cause a little wound. Even my high level amputees who are runners, they will eventually, because of the friction and they're such so high level, they will eventually end up developing these. Hopefully we can curb the infection rate on them. Maybe they have to cut back a little bit on their activity, but you have to keep an eye on things like that. Um, it does, it does, it is somewhat common. Um, uh, also, I think going along with this, you guys as the prosthetists are really gonna be the ones to inform them on how to clean their prosthetic liners and what type of, um, what type of detergent or soap they need to be using to clean their prosthetic liners. They should be cleaning their liners every day. You're going to give them two liners to use with each prosthesis that you make. So they wear one liner, then they clean it at night and let it dry and where they, they wear the other liner the next day. Ideally, they're rotating liners every other day. But you guys are the ones that are gonna teach them how to clean it and make sure maybe the therapist knows what you like to use. Um, it, for what you like your patients to use to clean it because I've had patients come in before complaining of skin irritation and I'm like well what are you cleaning your liner with and they tell me bleach well bleach is not going to be good for the liner material itself and certainly isn't good for their skin but they thought you know bleach is what I use to clean my liner and I know this guy had a good prosthetist he just wasn't listening to him um, so make sure that your patients know the appropriate type of soap or cleaner that you want them using on their particular liner, or they're gonna end up with some sort of dermatitis or worse, blisters from something that shouldn't be inside their liner. And their liner's not gonna last. I tell patients these liners are seven or seven hundred dollars at least usually, um, to, and so they're expensive. They don't wanna buy another one out of pocket if they don't have to. So mechanical irritation, this is something you'll see from a poor fitting liner. Obviously this person maybe either gained weight and didn't go back to their prosthetist and continued to wear their liner. So you're gonna see that it's cutting in to the residual limb at the top of the liner. So it's just not the right fit. Blisters. So this is something you're potentially gonna see on patient even with your best intentions. Perfect fitting liner, perfect fitting socket. Some people are just gonna get blisters. Um, a lot of times this doesn't mean they have to quit wearing their prosthetic limb. Basically what we do is we do a first aid over the blister. We make sure there's antibiotic cream and, the, and especially if the blister has punctured or broke open, we've got a bandage over it. They can wear a bandage inside their liner, you know, making sure that it, just letting them know that maybe the suspension, it won't be as great, but certainly they can still walk with this type of thing happening as long as they're keeping an eye on it and whoever they're seeing on a regular basis, it was usually me as the physical therapist, I would be seeing them two or three days a week. I would keep an eye on it. Um, and as long as it looked like it was healing, we were all good. If it did not look like it was healing or it was getting worse, I would immediately refer them back to the wound clinic if they were going to a wound care clinic or refer them to their physician. They would need to start, to, they would need to take a look. Um, the physician need to take a look. But usually it didn't mean we had to quit wearing the prosthesis um, as long as we were keeping a very close eye on how that, that blister was doing or how that wound was doing. And again, that can be physician dependent. 
Some docs, as soon as somebody forms an issue um, on their limb, don't want them weight bearing on it. I worked with doctors who were good with it as long as we kept an eye on it. So that's gonna end up being your own professional judgment call and depend on the physicians and the, um, and the therapists that you're working with. Uh, calluses. Now this is something you're gonna see occasionally develop within the prosthetic limb. Hopefully not too often. That ends up being an area um, of undue pressure. But again, sometimes those are gonna happen. And again, pressure wounds. Again, even with your best intent, sometimes your fragile, more fragile amputees or people with more fragile skin. I've got some very high level um, construction worker type, di type one diabetes um, amputee patients who are super active and their skin's just gonna break down. Um, it's fragile. We just keep an eye on it. If they have to be off their leg for a while while it heals, it happens. Um, sometimes with your best intent, these pressure wounds are still gonna develop, but you wanna make sure that it's not anything that has to do with your prosthetic socket design that that is happening. All right, I think this is the end of this lecture. So we're gonna go ahead for the next 15 minutes or so and start into the next one, and then we'll do a lunch break. So, all right, good. So far, I think we're, we're staying on schedule to where I thought we would be. All right. All right, so prosthetic rehab. This is where we're gonna talk a lot more about prosthetic gait, prosthetic gait mechanics. And, um, and I think that's pretty much the bulk of this, of this lecture itself. So control of the prosthetic knee. Um, this is important. And I kind of alluded to it when we were talking about prosthetic feet. The goal of proper prosthetic alignment is to make sure that that ground reaction force vector is optimal or is in an optimal position for our patients to have a safe and as normal as possible gait pattern, okay? Sometimes safety precludes normal as possible depending on the um, phase that your patient is in. So if they're a new amputee, safety, and they're just learning how to use their prosthetic limb, safety might be a little bit more important in those first couple of months than the normal gait pattern. But as we train this patient over time in therapy, and as they get better and more confident on their limb, hopefully we can make it so that the gait pattern is what we're concerned about, making it an optimal gait pattern. And that might involve taking away a little bit of the stability. But we only take away stability if our patient is ready for stability to be taken away. Um, so the primary functions of a prosthetic knee, so now we've kind of talking a little bit more just about transfemoral amputees here. We want them to be stable and hopefully they're providing some shock absorption. So remember, at loading response and at initial contact is where the, the subtalar joint and the knee joint are our primary shock absorbing joints. Subtalar joint is being mimicked by whatever prosthetic foot they have. Knee joint is being mimicked either by their actual anatomical knee, so they don't have to mimic it, or it's being mimicked by a prosthetic knee. Now remember at loading response, we have 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion during normal gait, right? Everybody remembers that. With a prosthetic knee, we may not necessarily have 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion. Uh, some prosthetic designs claim to have stance flexion. When they're actually put into a gait lab, um, and the flexion is looked at, sometimes it's not there. So prosthetic companies can, can claim all they want that they're providing stance flexion, that they're providing 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion at loading response to mimic what is normal, but it's not always there. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when the, when the sales rep comes to your clinic and tells you that they provide stance flexion. Maybe they do, but likely they don't. Um, but but uh, control of the prosthetic limb is going to be dependent on three factors, three main factors. Uh, the patient's voluntary control. What does the patient bring to the table? 
How long is their limb? How strong are they? How good is their proprioception? And how quickly can they contract their muscles? How quickly can they fire their hip extensors? These are very important. You do not have control over this. I have a little bit of control over this because I am training these things in the patient or hopefully training these things, at least strength, proprioception and speed of contraction. Nobody's got control over the limb length except for the, the surgeon. He's there or she is the one who actually made the limb that long. So these are things that the patient brings to the table when they walk into your prosthetic clinic, okay? What you have control over is the alignment of the prosthetic knee and the inherent mechanical stability of whatever prosthetic knee you decide to put on that patient, okay? So these are factors that are directly related to the prosthetist and the prosthetic design. You are going to be able to influence the control of that prosthesis in these two ways right here. But you have to take all of these things into consideration when you go to do that. So control of the prosthetic knee, and this is where I think we had a discussion a couple of days ago or, or even last week about limb length. Um, no, maybe it was yesterday. And where we align that prosthetic knee with regard to the amount of hip flexion that the patient has or the amount of hip flexion that we build into the socket. And I say we, I don't build sockets, but I feel like I'm one of you sometimes. So I pretend to be a prosthetist. So there's gonna be bench alignment. So this will be how you all align the prosthetic limb uh, according to the manufacturer's specifications or however you do it at your prosthetic clinic. And then there's gonna be dynamic alignment where you actually apply the alignment to the patient themselves. So when we look at stability from an alignment standpoint, what we have to take into consideration is how much residual limb do they have? We talked about the length of the residual limb. The patient is gonna bring that to the table. You have no control over how long their residual limb is. You can hope all you want that they've got a nice long residual limb, that'd be great. But that's not gonna happen all the time. So this flesh colored area or peach colored area here, this represents the residual limb in this diagram. So we can see over here to the left that this person's got a very short residual limb. And then over here to the right, this person's got a very long residual limb. So we also can see the difference in the amount of the black, which is the amount of flexion of the socket. So the shorter the residual limb, the more flexion if, if we bisected this socket, the more flexion there is in this socket. Longer residual limb, a little bit less flexion. Nice long residual limb, a little less flexion even then that we need to build into the socket. So if we look at this diagram at the top, we see here that stability is greatest. We need the greatest stability for that patient built into the prosthesis when they have a shorter, and smaller, maybe less strong prosthetic or residual limb. So we need more stability when the residual limb is shorter because this person has less control. So control is very small here. This person does not have much control over their very small and short residual limb. As we move to longer residual limbs, the person has now more control, which means maybe we can align that prosthesis to be a little less stable give them a little more freedom and a little more normal movement. So as the residual limb gets even longer, maybe in the case of a hip or, or knee disarticulation or very long transfemoral, these people have much better control in general. They've got long muscles. They've got a long lever arm. They don't need quite as much stability built into the socket itself. So we talked about flexion of the socket. With this shorter residual limb, if we take a plumb line and we drop it down, or we take the ground reaction force line from the foot upward, we can see that this ground reaction force line is running pretty significantly in front of the knee axis at this point. So what moment do we have at the knee axis over here at the left, a flexion or extension moment? Extension. We've got an extension moment. We want this leg to be nice and stable for this patient. 
okay? So the design of the, the prosthetic might be that we have more flexion in the socket, but we're because we're going well, we want them to be able to fire their hamstring muscles a little bit better by putting those hamstring muscles on a little bit of stretch. So we flex the socket a little bit to enable them to fire the hamstring muscles or the hip extensors a little bit better. But now we have to align the knee a little more posterior to give them some more stability. If we aligned the knee out here at the bottom of the socket, look how far in front of the ground reaction force line that knee would be. So we'd be creating a really, I'm gonna use my drawing tool. I haven't used it lately. So we would be creating, if we took the knee and put it at the end of the socket, right here. Oh, I can't draw today. Look how far in front of the ground reaction force line that knee joint center would be. We would have a huge flexion moment at that knee. That patient's gonna buckle as soon as they put weight on their leg. If they don't deviate somehow to be able to get that knee into extension. So what you do as a prosthetist is you go ahead and you set that knee posterior of the ground reaction force line to create a nice stable extension moment at that knee. Now, as this patient gets stronger or somebody who's got a little bit longer residual limb, we're able to take that knee center and move it closer to the ground reaction force line. So it's got a little bit less of an extension moment at it, okay? But that means they're gonna have a little bit more normal gait pattern too, okay? This knee is gonna flex when we want it to flex. When we look at, hold on a second, erase my drawing. When I look at this particular design, this knee is not gonna flex very easily because it's gonna be difficult to get the ground reaction force behind the knee. It is aligned in such a stable position that we're not gonna get a lot of bending at the swing phase. We're not gonna see a lot of knee flexion at pre-swing and at terminal swing when it's aligned this stable. As we move that ground reaction force line closer to the knee center, if the person can tolerate it, if they're strong enough, if they got a long enough residual limb, we're gonna see more normal gait pattern. And then um, progressively, as that person gets stronger or as the residual limb is longer, we can actually move that ground reaction force line a little bit behind the knee to make it so that we have nice smooth flexion throughout the gait pattern, throughout pre-swing, initial swing, um, and the swing phase itself. Because this person is strong enough to control the limb even though there is some flexion moment at the knee. So, do those things make sense? Does everything I just, does this diagram make sense to you all? Dr. Yeah. Clemens, I have, so if by adjusting, um, if by adjusting the knee axis in, um, in correlation to where our um, ground reaction force would be, or I guess in this case, just like where the articulation of the knee joint to the socket would be, if that's gonna affect our stability as far as like, you know, we deviate it way posterior to make the maximum stability um, in the in the short transfemoral limb contracture, and then we kind of do the opposite with the knee disarticulation, what is going to be adjusted specifically for the mechanism of control? Is it, are, is that just, I mean, um, I mean, like after the, that to give like- process. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know, I guess I was just looking at specifically what would increase our control for each one of these stages. So because I don't get into prosthetic knee design, um, the specifically the, con the control of the specific type of knee that you put on these patients will also have to be adjusted. So if okay. you have them in a hydraulic knee um, of some sort, you may have to dial up control or dial it down to create that stability or less stable knee that you're looking for. The microprocessor knee is going to have to be, you know, hooked up to the Bluetooth and have to readjust that particular control of that particular knee. So I don't go into that type of thing here in this class itself, and I really don't go into it for my PT students as either because you all okay. are going to get 
that in depth. Um, so what I want you to kind of like generally take from this is that if we need somebody to be stable in their prosthetic limb, likely we're going to have the knee joint center posterior of that mm -hmm. ground reaction force line. If we want less stability, if they got a nice long limb and they're super strong, we don't need to align the knee joint center so posterior. We can give them a little more, more freedom. That's gonna give them a little smoother gait pattern and a little more normal gait pattern. Gotcha, okay, I see what you're saying. So as far as just control goes, it just has to do with the length of the residual limb itself, as far as in this picture, like you have more control if you have more residual limb right. um, to offer. And then I was just gonna say like, um, if, as far as we could we look at it as is as, as, as if we change the knee axis anterior or posterior um depending on our patient um can we kind of look at that as our like control with like the ground reaction force is always kind of sort of going to be definite or are we changing where the ground reaction force is going to be once we change where that axis is going to be the ground reaction force is pretty much what it is um okay. so you're going to adjust to where you want that ground reaction force to fall with the design of your prosthetic. So you're either going to set them more stable by uh, bringing the knee joint axis posterior, or you're gonna set them less stable by bringing it more anterior. Um, so I will have, and, and just to, to let you know, I have had short people with short residual limbs be super strong and be able to handle you know, a, a normal alignment of a leg. We didn't always have to keep them in a safe alignment. As somebody gets stronger and more confident, you can start to set them less safe. They don't always have to stay in a safe alignment. So I'll call up the prosthetists and say, you know, hey, you know, Bob is, is doing really well in therapy. This knee is not flexing and keeping up with him. We need to back off on the stability of the leg. So they'll go to the prosthetist, the prosthetist will readjust the limb, usually to make it a little less stable so that we can start to accommodate for his improvement in strength and his improvement in balance. Conversely, somebody with really long limb isn't automatically gonna be strong and balanced. They may be timid, not have confidence, and you're gonna see some of this with some of the videos that I show you when we talk about prosthetic gait. So it's a matter of training the person making sure you're getting them as strong as they can, as we can in therapy, making sure we can get them as balanced and as confident as we can as well. So residual limb length brings something to the, to the table, but so does strength, stability, um, and stability from balance of the patient. So it, it all kind of interacts um, as to how safe um, they are with the particular alignment. Um, if you don't feel somebody's safe in their prosthetic limb, then by all means, we need to align that prosthetic limb into a more stable um, alignment, which is going to be extension at the knee. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, so let me just check and see what the next picture is. Oh, perfect. All right, so this is a good time to stop. Let's go ahead, and I said I'd give you 45 minutes for lunch, and so we'll come back around 2, 12.50, and then we're gonna to start to get into a lot more um, of prosthetic gait at that point, okay? So 12.50, I'll see you back here. All right. Cool. Good deal. See you then. Sounds good. This conference will now be recorded. All right. I'm here, so. Alex and Bryce are here. Okay. And yeah, that was James. Yeah. All right. Um, you too. Out of the fridge. Yeah. So we still have a fair amount of material to get through um, this afternoon. Prosthetic gate deviations. I want to make sure you understand um, those things. So we'll take as much time as we need to to get through it, and then the next PowerPoint is on outcome measures and uh, fall recovery and fall mitigation. So hopefully we can get through most of that stuff. We're probably gonna be pushing it right till about four, but I'm not gonna go past four and whatever we get through, what will be on the exam. Anything we don't will just be reference material for you all and maybe we can revisit it at a later date when times are more normal.
All right. <clears throat> so prosthetic or common gait deviations. And um, again, I did my PhD under Bob Gailey at Miami. And so um, what I, how I analyze gait for the most part has come from learning from, from him and then learning from other prosthetic uh, experts in the field. Um, Bob is, is, if you have not heard his name before, he is the premier physical therapist in the entire world when it comes to amputee rehabilitation. He works with the UN, he works with a lot of different countries in Europe, he's uh, worked with the Department of Defense and the VA. Um, anything that's been a high profile, anything to do with amputees, Bob's probably had his hand in it somehow. So what I would teach you about gait is based um, out of what I've learned um, from Bob Gailey's principles for the most part when it comes to amputee rehabilitation, um, especially specifically with gait. <clears throat> So again, now we're um, starting to talk about where we would start to, where as a PT, I start to gait train people. So as soon as they get their, their prosthetic limb, um, occasionally I will have them in therapy with a check socket on. Um, we are just sure that we're, usually I work with a prosthetist and making sure we're not gonna do running or things like that. Um, we wanna make sure that we don't, because I get in big trouble if I break a check socket in therapy. Um, but so usually they've got their um, preparatory prosthesis um, and then I also like to see people if they've got um, changes to a definitive prosthesis, if they've got new componentry or things like that, the prosthetist will usually send them in at least for a couple sessions um, to try and make sure that they're optimizing their new piece of prosthetic componentry. <clears throat> oh, and I probably have some animations here, I'm guessing. Okay, so we're basically going to go through uh prosthetic gait the same way we went through pathological gait and normal gait um starting with the different phases of gait and the different deviations that we're going to see during some of these phases so i'll start out with what we expect as normal and then we'll work our way to what deviations are common during that specific phase of gait um so again I am not going I tell my PT students the same thing I am not going to test you on what's normal and expected for an amputee. So you might see here that the hip or the thigh range of motion at initial contact is 25 to 30 degrees where during normal gait, it's about 20 degrees. For, for me, normal gait is normal gait. So normal gait is not different for an amputee than it is for somebody who's got two legs. So remember back to what your normal gait is. I am not gonna specifically say, what is the hip motion at initial contact of an amputee and expect you to know that there's a five degree difference. Um, normal is normal. Normal is what we should see in everybody. Anybody who deviates from normal is deviating whether or not they're wearing a prosthesis or not. <clears throat> but there will be things that I highlight when it comes to amputee deviations um, due to the uh, wearing a prosthetic that you should know. So again, Normally, what we see is what we see in normal gait pattern, five degrees of that forward rotation at the pelvis, uh, zero to five degrees of extension at the knee, about 20 to 25 degrees of hip flexion, the ankles in neutral. One of the things that we want to be aware of, though, with prosthetic gait, um, as the heel contacts the ground, is the prosthetic foot shouldn't be too abducted, so it shouldn't be maintained out to the side. We still want them to have that more narrow base of support. And the sound foot shouldn't cross midline, and we'll talk about that. We want them to keep their good leg on its own side. A lot of people will tend to bring the good leg underneath them to sort of help with balance, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. <clears throat> what we do tend to see at weight acceptance, so remember weight acceptance is initial contact and loading response, um, is we do see that time of increased double limb support. So we see that people with amputations tend to kind of hang out over their back limb, if it's the sound limb. Um, and so we have this increased time of double limb support where they're not coming off their sound limb quite as quickly as they should be. Um, part of the reason for this could be that it's time, they need time for their prosthetic foot to stabilize. So they have to feel um, that they're ready to put weight on that prosthetic foot. Remember what type of um, uh, the stiffness of the heel and the stiffness of the prosthetic foot itself, if it's too soft of a prosthetic heel, 
they may not feel stable putting weight onto their prosthetic foot. So that might cause them to kind of hang out over their sound limb and, until they feel stable over that prosthetic foot. Um, Time for the soft tissues to settle within the socket. So we know that there is excursion within the socket for both transtibial and transfemoral amputees. And it's several millimeters. Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember my numbers. Maybe 20 to 30 millimeters at times um, that they actually compress down into the socket and lift back up because we have a lot of soft tissue, especially with transfemoral amputees. And so there's a little bit of wiggle in there that us with two legs, we don't have when we walk. Um, time for them to gain confidence over putting their weight onto a prosthetic foot that's out in front of them. That takes time and it takes practice <clears throat> for many people. At the transfemoral level specifically, we need time for the femur to create that closed kinetic chain. So at initial contact and at loading response, the femur needs to come into extension and come toward the back of the socket. And so we train people to make sure they're really getting the femur to the back of the socket, extending into the back of the socket and firing those hip extensor muscles. Um, the quicker they can do that, the more stable they're gonna be over that prosthetic limb. So unless they've been trained on how to quickly fire their muscles and get that femur toward the back of the socket, um, they may take more time in getting weight over the prosthetic limb at weight acceptance. During loading response, um, we want to see again that the hips are in 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Now here's where, remember what is normal knee flexion at loading response, okay? 15 to 20 degrees is what we normally see. Now the range here is zero to 20 because some people, specifically transfemorals, may be in a prosthetic knee that doesn't have any of that flexion ability. So they might be at zero degrees of flexion or no flexion at loading response. Whereas somebody who's a transtibial and has an anatomical knee, they're gonna be at that 15 to 20 degrees. Um, so, so when we go to look at gait deviations in somebody who's got a prosthetic knee, we might, be, we might give them a little bit of leeway if they're in a, a, a prosthetic knee because they're not gonna get that 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion at loading response that is normal. Somebody who's a transtibial and has their own knee should get 15 to 20 degrees at loading response. <clears throat> because a transfemoral may not have that little bit of compression in the knee at loading response, we're gonna see that their center of mass doesn't accelerate toward the ground. So remember that M curve way back on the very first day that we talked where I said that the um, the M curve. So the first peak is the center of mass accelerating toward the ground at loading response. Well, the reason it can accelerate toward the ground is there's going to be 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion helping it lower toward the ground. If somebody's in a prosthetic knee that doesn't flex as much, then the center of mass can't come toward the ground quite as much. And so that's where if we're looking at an M curve of somebody who's in a prosthetic knee, sometimes we can tell that they don't have that stance flexion or that 15 or 20 degrees because their center of mass peak isn't quite as high. Um, the, that it does take increased muscular effort as we know at loading response, lots of muscles are firing. Um, and this potentially can alter somebody's balance if they don't have all their muscles intact, like somebody with a, specifically with a transfemoral amputation where lots of those balance muscles have been cleaved. Um, again, the, the ankle at 5, 10 to 15 of plantar flexion, five degrees of forward rotation at the pelvis. Same thing as we would see in normal gait. So deviations. So we went right from sort of normally what's expected um, with gait with an amputee to what deviations we're going to see at initial contact and loading response. So I've got lots of videos for these deviations, and a lot, many of these are former patients of mine. So prosthetic foot is externally rotated. So we look at him as he brings his prosthetic foot down into initial contact and loading response. We can see how that toe kind of rolls out into external rotation. This is something that we see somewhat commonly. So this prosthetic causes for this would be that maybe the person 
put on their prosthesis a little bit rotated externally. So transtibial or transfemoral, maybe they put their socket on a little bit turned out. Dr. Maybe, Clemens? Yeah. His, um, his other normal foot um, is also externally rotated. So do you think yeah. that would just be more of like a hip issue? Well, we're gonna talk about that one right here at the bottom. So I wanna just focus on his prosthetic foot only at this point, and then we're gonna talk about what his other leg is doing as well. Um, so when looking at the prosthetic foot, so we see that it's turned out, it could be because he put his leg on wrong, it could be because the prosthetist has the foot toed out, um, it could be because his socket is too loose, Maybe he needs to add some socks. Maybe the suspension isn't what we want it to be, so that foot has rotated outwards. Or again, it could be that too, he's got too firm of a, of a heel in that foot. So remember, when we talked about too firm of a heel, not only will it cause it to come into dorsiflexion too quickly, but it also could cause the foot to rotate outwards instead of compressing down into plantar flexion. So those would be prosthetic causes that we might see that externally rotated foot. Person causes would be that the person doesn't have very good muscle control. So maybe he's got weakness at those hip rotators. Maybe the internal rotators of his hip are not uh, firing like they should be. The person maybe hasn't been trained well enough to keep alignment while they're walking. Or potentially if they have a really short residual limb, it's gonna limit how much control they have in that transverse plane. So a short, really short femur or a really short tibia might cause that external rotation of the foot, of the prosthetic foot. Now down here at the bottom, like was pointed out, external rotation of the sound foot. We see this in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people, a lot. Like I would say 85% of amputees will exhibit an externally rotated sound limb. So do you see why when he walks with that sound limb, the heel, his sound limb heel, comes right underneath the midline of his body. So if we were to kind of draw a line straight down through the cleft of his, like his gluteal cleft or the cleft of his buttocks, straight down, his left foot comes almost right down the center of where his gluteal cleft is. People do that because it, main, it helps them maintain balance. They now have a little bit bigger base of support because they've externally rotated the foot and they brought the foot underneath their body. So in, a, in essence, it's a way of cheating. That foot should be on its own side. And that is certainly something that we look at when we start to do gait evaluation. So this, is, this lecture part is just on the deviations that we see. When we get into gait evaluation, we'll start to talk about the very, very specific things that we look at during gait. And that is one of them with a, an externally rotated sound limb that's placed underneath the body, directly beneath, beneath the gluteal uh, cleft. So does that answer your question a little bit? I don't, I don't remember who asked it about the externally rotated sound foot. Yeah. All right. Yes, it did, thank you. Okay. Excessive knee flexion. So again, this is during the loading response phase. So right about there when he got ready to bring the foot down into initial contact. Let's see if we can watch it one more time. I think it's on his second swing forward. Right about here, he was in too much flexion. So he was unable, he didn't extend his leg all the way out at terminal swing and he brought, a foot, he brought his foot down and his knee was still in flexion. So prosthetic causes could, for this could be, at least with the transtibial amputee, that the socket is too flexed forward. So in the transtibial amputee, if we have a socket that's in too much flexion, it's gonna cause flexion at the knee, and we're gonna see that at initial contact and loading response. If somebody, somebody has a foot that's too dorsiflexed or too firm of a heel, remember too firm of a heel is gonna cause dorsiflexion at the ankle, if somebody's prosthetist has made it so that their toes are up and the foot is too dorsiflexed, we also are gonna see excessive knee flexion at loading response. Because remember, dorsiflexion couples with knee flexion. If in a transfemoral amputee, 
we have a knee axis that's too anterior to the ground reaction force line. Sorry, I've, I've got I've got TKA line, which is trochanter knee ankle line. It's the same thing as the ground reaction force line. So the knee axis that's too far in front of the ground reaction force line. So the ground reaction force is now behind the knee, where it sh where it, it, where it it usually should be at loading response in normal gait, but it might be too far behind the knee for this person to be stable. So that would cause a flexion moment at the knee that maybe that person can't control and we see excessive knee flexion at that point. Um, if the prosthesis is too long, so which doesn't happen very often, but it does happen, um, so maybe they can't get it all the way into extension before they put weight on it. Um, person causes for this could be a knee flexion contracture. So somebody with a transtibial amputation, somebody who's got an anatomic knee, isn't able to straighten it all the way. So as they land in initial contact, they aren't at zero degrees. They're actually a little bit too flexed if they have a knee flexion contracture. Somebody with a hip flexion contracture. So remember, a lot of times when somebody's got too much flexion at the hip, we also see too much flexion at the knee and too much dorsiflexion at the ankle. It's that kind of crouched posture. Um, so somebody who's got a hip flexion contracture, we might see that they have too much flexion at the knee as they go to bring weight down um, onto the leg. Somebody with weak quads or hip extensors, again, they're unable to get that nice straight knee at initial contact. We want zero to five degrees at initial contact. If their quads are weak, um, we might not see it. Decreased speed of contraction. So somebody like the gentleman in this video, I will tell you he was very strong um, and he was a marathon runner before he lost his leg. Now he didn't have a lot of confidence in his prosthetic. He was a very nervous guy, but he had good strength. He was super strong. What he had trouble with besides confidence was just the ability to fire his muscles fast enough. So to get that femur into the back part of the socket, into the posterior socket quick enough to create that closed kinetic chain. That was more of his issue along with his confidence. So he was unable to fire his muscles right there and get into hip extension where he needed to or start to move toward hip extension and stabilize himself in that socket. Again, poor balance and certainly pain. Pain can be a cause for any of the deviations that we see here almost. Um, so I, I won't dwell on that one too much. I'm gonna dwell more on the biomechanic causes of DV. I have a quick question. Um, it was his confidence, was it because he felt like he was gonna fall? Is that why? Like they feel like they're gonna fall, is that what's happened? I think they, It's as you work more with amputee patients, you realize there's a lot of psychological stuff that goes on. I think he may have been a very nervous person prior to the amputation to begin with. Um, oh. you, you know, and so I think that kind of plays into it. Certainly he wasn't confident in his prosthetic, but I think that it might've been part of his, his normal psyche to be that kind of person anyway. Um, okay. So that does carry over, obviously, into his confidence in the prosthetic limb. That's why I think, and he was seeing a psychologist at the time as well, um, but I think that it can be more important for certain people to make sure that they have the, you know, and he was a fairly new amputee at this point. Um, I don't know how he's doing now, but he had the, he was one of those patients that had potential to do very, very well, but his actual confidence and, and mental nervousness was was limiting his mobility and you're going to run into people like that okay thank you yeah. abducted gait so the prosthetic foot is placed too far laterally um, um and the sound foot is placed too far medially so again keeping this prosthetic limb too far out to one side and bringing the good limb too far to the center so um, prosthetic causes could be in a transfemoral amputee, maybe that medial brim of the prosthesis is riding up into their um, pubic symphysis too much, and so our pubic rami, and they are getting pinched. So they might bring the leg out to the side a little bit to relieve some of the pressure over the pubic bones. Um, if the prosthesis is too long, and again, whenever I say prosthesis is too long, I rarely see that a prosthesis is too long, but occasionally it will be. If it's too long, they might keep it out to the side a little bit to accommodate. Um, 
poor conforming lateral wall in the transfemoral amputee. So again, the lateral wall of the socket will ride up over the greater trochanter. So the lateral wall of these prosthetic sockets is gonna come way up over the greater trochanter toward the ileum. If there's gapping in that lateral wall and it's not right up next to the pelvis, we might see that they keep their limb out to the side a little too much. If they have inadequate suspension, so the leg feels like it's not on there real well, maybe it's rotating, um, they, we might see that it's kept out to the side. And if they have too much knee friction, so let's say they're in a, a knee that has adjustable friction, and many of them do, maybe it's a little too stiff. If the knee is set too stiff, it's not going to bend nicely as they walk. And so they're going to have, it's, it's effectively going to be too long functionally. We're not going to get that nice bending to be able to swing it through. So if they can't bend their knee enough, then they're going to have to keep it out to the side a little bit. So that's where the prosthetist comes in to kind of correct for some of this deviation and maybe adjust the friction on the knee. Um, and again, we didn't talk about different types of knees in this class, but that's where I would call up the prosthetist and be like, hey, we need to dial down some of the uh, friction on this knee so that it swings a little bit easier. We can get some more bending because he's keeping it out to the side a little too much due to a lack of knee flexion. <clears throat> Person causes for this deviation might be that they have an abduction contracture. So maybe they've got some stiffness and they, they tend to keep that leg out to the side. Poor training is a big one. They just were not trained on how to properly walk. Nobody told them, don't keep your, your prosthetic leg out to the side and your good leg underneath you. That's not the right way to walk. So really, you know, gait training and proper gait training is important. Maybe they have an adductor roll. So if they're in a transfemoral socket, um, when that socket comes way up into the, into the uh, pelvic area, if they have a real fleshy, um, a real fleshy thigh, occasionally that skin and that extra tissue will get caught up into the top of the socket between the socket and the pubic rami and it causes what we call an adductor roll so that's really kind of the job as the prosthetist is to make sure that all that tissue of the thigh is incorporated down into the socket and down into the liner to make sure that this person doesn't have to keep their leg out to the side if they have an adductor roll way up high in the, on their leg it's going to pinch and so they're going to keep their leg out to the side to make sure that it doesn't pinch Somebody with weak hip flexors who can't swing their leg forward normally in flexion might swing it to the side instead. And again, pain. Pain is gonna be one that causes, again, many of these deviations. I think I have more pictures on this slide somewhere. Oh, shoot. Okay, now you go back. All right, now we've moved on from loading response. Okay, so now we're going into mid stance so now the person is in single limb support we're out of the double limb support phase the person has moved into the single limb support phase so the body is progressing over a stationary flat foot the foot has come to the ground um, maintenance of lateral hip stability is critical so remember we still have um the ab ductors firing tensor fascia lata is still firing like crazy and in the studies they've done with amputee gait those hip abductors, specifically tensor fascia lata, fire even longer into the gait cycle than people who have two legs. So those abductors are working really hard in those hip extensors during um, mid stance. Again, these are gonna be what we normally would expect to see um, during gait, we should have a neutral hip. They should be coming nice and tall over that prosthetic limb. Um, the abdominals are firing to sort of maintain the trunk to be upright and again, Glute med, glute min, and tensor fascia lata. These are hip abductors. These are accounting for a lot of what's going on during mid stance, during gait. So what type of deviations do we see during mid stance? And we see quite a few of them. The typical lateral trunk lean. I think I've got some other. So we see that they've got a hip drop contralateral hip drop a lot of times and how do they compensate for contralateral hip drop they throw their trunk over their prosthetic limb okay this is super common more common in our transfemoral amputees than our transtibials but it is seen in both 
So prosthetic causes could be maybe the prosthesis is too short. If the prosthesis is too short, then they're going to have to compensate somehow. And usually it's with that lateral trunk lean. In somebody with a transfemoral amputation, again, if the lateral wall of the socket, which runs up here in this area, if that's not fitting well, then the person's leg is going to go into relative abduction and the trunk is going to lean over that side to counterbalance them so that they don't lose their balance. If they have a medial wall that's impinging, so up here in the uh, pubic area, if it's getting pinched too much, they may keep that foot out to the side, which is going to cause that lateral trunk lean. Again, they're going to have to lean over to keep their balance. Maybe the prosthetic is aligned in abduction, so maybe for some reason the the um, the um, the pylon and the prosthetic knee, um, or even in a transtibial, if the pylon and the foot are set into some sort of abduction, maybe to give the person a bigger base of support to keep them balanced, we still may see that they lean over that prosthetic limb to counteract that abduction of the leg. So those are prosthetic causes that we might see that lateral trunk lean. These are gonna be some of the person causes. So we're gonna see potentially that, I showed you in the last photo, that contralateral pelvic drop greater than five degrees. All right, so in a sense, in essence, these people have that Trendelenburg gait pattern. So they're compensating for that pelvic drop by trunk leaning away from it over their prosthetic limb. This is gonna cause the sound limb to take a shorter and faster step. And it's gonna cause increased shear forces through that sound limb. So we almost always see people who are leaning over the prosthesis, they're gonna have a little bit shorter, faster step on their sound limb because they're not balanced over their prosthetic limb. They wanna get that sound limb back on the floor fast. And somebody with a diabetic foot that's gonna increase shear forces because they're gonna be trying to bring that, that other leg down hard and fast. They wanna get back into double limb stance. Now, reasons that we see this in amputees can be different than reasons that we see this in people with two legs. So if you think back to our pathological gait lecture, the reasons, one of the main reasons we saw that contralateral pelvic drop was because of weak hip abductors. That was pretty much one of the main reasons. In amputees, that might not be the primary reason, especially in a transfemoral amputee. We now have this shortened bony lever arm. So we also have muscles that are cleaved, but now we don't have a lever arm that reaches to the ground anymore. We have a lever arm that reaches, maybe if we're lucky, halfway to the ground. So that could be one of the main causes is that we see this contralateral pelvic drop um, and trunk lean and hip instability in somebody with an amputation. They've got the loss of muscle tissue. We've got atrophy. They're not able to contract their muscles as quickly as they used to. They don't have the proprioception that they used to have. The knee is gone. Um, potentially the knee is gone and certainly usually the foot and the ankle are gone. So this is gonna cause a loss of balance or it's gonna affect balance. Certainly pain. If they don't wanna bring their prosthetic foot underneath them during mid stance because it hurts too much to weight bear through their prosthesis, then they're going to offset it to the side. They're gonna lean over it with their trunk and they're gonna take a shorter step on their good leg so they can hurry and get their weight back down under their good limb and get off their prosthetic limb as fast as they can. Lack of confidence will do the same thing. They want to spend as little time on their prosthetic limb as possible. Is there a question? Yeah. Jack. I may have forgotten it uh, or did not hear it very well. What, is, what does TFA stand for? Transfemoral amputation. So somebody with a transfemoral amputee. <laughs> I need right. to not abbreviate. Yeah, so they've got that loss of, I mean, we're going to see this in transtibials as well, but somebody with a transfemoral amputation, we're going to see it more often is that lateral, uh, we're gonna see that contralateral pelvic drop, and we're gonna see that lateral trunk lean to compensate for it. And one of the main reasons we think is in combination is, is they have that loss of lever arm. They don't have their full femur anymore. 
Any more questions on this deviation? I think I have a video of it coming up as well. Um, it's because it's super common. It's super common that we see this. If you watch the next amputee you see, watch them, and I can probably 90% of them are going to have this. Yeah, Alex. Um, so the first deviation we talked about was external rotation during mid stance. No, that was during initial contact and loading response. Yeah, weight acceptance, sorry. Yeah. So but now we're into single limb support. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've kind of we're shifting through the gate phases a little bit. Right. So for weight acceptance, we have external rotation and excessive knee flexion. Yes. And abducted gait. Yes. Okay. And now mid stance, we have lateral trunk lean and lateral instability yeah and i and the trunk lean is going to be kind of the big giveaway it's going to usually a lot of times it'll be in combination with an abducted leg as well um the compensation um the the lateral trunk lean is in compensation due to hip instability okay so lateral lack of lateral hip stability is not a major it's not a deviation it's no the the trunk the trunk lean is the deviation okay yeah, but it's due to hip instability, which can be due to these reasons right here. Gotcha. Good Thank questions. You. Yep. And I think my next one might be a video. Oh, I talk about proprioception again. So we talked about that. All right. And we saw this lady when I did pathological gait. She's got a big lateral trunk lean. Um, she's very functional, though. But this is pretty typical of what you're going to see in some of your transfemoral amputees. So she does have that contralateral pelvic drop on the left as she goes into mid stance. You can see how she's got that drop on the left pelvis. And then she leans away over her prosthetic limb to compensate for it. So again, this lady was a phys ed teacher at an elementary school. She's super active, but she's got a lot of gait deviations. But she doesn't use an assistive device, so. She gets around pretty well. The problem is she's gonna have, um, if I can't remember if she already had back pain issues, but this can start to cause a lot of issues um, back pain wise and, and spinal wise. We believe that that can be one of the causes. Oh, and again, you, oh, sorry. Can you play? Play? sure, yep. But if you watch her left foot, and it's hard because we're not on a straightaway too much, but she takes a little bit faster step on that left foot as it comes to the ground. She takes a fast, shorter step. Can you kind of see that? She's a pretty good walker, but she does have a little faster step on that left foot. Yeah. Okay, so that's where somebody who's got a diabetic foot that's at risk, you're taking a shorter, faster step, you're putting more forces through that diabetic foot, you're gonna end up having potential issues. And even with her, she's, she's introducing more forces through her limb. This is why people end up with arthritis in their good knee. They wanna get off of their prosthetic leg as fast as they can. So they take a shorter, faster step on their good leg. So, and again, she's a pretty good walker. Um, at first I was thinking it, it almost looked like an ipsilateral hip height on the prosthetic side, as opposed to a contralateral pelvic drop. Um, but I can see the pelvic drop now. Yeah. But yeah. would you see contralateral hip height with a lateral lean? No. Or it's a lateral hip height, I mean, with a lateral lean? So, yeah, uh, ipsilateral, we don't have an ipsilateral, or we, hip height happens during swing. So right now we're talking about stance, mid stance. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the hip hiking only happens during, or pelvic hiking only happens during the swing phase. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if I can kind of pause. Uh, let me pause it here when she's kind of going around. Ah, oh, darn it. It wouldn't let me pause it. Let me see if I can get it to pause. Go back. All right. Here we go. Uh, let me take it. Let me cool. see if I can get her right about there so right here 
So I'm as sure. she's getting ready, do you see how her pelvis is dropped on the contralateral side? Yeah. yeah. Her yeah, pelvis was... is lower here. Okay. She's got to lean away from that because if she doesn't, she potentially is going to lose her balance over this way. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, because she's a transfemoral amputee, this isn't in people with two legs. A lot of times this is due to hip AB ductor weakness. Now she's got a lot more going on than just weakness. She's got loss of a lever arm. She's got loss of proprioception of these two joints. She potentially isn't firing her muscles fast enough. Um, so there's a lot of other reasons that we might see contralateral pelvic drop in somebody with amputation. Do you all see that pelvic drop over here though? Yeah, and you yeah. can see the, the ipsilateral lean as and, well. Yep, and then the trunk lean's coming right here. Nice. And again, super common, super, super common. So varus or valgus moment at the knee. So again, we're still in this mid stance phase of gait. So only focus on that part of gait right now. So prosthetic causes, why we might see a varus or a valgus moment. Which one do we see on him, varus or valgus? Um, valgus. Yeah. Yeah. I say valgus. Yep, so we've got a valgus moment at the knee right now. Mm -hmm. Prosthetic causes for this might be that the foot is too outset. Um, a varus cause, we'll look at the video in a minute. So if his foot is outset to the side, maybe the prosthetist did that on purpose to give him a wider base of support. That's not necessarily this gentleman's issue, but I'm just saying that's what could be happening. Poor socket fit. Maybe the socket's a little too loose. And now for some reason when he puts weight on it, it's going into that valgus moment. And so we will see that on occasion. A lot of times they can just add some socks, tighten the socket up a little bit, and that deviation will go away. Maybe the socket is too abducted. Again, sometimes the prosthetist will do this to, to add to the base of support. Yes, Alex. Um, so if the foot was too outset, we would see valgus, and the foot too inset, we'd see... Uh, varus. Varus. Yep. I'm going to start the next video because I'm pretty sure this one's a varus moment. I think it's on a treadmill though. Hey, what's going on? Oh, it's just slow. Oh, it's probably a longer video than it needs to be. Uh, all right. So I think we get to the person eventually here. So watch their knee and you can see how the socket is sort of pushing out to the side laterally as they put weight on it. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So he's got a, it's not bad, but it's not uncommon to see this. So he's got a little bit of a varus moment at the knee. Same with this person, but see how the foot is a little more medial versus lateral. I'm going to take it back a little bit. So again, right here, he's coming down into mid stance or close to mid stance. We've got this uh, at the knee, the, the socket is moving laterally but see how his foot is medial. So if the if the prosthetist has decided to inset the foot for some reason, it could cause that varus moment at the knee. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Versus the valgus moment in the video above. So person causes for this could be that they have a knee deformity. If you've got somebody who's been knock kneed their whole life, you're not going to get rid of it with the prosthesis. If they're knock kneed on the other side, then I expect that you know their prosthesis is going to be knock kneed. This gentleman up top is not knock kneed. Um, if or and vice versa, if they're bow legged, you know you've got to accommodate what was been normal for them their whole life. So you might have to accommodate it in the prosthetic as well. Do they have ligament laxity? Maybe they've got some issues with their knee itself, where it actually tends to be more um, tends to go more into a valgus or varus posturing. Somebody with weak hip AB ductors. So somebody who tends to have a leg that is kept more in AD duction at the thigh, as this gentleman at the top does. Maybe that's due to weak hip AB ductors. If we've got a, a thigh that's an adduction, a lot of times the bottom part of the leg will look like it's in a valgus posturing. I haven't seen this patient as an old patient. I'm trying to remember 
exactly what the reason was that he had valgus. I want to say that we out the prosthetist outset his foot some to give him a little bit more balance. He still has a pretty narrow base of support, but he again was another guy who was young, but pretty nervous about walking on a prosthetic limb. So I think we had decided that it was, and actually in him, the um, socket looks abducted as well. But I think it was helped to give him a little more stability to widen his base of support a little bit. An another reason to outset the foot would be a lot of excess pressure on the fibular head. Yeah, so that could have been as well. Pain, again, can cause some of these deviations. So right. an example of a socket being too abducted, is that, mm -hmm. I'm just like, what does that really mean? I mean, I, I understand abduction, adduction, but as far as are we, I mean, and how so would you? I'm gonna kind of leave that to your prosthetic courses. I am not gonna worry that you know how, what too much socket flexion or too much socket abduction is at this point. Um, I guess I don't know how to explain it uh, because I don't have to teach it. That's more of prosthetic um, fabrication. Uh, and it's hard with me not having a socket in front of me to show you, but can you see how his, let me see if I can bring him back here. Can you, uh, it's not a good stop. This isn't, but can you see how his socket is sort of leaned this way a little bit versus going straight up and down? Um, yeah, let me kind yeah. of draw it. It's yeah. kind of, it's kind it's of, oh, that's, I am not drawing very well today, <laughs> but his socket is kind of, so if this is a straight up and down, his socket's kind of angled out a little bit into what we would consider abduction. Okay. It's not straight up and down. Does that, does yeah. that kind of explain yeah. it? Yeah. I was just saying, I was just thinking about how that would be, how that could be different to just the overall, um, I guess, trajectory of the residual limb. Like how could you make those two exclusive from each other if the socket's gotta be sealed against the residual limb the way yeah. it already is? So I didn't know socket abduction is not the same thing as residual limb abduction. And, no, and you, you know, and I think in, in soccer fabrication, you have to take that into consideration. If we are abducting the socket to give him more stability, you certainly don't wanna put more torque on his medial knee. So you as the prosthetist has to know that his body can tolerate that, or you got to find a different way to make him more stable. Yeah, so this would depend on like where the distal attachment is placed on the right. actual pocket. It can, it can, yes. Yep. All right, let me get rid of my... It's and like, so you guys will get more into those kind of things once you start your you know prosthetic fabrication, things like that. But... Um, so we will talk about socket being too flex or socket being too extended. If you have questions about that, certainly, yes, keep asking me and I'll try to explain it to the, the best that I can. So knee hyperextension, we are still in mid stance. Okay, so the person is still in stance. I lost my cursor. Oh, there it is. Okay. So again, so we're looking right here. She's in mid stance right now because she's not quite to terminal stance. Do you remember what the beginning of terminal stance was? What was the, the characteristic of the Did beginning of the yeah. vertical? So she's still in mid stance here on, uh, on this. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, that was mid swing. Um, sorry, forget what I just said. She's in mid stance though. We're looking at the stance leg, not the swing leg, sorry. Um, prosthetic causes, uh, why we might see too much extension at the knee. Well, the foot could be in too much plantar flexion. We talked about that earlier. Too soft of a heel cushion or too soft of a plantar flexion bumper is gonna allow that foot to come into too much plantar flexion too early. And that's gonna cause knee hyperextension or too much extension at the knee, all right? We pretty much only see this in transtibial amputees. Can't really hyperextend a prosthetic knee, or you can't, you shouldn't be able to. So this is just gonna be in our transtibials that we see this deviation. So again, too soft of a heel cushion, that foot came down into plantar flexion too quickly. And because plantar flexion is paired with extension at the knee, that's why we're seeing that knee extension. The socket might be too extended, so the socket might actually be tipped back into too much extension. That's going to actually force the knee to go into too much extension. Um, if the patient changed their shoes, now all of a sudden they wanted to wear a little bit of a heel. If somebody puts a heeled shoe on, what is the relative position of their foot now? If it used to be flat and now they have a heeled shoe on, 
What is the foot gone into? Plantar plan flexion. flexion. Yes, it's gone into plantar flexion. If we now have plantar flexion at the ankle, what are we going to have at the knee? Hyperextension or just extension in general? Too much extension. Um, another reason we might see this is because of weak quadriceps. So again, the person doesn't have the control to keep their knee nice and soft and instead throws it back into extension um, by throwing their trunk forward to keep themselves stable. So we might see hyperextension as well because of that reason. That would be a person cause for it. So we are now um, still in single limb support, but now we're talking about terminal stance. So we're back here looking at this prosthetic limb. I apologize for the blurry pictures, but sometimes I have to take snapshots from my videos. Um, right. So now we're in terminal stance. What rocker of the foot are we engaging with terminal stance during normal gait? Uh, heel forefoot? Forefoot? Forefoot rocker. You guys shouldn't be asking this with a question mark at the end. <laughs> forefoot? Um, yes, forefoot rocker should be engaged at this point. The hip or the thigh should be in 10 to 20 degrees of extension. So we expect to see, you know, normally what we would see. There might be hip flexion built into the socket of transfemoral amputees to assist with hip extensor firing. So again, a lot of times, and you will learn this in prosthetic school, to build a little bit of hip flexion into the socket. The idea is we're putting the hip extensors on a little bit of stretch, which enables them to maybe fire a little faster and a little harder. And so that's one reason that hip, ex hip flexion is built into a transfemoral socket. Um, but that may in turn limit our hip extension ability if there's too much flexion built in. Um, uh, a hip flexion contracture is going to interfere with their ability to extend the hip into terminal stance. So just like with other pathological gait, if they can't achieve, and I'm gonna use my drawer here, if they can't achieve, oh, where'd my pen go? Shoot, hold on. There we go. No, it's not it's not behaving for me. All right. No, 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 no. I don't want that one. I want this one. Okay, here we go. If they don't have, oh, it's not behaving. Anyway, I want it to behave. Here we go. If, it, if they don't have that ability to extend the hip into 10 or 20 degrees of extension because they have a hip flexion contracture, they're not gonna be able to engage these toe, this forefoot rocker, okay? If they can't get this hip extension and engage their forefoot rocker, they're gonna end up bringing their sound limb down to the ground too early because they aren't, enable, they aren't able to use their whole prosthetic foot. Their hip is too stiff. So now we've got another shorter, faster sound limb step, which we don't want. So as a PT, and one of the things I teach my students, and, and you should know as a prosthetist, we can't force somebody to go into this much hip extension if their joint won't move that way. If their joint is so stiff that it anatomically can't achieve hip extension, then we are for sure not gonna engage toe rockers and forefoot rockers, and we're gonna have a shorter sound limb step. So as a physical therapist, and a lot of things that physical therapists sometimes forget to do, is I, if I can't get my patient's hip to move where I want it to move, I better take their prosthetic off, lay them down on the table, and start aggressively mobilizing and stretching that hip joint because I can't force them to walk into a motion that they're anatomically, they can't get. So as a PT, um, it, to let you know, if you are seeing that your patient cannot get into 10 degrees or 20 degrees of hip extension because their hip is so stiff, they need to go to therapy and see if we can get that hip mobilized and stretched out so they can achieve terminal stance and be able to have a more normal gait pattern. Uh, oh, let me erase my drawing. All right, there we go. Um, so again, we are should see five degrees of backward pelvic rotation now. They're in terminal stance. That pelvis should have rotated backward. 
So we saw that the pelvis was rotated five degrees forward at initial contact and loading response. And now as we get ready to come out of stance, the pelvis should be rotated backward. So that's one of the things we work on a lot in PT is making sure they have that good pelvic rotation so that they can, uh, so that they're able to achieve these different stance phases. Oh, uh, there's my cursor, okay. So again, in terminal stance, we're still talking about terminal stance, the body is getting ready to come down on the contralateral limbs. So we still need to have lots of trunks, uh, lots of hip stability on our prosthetic side to maintain posture and stability as we bring that other sound limb down to the ground. Weight shifting over the metatarsal heads and the heel to toe foot plate designs better enable this. So those dynamic response feet, those feet with a really long heel to toe foot plate, that's gonna help encourage terminal stance. What foot design or what, what classification of foot that we talked about today is not gonna enable terminal stance all that well? Do you remember which foot I talked about? You can't use the forefoot rocker and the toe rocker? Box foot, thatch. Thatch foot. Yeah, that so one. People have a very people have a very difficult time or the inability to achieve terminal stance while wearing a satch foot. Because the satch foot, remember, the forefoot rocker is pretty much not there and the toe rocker isn't there. It's all foam. There's no keel that extends down there. So these dynamic response feet and some of the other um, K2 level feet will have a nice long foot plate. So we're able to get the forefoot rocker and the toe rocker. We're able to get terminal stance and pre-swing. Every foot is not gonna accommodate that. Satch feet are not gonna accommodate that. You can't get into terminal stance you're gonna have a shorter, faster step on your sound limb. So here's where I, I mentioned that. You're gonna have a shortened sound limb step. step. Um, this could be due to their inability to balance over the prosthetic. So let's say they have this nice long foot plate. I see this a lot, even in good walkers. They just don't spend enough time over their prosthetic forefoot and over their prosthetic toe. You saw it in the video of the lady I just showed you. She took a shorter, faster step on her good leg. She's super strong. She probably just was never trained on how to use her prosthetic foot, the entire prosthetic foot the right way. Um, pain or discomfort, they don't wanna keep weight on their prosthetic leg, so they get off of it as soon as they can. If they get off of it too early, they're not using their forefoot rocker. They're not getting into terminal stance as much as they should be. If they have decreased backward transverse pelvic rotation, so again, if they can't backward, uh, backwardly tr rotate their pelvis in the transverse plane, they're not gonna get that hip extension that they need for terminal stance. If their foot category is too stiff, and you know we didn't talk a lot about foot category, but if they have a foot that's too stiff, it's not gonna enable them to really use the rockers of the foot. It's gonna keep the foot a little too stiff and they're gonna come off of it a little too early. Yeah, are you raising your hand, Alex? Or no? Oh, okay. No, sorry. That's all right. Okay, now we're gonna talk about pre-swing. So again, now we're back into that period of double limb support. Hopefully the person hasn't come down on their sound limb super hard and super fast, but a lot of times we see that yes, it is a shorter, faster step on their sound limb. Um, but this is that period when we get ready to unload the prosthetic limb side. Again, at this point, we should have 30 to 35 degrees of knee flexion. Same as with normal gait, all right? This is one of the easy places to see if we've got a prosthetic gait deviation. If they don't have 30 to 35 to 40 degrees of knee flexion, just like in normal gait during pre-swing. Um, we are gonna begin forward transverse rotation of the pelvis. It is still in backward transverse pelvic rotation. But when we do gait training with these folks, and again, we're not gonna get into it, unfortunately, because we don't have the lab. We do a lot of training at this point for them to bring that pelvis into forward rotation in the transverse plane. This is where people tend to not wanna forwardly transverse 
transversely rotate their pelvis. And so as a PT, I work a lot on rotating and getting them to rotate their pelvis. If I do not see 30 to 40 degrees of knee flexion at pre-swing, I immediately look to the pelvis to see what it's doing. If it is not getting ready to, to, to rotate forward, I know as a PT, I've got to train that. This is not something that can be fixed prosthetically. This is a training issue. So if you don't see 30 to 40 degrees of knee flexion, especially in a transtibial amputee, then you better get them to PT and have them get trained because there's something going on likely at the pelvis. And that's my, that's my PT perspective. This is why I am teaching this course to you from a PT perspective. You're getting enlightened beyond what other prosthetic students get. Okay, all right. So insufficient knee flexion. If we don't see that 30 to 40 degrees of knee flexion at pre-swing, what could be the reason? So I just talked to you about the person cause. They aren't getting their pelvis to start to rotate forward in the transverse plane. That is a big one that we work on. Poor training, they were never taught how to rotate their pelvis forward in the transverse plane. Maybe they pick their foot up too early, so they're not using the forefoot and the toe rocker. If they don't use those rockers, they're not going to get 30 to 40 degrees of knee flexion at pre-swing. So those are all the person causes. Those are the ones I work on in physical therapy. The prosthetic causes. If their prosthesis is too short, they are not gonna probably get 30 to 40 degrees of knee flexion. Can anybody take a guess as to why a short prosthesis would cause a lack of knee flexion? I've kind of given you the answer. I want you to use your brains a little bit. Why would a short prosthesis prevent them from getting the knee flexion we want? If their prosthesis is too short, it's going to come off the ground a little too quickly. Do we agree? Yes. yes what ma rock? They're not going to be able to engage some of the rockers of their feet, of their prosthetic foot, if it's too short. So as they get ready to put weight down on their sound limb, their prosthetic limb, if it's too short, is already coming off the ground, which means they're not engaging their forefoot rocker and their toe rocker. If they can't engage the rockers of their feet, we're likely not going to see 30 to 35 degrees of flexion at pre-swing because they, they're not using their toe rocker. If they don't use their toe rocker, we're not gonna see the degrees of knee flexion we wanna see. If their leg is too short, they're not gonna be able to spend enough time on it to engage their toe rocker. So a colleague of mine um, did a study about, oh, probably five years ago, four or five, six, five or six years ago. And all of the subjects he looked at, over 50% of them had a prosthetic limb that was too short. One of the things that happens a lot, or at least I, I don't see it happening nearly as much as I used to, is a patient will come into your office and say, you know, Rich, my toe is dragging on swing being that you want to do everything you can to help your patient to have um, a, a toe that doesn't drag during swing, one of the first things prosthetists will do is shorten the limb. You shorten the limb, it's not gonna drag during swing, right? So you've solved one problem, but you've created another. Now they also can't use their toe rocker because the leg is too short. So you've created a gait deviation and now you've made it so they can't use the toe rocker, so now they're taking an even shorter step on their sound limb. They're not hitting their toe during swing anymore, but now they've got a brand new gait deviation. So as a PT coming from the Bob Gailey world of gait training and, and learning from all the researchers and people that I've learned from in the field, you absolutely, almost 100% of the time want to make both of their legs the same length. There's not a whole lot of reason to make the prosthetic limb shorter or longer. Occasionally, 
if there's a scoliosis or something else you have to worry about, maybe that's a reason. But for the most part, we want equal prosthetic and sound limb length, no question, because you're going to introduce gait deviations otherwise. Now there will be exceptions, but I'm an idealist. And that's what I have to teach you. You'll learn the exceptions later. So does everybody understand that? If the leg is too short, why we potentially wouldn't see enough knee flexion because you're not able to use that toe rocker? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's mainly because the lever arm isn't long enough to engage the. Yeah, the, the leg is, is too short. It can't stay on the ground. It doesn't have the length to stay on the ground. So you're not able to engage that rocker. And we can't go into plantar flexion. Do you remember what normal ankle plantar flexion was at pre-swing? Come on, you guys got it right on the test. 15 degrees, 15 degrees? 15 degrees. No. Prosthetic feet don't go into 15 degrees of plantar flexion. Maybe, not. maybe the biome does, Hugh her, her foot, but I don't, I don't see that enough to know. So, you can't get 15 degrees of plantar flexion in a prosthetic foot. So you've got to rely on the length of the, the prosthetic limb to be able to keep that foot on the ground to use the toe rocker. And then you've got to train the person to feel confident enough to balance over their prosthetic toe. That's another one. And that's where, again, I come into play here. Being able to train them to make sure they feel confident enough to balance over their prosthetic toe. But if the leg's too short, I can try all I want and that toe's not gonna stay down. So we'll move on to the next prosthetic cause. Too much flexion resistance at the knee. So if we have somebody in a transfemoral amputee in a prosthetic knee, if the knee's built, if it's got too much resistance to flexion um, and we need to back off the flexion because it's not bending enough, then that might be some one of the reasons that you wouldn't see um, enough knee flexion at pre-swing. Um, a short prosthetic foot keel or short prosthetic foot plate. So again, like with the sash foot, there's no toe rocker to roll over. The keel is too short. Or if they're not in the right foot size, okay? If the foot plate's too short, then we can't use the toe rocker as well. So those might be some other prosthetic causes for seeing insufficient knee flexion. So a lot of these, again, that's why I went over prosthetic feet. When the foot hits the ground, everything can change. So it really is important to know what's going on at the foot because it's gonna run up the kinetic chain. You're gonna see a deviation at the knee because of what's potentially going on at the foot. Um, so again, the amputee should maintain toe load and utilize the toe rocker, which is gonna allow for better, better balance of the prosthetic foot. And this is my job as a PT to teach them how to do that. Okay, now we're gonna move into initial swing. So we're into swing limb advancement now, right here. Foot is off the ground. We are now ready to go into swing. What should we see for knee flexion at this point in normal gait? We should see 60 degrees of knee flexion. That's what we should see during amputee gait as well. So, you know, 50 to 60 degrees of flexion, you're gonna give it to them. Anything less than that, I again, am gonna to start to take a look at what's going on at the pelvis. And, and look at what's going on for toe load. Are they rolling over the prosthetic toe? Are they getting forward rotation in the pelvis in the transverse plane? If they do not get 60 degrees of knee flexion, 50 to 60 degrees, you are going to see a deviation and it's gonna be one of these two. It's gonna be vaulting, contralateral vaulting over the sound limb or what I'm calling circumduction swinging that leg out into abduction during swing. They've got to get that foot forward somehow without tripping. If they don't have enough knee flexion, they're going to deviate by vaulting or swinging that limb out into circumduction, too much abduction. And probably this is where you're also going to see that pelvic hike. Because remember, circumduction it isn't a Jacqueline Perry term. It's a combination of thigh abduction and pelvic hike. They gotta get that leg through somehow without tripping. And these are common deviations. The reason you see them likely is there's not enough knee flexion happening. 
All right. So there's some videos here on insufficient knee flexion. So you watch this man walk. Now, does he look like he's getting 30 to 40 at pre-swing and 60 at initial swing? Let me start him back over here again at the beginning. 30 to 40 at pre-swing and 60 no. at initial swing. What do you think? Nah. Nah, pretty easy to see. Okay. I think this guy's probably going to be a pretty good walker. He's not a patient of mine. It's probably his first day in the parallel bars and I'm just ripping on him. But he does not have 30 to 40 degrees at pre-swing and 60 degrees at initial swing. Look how big his prosthetic step length is. Look how short his sound limb step length is. He is not getting into terminal stance. His hip is not going into hip extension. He's not engaging the forefoot or the toe rocker, okay? And from this angle, it's a little harder to see, but when he goes back, oh, um, I want you to take a look at his step lengths. He's taking a really big prosthetic step length in a pretty short sound limb step. He's not able to get into hip extension and engage those foot rockers to get a nice sound limb step. So here we go. Which one's he gonna start with? I don't remember. Uh, okay, so big prosthetic step, short sound. Big prosthetic, short sound. Big prosthetic, short sound. Do you see that? He's not rolling over the prosthetic toe. And again, he likely hasn't been trained on how to do that just yet. But I will tell you as a prosthetist, you're gonna see these folks in your bars every day. And so that is something you wanna be watching for. Get them to some good gait training so they can rely on that prosthetic foot and take a nice long step with their good leg. So he does not have transverse rotation forward on his prosthetic side. So I'm gonna take it back to the beginning. As he comes forward, can you see how he keeps his hip totally back here on this side? He does not progress it forward at all. This is a harder deviation to see, and I've done it a lot and I've done it for many years, but he does not allow that pelvis to rotate forward in the transverse plane. So that's one of the things that we try to work on with folks is to work on that transverse pelvic rotation. That's one of the reasons we are not seeing enough knee flexion in his prosthetic knee. He keeps that pelvis back. So right here, he should be coming forward and he's not. His pelvis is staying straight behind him. Okay, so that's one reason we're not seeing enough knee flexion. Um, probably because he hasn't been trained or maybe it's a habit. So he does not, um, so um, again, one of the reasons we won't see enough knee flexion is they don't have enough toe load from the previous um, pre-swing phase. They didn't get 30 to 40. That means they're not probably gonna get 60. So their inability to utilize that entire prosthetic foot to balance over the prosthesis, to engage the toe rockers. Again, another reason is the prosthesis was too short. I think I dwelled on that quite a bit in the last one. Another reason in transfemoral amputees is the knee axis could be too posterior to the weight line. So the knee is set very safely. Okay, this knee is set into extension. So I mentioned this when we talked about this earlier on one of our slides. If the knee is set so that we've got an extension moment at the knee to keep the person safe, which happens a lot when they're first learning, then we're not gonna see enough knee flexion during pre-swing and during initial swing. That's just something that's accepted. Hopefully as they get stronger, we can start to move that knee axis forward and start to get more normal knee flexion during pre-swing and initial swing. But if we have a knee extension moment at that knee for patient safety, we're gonna see decreased knee flexion during initial swing. Does that make sense? In, in, uh, in reference to, I guess, one of the slides that I was asking you about right before we went, went for lunch, so, the picture had to do with, um, well, the one that was exclusive to knee axis being too posterior mm -hmm. to the weight line, it was the shorter residual limb. So like, not that those two have to be exclusive to just each other. Like obviously there could just, you know, there, there could just be that the knee axis on the socket is too posterior to the weight line in general. But like, this is, um, yeah, it's typically just like an adjustment sort of fix, really, by like a, a good practitioner. 
Yeah, I mean, if the patient, if if everybody feels the patient is safe enough to to be allowed to have um, the knee axis closer to the ground reaction force line and not have it um, so that there's that much of an extension moment, yes, the mm -hmm. prosthetist would be the one to adjust and bring that knee axis a little more forward to allow for more knee flexion. Right. So it, and is that to, is that also going to promote like promote more forward transverse pelvic tilt as well, or maybe not so much? Yeah, it certainly could contribute to it. I mean, I'm going to train transverse pelvic rotation no matter where the knee axis is, because I want that eventually to be able to be used by my patient. But certainly, um, I think they could play hand in hand with each other. Good deal. So some additional gait, devi gait deviations that we see during the swing limb advancement, um, these again can be common. We see something called a medial whip. So you can see how she's got X, um, she's got the, the left prosthetic heel, how it swings medially as she's walking. Does everybody see that? She almost bangs heels together at one point. And she loses balance because of it. Do you see how that left prosthetic foot comes inward during swing. That is a medial whip. It is almost always due to a prosthetist or a prosthetic issue. Um, excessive external rotation of the prosthetic knee. So the prosthetic knee has been externally rotated um, or improperly aligned. So now the foot is swinging inward during swing. But person causes could be that maybe she put the leg on um, in some external rotation um, when she donned her leg. Uh, maybe there's weak hip internal rotators. So the external rotators have taken over and, the, and that leg is externally rotated some. Maybe uh, there's been some poor training, but usually, almost always, this is a prosthetic issue. And it just takes the prosthetist, that's her prosthetist standing right there and I was yelling at him. I'm like, why does she have a medial whip? So he basically took out his Allen wrench and fixed it. So it's a pretty easy fix for the most part. It's a rotation of the prosthetic knee for the most part. The next one is gonna be a lateral whip. Again, this guy had a terrific prosthetist. I think his knee ac um, actually had come loose a little bit. Can you see how the lateral, how on swing, his left heel laterally swings out to the side? Now, um, Dr. Clemens, is this always a bad thing? Um, like, could these be just like, a, like, uh, I guess, abnormal adjustments to the patient's gait if they had like severity of some other sort of, I don't know, like compensation for something? Like, could there could the practitioner do this on purpose, sort of thing? Like, kind of want these whips in certain cases? In my opinion, no. I don't see why you would want any sort of deviation during swing. Yeah, um, I just, one of the first guys I sort of shadowed under, he was, I, I think he was just more old fashioned, but he did some really off the book stuff, I think. There's no reason to have a lateral or medial whip. Now, if you want to offset the foot in stance to make the person more stable, the, the leg isn't functioning yeah. in stance really, or in swing really. So no, there's no reason to have this beyond the fact, unless you want your patient to expend more energy while they walk, then I would do it, but that's not a good reason. You want people to save energy while they walk. Yes, Alex, I see your hand. Um, so this differs from circumduction. Yes. By it being, because I'm noticing it's just like the prosthetic foot, like his, his hip doesn't like look like it's going out laterally. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so if we look, yeah, I mean, and this probably isn't the greatest, but we can see his his leg is in pretty good alignment. He's in, you know, decent alignment here. It's not out to the side in abduction. It's almost in adduction, which is what we want to see during normal gait. But look where his shank is. Look where his, where his prosthetic leg is. Um, so yes, this is strictly related. This is not related in in any way to too much circumduction or hip abduction. This is from the knee down that we end up seeing this. So if we, let me see if I can get it going again. 
So he's got that swing out to the side. We were actually both making fun of his prosthetist without his prosthetist being in the room at the same time. His prosthetist is wonderful. I don't, I, I honestly think this man used to travel around the world for business. And I think he tweaked it at the airport or something happened. And uh, he came to therapy and I'm like, what's going on? And so we had to send him back and get his leg readjusted a little bit. But this could again be caused by the patient putting the leg on in too much internal rotation. Um, we only see whips. Technically, we, we do. We only see whips with transfemoral amputees. You're not going to see this in a transtibial amputee. This is a transfemoral gait deviation. Um, maybe he's got weak hip external rotators, so the internal rotators have kind of taken over. But most of the time, again, this is a prosthetic issue, and it's an easy fix. And it usually comes out of the blue because somebody knocked something loose. Um, or maybe you've got an old school prosthetist that for some reason thinks that it's a good idea. That I, the way he explained it to me was it was doing it was to mac at the time he was telling me it's all he could do to maximize the stability of the patient because they just didn't have any other way to really like um to like get their knee i guess given the component they had like or the knee component itself wasn't really um like i guess abducting very well and they were getting it hung up a lot like during initial swing and so he's like, well, if we, if I can for tighten the spring and make it just go crazy outward, you know, and it'll just whip outward, then they'll be able to somewhat walk. And, but this was also a guy who I, I mean, he was much, much older. He was the first guy, first guy in a hanger clinic I was ever shadowing. And so I, I don't know, it wasn't great that I had that yeah, experience. I, but. I can see his reasoning on doing this. He probably wasn't getting 30 to 40 at pre-swing and 60 at initial swing. So this was his way of getting the patient to not trip during swing. Right, exactly. He said the purpose of this is not only the docs, but it, it makes the patient get their foot off the ground because yes. he just had a crazy Versus, spring on. It would just throw their their right. their. And my guess is the patient probably had already been shortened on that side because that was probably his first idea. And he probably never sent the person to PT to get properly trained. Right, so yeah, no way. See yeah, I can see why he probably did it. Please don't do that, you guys. <laughs> please, please don't do that that's, to your patients. That's why, that's why I have Alex to uh, help me out. <laughs> All right, uh, vaulting you've seen before. I'll, I'm gonna give you guys a break here in a few minutes. Um, so vaulting, I think I showed you with pathological gait. This is just another video of vaulting. Um, prosthetic causes, um, the prosthetic is too long. Maybe it's because the prosthesis did not have enough knee flexion. So this is, again, contralateral vaulting. They're vaulting on the good leg to be able to swing the prosthetic leg through. For some reason, the prosthetic leg is too long, possibly due to the fact that they aren't bending it. You can tell this guy's not getting 60 degrees of flexion, right? So what's he got to do? He's got to vault to get that leg forward or circumduct. He's kind of doing both. All right. So not enough knee flexion will cause this. So again, there's different reasons for not enough knee flexion. They haven't been trained. They're not transversely rotating their pelvis. There's too much friction built into the knee joint. Maybe the uh, knee axis is aligned to posterior of the ground reaction force vector, and that's causing the knee to stay in too much extension. Um, maybe they have some inadequate suspension. They're not feeling safe in swinging the leg forward and getting knee flexion. Um, we talked about it being aligned a little bit too stable. If it's behind, if the knee axis is behind the ground reaction force line, it's gonna stay in extension too much. Um, and that's gonna cause the leg to be longer and they're gonna have to vault to get it through or they're gonna trip because they don't have enough knee flexion. So again, I see this one a lot and this is a big cause habit. People were just never trained on how to use their prosthetic limb. And so for years they've been vaulting and so they continue. And this is a hard one to break in people. It is a tough habit to break, even in good walkers. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, is it from like a PT perspective, would you rather just try to work on their knee flexion or would it just, I mean, I wouldn't know, but like by shortening the pylon, would that not just simply fix it? Or is that just a whole new sort of animal as far as a new gait? No. Because the pylon probably isn't too long. Again, we want their legs to be equal length. And so as a PT, I, I simply want to learn, I simply want to work on getting them to improve their knee flexion so that they're able to bring it through 
And But meanwhile, as they're bringing it through, I want to train them to keep their sound foot heel on the ground and to not come up over it. And that's the hard part. I've been able to successfully train people to get enough knee flexion, but they still want to lift their heel off the ground. It's just a really hard habit to break once it's kind of ingrained into the motor planning of the body. But I've broken it on people, on congenital amputees who now were in their 40s. It takes a long time and it takes a lot of practice and it really takes on their part wanting to wanting to do it. Um, shortening the pylon won't make a difference. All right, so what was my next deviation? So circumductive gait, I'll give you guys a break after this one because it kind of still plays into that same, um, same thing. So again, they're doing this because they're not getting enough knee flexion on swing. They're not able to bring the limb forward. The limb is too long because it isn't flexing. So if they bring it forward without it flexing, they're gonna drag it. They can't do that. They swing it out to the side instead. So again, circumduction is a combination of pelvic height and thigh abduction or hip abduction, all right, during swing, only during swing. Um, so again, too much prosthetic knee friction, meaning that the knee isn't gonna flex very easy. Um, excess foot plantar flexion. So again, if there's too much plantar flexion at the foot, we're gonna see too much extension at the knee. It's not gonna bend as easy. They're gonna circumduct it out to the side. Um, these are some of the patient causes, abduction contracture, I guess. I don't ever really see this one, but it's on here. I think I put it there for a reason, probably because of a PT board exam reason. Usually it's poor training. Maybe they have weak hip flexors. They can't bring the leg straight through. So instead they circumduct it. Again, they need to work on strengthening. Pain again can be an issue. Maybe they've got an adductor roll. Maybe the uh, superior brim of the socket is pressing on their pubic ramus a little too much, so they swing it out to the side instead of bringing it forward. Um, if they have any sort of difficulty initiating prosthetic knee flexion, and that could be a multitude of causes, too much knee resistance at the prosthetic knee, they're unable to roll over the prosthetic toe. So anything that's gonna cause decreased knee flexion is gonna result in either circumducted gait or, hip, or uh, contralateral vaulting. If they can't swing it through with enough knee flexion, they're gonna to have to get it through somehow, and it's usually with a gait deviation that they do it. All right, I don't know what the next slide is. All right, let's go ahead and take a break for 10 minutes, and we'll push through the rest of these and start in for the weekend. So um, come back at 2.25, and we'll continue on, okay? All right. Sounds um, good. Could yeah. Could you, um Leave it on the last slide, please. Yes. Yep. The one back right here. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Do you need the video going or no? No, I'm okay. I just want to copy it out. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, it's 225. I feel like I'm calling my teenage sons like I do in the morning to get them out of bed. Okay, we talked about this slide already. Oh, change of scenery. Yeah, we've uh, changed up the room a bit. <laughs> I was slousing in the couch. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do our last push through, get through as much of the material as we can. I am not hopeful that we're gonna get, get through everything, so we'll figure it out toward the end what, uh, what uh, you guys will be responsible for. All right, so we're talking about swing limb advancement now. Um, Again, these are gonna be the normal uh, range of motions that we tend to expect to see. Same thing as we see with normal gait. Um, here though, and we didn't talk about prosthetic componentry, but here during swing limb advancement, especially with our transfemoral amputees, is it's really important that we know what type of knee componentry you put on them. I've shown a mock, a mock knee here, which is a hydraulic knee, single axis, um, but these, uh, knees are designed to help with the progression of the um, of the shank, for a better word, during swing phase. And so there's a lot of different componentry built into the prosthetic knee to help with um, how quickly the shank will swing forward during swing phases of gait. And so some of the reasons that we see certain deviations might be due to the fact that some of the componentry needs to be adjusted by the prosthetist. Maybe, like I said, the friction on swing is too 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 high, and so that might prevent cert that might cause certain deviations. And again, we didn't talk a lot about componentry, so if you have questions, let me know. Um, during terminal swing, um, again, normally what we want to see is that five degrees of forward rotation. We've got some flexion at the hip probably not 35, probably closer to 20 or 25. Um, typically, typically the prosthetic step does tend to be a little longer because people are able to balance over their sound limb and reach their prosthetic limb out. They're confident balancing over their sound limb. They're not confident balancing over the toe of their prosthetic limb. So normally we see, I shouldn't say normally, a lot of times we will see that the prosthetic length step length is longer than the sound limb step length. Not always, but a lot of times we will see that. So I don't know if you can hear his foot coming down on the treadmill. So terminal impact, oh no, I can't find my cursor. usually results in a hard foot strike at initial contact. So terminal impact is when the prosthetic knee and the, the entire uh, uh, below, the entire prosthetic below the knee swings hard into extension. So they get sort of a thunk at terminal swing. The leg is in full extension out in front of them before it comes down to the ground. This is a way that a lot of people will guarantee to themselves that their knee is straight before they put that foot down on the ground. It gives them some proprioceptive feedback. In their mind, they're like, okay, I felt it jerk into extension. Now I can put my foot down on the ground and step on it. So usually you'll hear that hard heel strike. Now this patient of mine, it's probably one of the most challenging patients I've ever had. Um, he was so fun to work with. I had him for a really long time. He was a polytrauma patient. He was 24 when he got into his car accident. Um, at the scene, his leg auto amputated. He broke his pelvis. He broke his left leg, shattered it, had a stroke, and had a massive head injury. Um, he was in a coma for three months. Oh, and he's blind. Um, he was in a coma for three months before I saw him. We couldn't even get him out of his wheelchair. Um, so he ended up joining a gym. And now this is this is several years ago. It's about five years ago now. Now he lives on his own, um, sort of in a, a 
I, I'm trying to think of a better term for it, not a halfway house, but he has some assistance within the community that he lives in, but uh, got a job, works, gets around using his prosthesis. So it just takes a really long time for some of these folks to rehab. But um, he loved working out on the treadmill and getting back to all that stuff. But uh, we had a lot of gait deviations with him and a lot of other issues besides head injury, uh, vestibular issues, blindness, and fractures. But um, again, we might see this because they wanna ensure that their prosthetic knee is out in front of them when they're walking. And then also prosthetic causes could be there's insufficient knee friction. So maybe that leg is swinging forward into extension too fast. And I have to send them back to the prosthetist and say, hey, we need to add some friction to this leg. It's, it's swinging into terminal extension too fast. Um, or some knees have a knee extension aid. And if that is too engaged, we need to back that off. Um, we don't want that knee going into extension too quickly, but this is something you will see. Forward trunk flexion, this can be exhibited throughout the gait cycle, not unusual. I showed you this picture before. Um, prosthetic causes could be too much plantar flexion, which is gonna cause hyperextension at the knee, which tends to make the person throw their trunk forward. We also see forward uh, trunk flexion when there's too much plant dorsiflexion at the foot. So forward trunk flexion can be um, related to both of those deviations. Um, so again, if there's too much flexion in the socket, uh, that's gonna cause knee flexion, which is gonna cause hip flexion, which is gonna cause trunk flexion. Um, if there's too much extension at the socket, um, we're going to see that uh, they're going to flex forward to keep their balance. So this is just a really common deviation that you see throughout the gait cycle. Um, if the prosthetic knee is too unstable, so they're a transfemoral amputee, again, if it's set to, its, to where the person is afraid it's gonna buckle, they're gonna throw their trunk forward to drive that knee behind the ground reaction force line. So that trunk flexion could be to help them stabilize that prosthetic knee. Same thing we see in people that have two legs who have weak quadriceps. Um, they try to flex their trunk forward to drive the knee behind the ground reaction force line to get that extension moment at the knee. Um, so trunk flexion will do that for them. Again, patient causes might be a hip flexion contracture, which is pretty common in our patients. Um, weak hip extensors, so they're not able to hold themselves stably when they are upright. Um, maybe they have pain over the ischium and weight bearing. A lot of these sockets will ride right up into the ischial tuberosity. If that's painful and they're getting goosed up in the ischial tuberosity, they're not gonna wanna straighten up. They're gonna actually lean forward a little bit. Now, we didn't talk much about uh, socket design, so I'm not gonna worry about that, but just for you to know. And then use of an assistive device. So using a walker, using crutches, they're gonna be forward flexed at the trunk. Okay, so now we've talked about a lot of deviations and one of the, you know, the more common deviations that you're gonna see. Now we're gonna talk specifically about when we observe prosthetic gait. What are the specific things that we're looking for? Because we don't look for absolutely everything we make notes of things as we notice it but just like with our other gait analysis we take a look at um, certain things when we look at prosthetic gait before i do anything with my patients i assess their leg length i want to know if there is if the prosthetic limb is too short before i even start to look at their gait because that's going to explain some of their gait deviations and so I don't have a model in front of me now, but usually what I'll do um, is I have my patients stand in front of me and they're facing, I am behind them. I tend to do my uh, postural analysis from behind. I'm a PT, that's how we do it. I know a lot of prosthetists do it from the front, but I wanna be able to see their spine because that plays into what I'm looking at. If they've got a scoliosis, it's gonna show up somewhere. So I always do my postural analysis starting from, the, from behind the patient. So I'm usually sitting down in a chair or in a stool um, behind the patient so that my eyes are at about pelvis level. So the patient is standing in front of me, facing away from me. I'm right at their back. And so I also want them in this five to 10 centimeter base of support or two to four inches. We talked about this with normal gait. People need to have two to four inches between their feet. 
I think I talked to you about my one biker dude who said it was unmanly to have two to four inches between his feet. So I gave him a little more space. So people that are taller or obese, you're gonna give them a little more space, but you want that narrow base of support. That's what's normal. Do not check their posture and their alignment with their feet spread way apart. I don't care if that's where they're comfortable. Get them in the parallel bars. And so what I do is I put my foot right between their two feet and I say, move your feet next to mine. So I have a shoe on, my foot is between their right and left foot, and I have them move both of their feet right next to my feet so that I know that they have a two to four inch base, or two to four inch space between their feet. And I don't do anything until I do that. Then I make sure I've got my hands on their pelvis that they're not standing more over to one side than the other. So if they're balancing more on their good leg, I shift them over so that they're balancing evenly over both legs. So I've got my foot between their feet and their feet are right up against mine. And I make sure that I shift them over so that their center of mass right in the center of their pelvis here. So their center of mass right here is if I dropped a plumb line, that center of mass line would drop straight down between their feet. Do not let them be shifted more over to one side or the other. There, it's gonna throw off your a posture assessment. So center of mass should be between the feet. Feet should be two to four inches apart. My hands go on top of their iliac crest and I take a look. Do the iliac crest look level? Is one side shorter than the other? If it is, I take note how much shorter one side is than the other. Is there a rotation? If there's rotation, I unrotate them in both the trunk and the pelvis. I try to get them as straight in the frontal plane as possible when I do their postural alignment. I will tell you that I've worked with prosthetists and, sh and worked with them and sh they've come to my therapy sessions to see how I do this. And they've told me, you change how I practice because they didn't learn this in school. They didn't learn to let the patient, not let the patient have a foot and a half between their feet before they assess their alignment. So you need to have these people in as normal of a standing posture as you can before you go into their postural assessment. So once I've taken a look and I make sure their iliac crests are level, I also check their PSISs. I put my thumbs right in the back of them and I make sure their PSISs are level. And then a lot of times I'll go around to the front and I will also check the ASIS. Now we don't get into any of this class, but there are different pelvic asymmetries that can happen um, with pathology that I treat as a physical therapist, but it doesn't necessarily always play into my, into my prosthetic practice. Um, but I wanna make sure those iliac crests are level and their PSISs are level and their feet are two to four inches apart. If I bring their feet two to four inches apart and I realize, and I, and, and I, and I, and I look at their iliac crests and they're nice and level, but then I look down at their knees and their good knee is flexed to 20 degrees, what does that tell me? If I've got even iliac crests and my good knee is flexed to 20 degrees. One limb is longer than the other. The prosthetic is too short. The prosthetic is too short. So when you are assessing posture, make sure their knees are in full extension. If they are not in full extension and the sound knee is bent, it means the prosthetic limb is too short. So what I keep in my, what I always had in my practice or in the hospitals that I worked at were those, and I can't remember the official name for them. They're little foam pads and they come in a quarter inch or a third of inch, a half inch. And I would take one of those foam pads and I would stick it underneath their prosthetic limb. So if I thought the prosthetic limb was a quarter inch too short, I'd, buy, I'd, I'd grab a quarter inch pad, I'd stick it under their prosthetic foot and I'd say, straighten out your knees and I'd redo my posture assessment. And then I would realize that yes, I have nice iliac crest level, good and level, knees are straight, but I have a quarter inch pad under their prosthetic foot, which means I'm calling the prosthetist if I have a good relationship with them and I'm telling them their prosthetic is a quarter inch too short. That's if they've got enough sock ply on and I don't just call the prosthetist and mouth off. I make sure that I've checked all my other boxes, okay? But I have, relationships with my prosthetists that they're like, okay, send them in, we're gonna, we'll, we'll go ahead and add some. 
and I will, you know, work with my prosthetist to make sure, but that is how I confirm whether or not I've got equal leg lengths. And then from there, I can go on to assess gait. But first I have to know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at to see if my leg lengths are level. And again, here's that study that Dr. Grenard did, oh, it was back in 2011. 57% of the subjects he looked at had a prosthesis that was too short. Now, again, this was a while ago. I think that it's gotten better. Lately, when I've been working with subjects um, in studies and working with people in, for teaching, I have, I have not been finding that people's prostheses are too short, which is good. But again, I'm also assessing for a scoliosis. I've had a handful of patients or more that are in their 50s and 60s that have significant scoliosis of their spine that never really knew it. Um, obviously, it's not enough for them to have caused um, too much pain or to, to cause um, issues throughout their lifetime, but certainly you're going to end up finding this. And if they've got a scoliosis that's somewhat significant, your iliac crest levels are going to be off. So you have to take that into consideration as well when you go to assess limb length on these folks. So any questions on postural assessment and when it should be done? Nope, okay. All right. All right, so just a refresher again as to what we're looking for when we look at, um, uh, at gait and when we're looking at this, this, these are spatial measures. So these are the ones that are gonna give us distance. Stride length is heel strike or initial contact to initial contact. Step length is initial contact of one foot to initial contact of the other. Step width is the distance between the two heels. Now here in prosthetic gait, we're calling it the distance between the medial border of both feet. I want that to be two to four inches. That's where my foot goes in between these two feet when they're in standing. So two to four inches between the medial border of their foot is what I'm looking for. Um, additionally, this type of step length is very hard to visualize with the naked eye. So looking from heel strike to heel strike can be hard to see. And so what we've done or what we do when we, um, when we teach prosthetic gait analysis and we look, it's much easier to see the distance between the trailing toes and the leading heel. So we take a look at this distance right here. Trailing toes to leading heel, and we want that distance to be at least 12 inches long, okay? It's probably gonna be longer, but we also want that distance to be equal side to side. So if they have 24 inch step length on one side, we also want 24 inches on the other. Otherwise, we know there's something going on with their gait pattern. Um, so when I was having you watch the gentleman in the parallel bars earlier, I just realized that I hadn't taught you this yet. So for me, it's natural to just look between the trailing toes and the leading heel. Um, it's much easier to see this floor space than it is to look here at all of this. And so we want that to be at least 12 inches. If it's not, and it's not equal, then we've got something going on with, with gait. So as long as their step length from the toe to the prosthetic heel, as long as that's greater than 12 and consistent throughout, we leave it alone, we don't even do anything with it? Correct, yeah, as, if it's an equal 12 inch step length, it, you know, that's what's normal for them. Mm -hmm. If okay. it's 12 inches, if it's 12 inches on one side and 20 inches on the other side, mm -hmm. then, then we want to look at something. We want both of them to be 20 inches. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is what we've taught is the minimum is 12 inches. That's not average. Average is much longer. But it's kind of I been... What, I know what you meant being the minimum. I just wanted to make sure, like... If you wanted it, you want to have it closer to the 12, or no, it doesn't matter as long as they're it's even. Minimum. A minimum of 12 inches. Okay. Yeah. Normal is, I think, for men, gosh, I want to say it's upwards of 24 or 30 is normal. And again, that depends on leg length. So if I see 12 inches bilaterally and it's somebody young and active, I wonder why they're taking such short step lengths, but we don't see it too much. You might see 12 inches bilateral in somebody who's a little elderly, maybe um, isn't as confident. But if it's bilateral and it's at least 12 inches, that's what it is. So when we go to watch somebody walk 
wearing their prosthetic limb. Um, the essential observations that we're gonna look for in the frontal plane, so me standing behind them, remember back to our first lecture, when we look at gait in people, we wanna take as many views from a many as many different planes as we can. We wanna be in front, we wanna be in back, we wanna be on one side, we wanna be on the other side. There's gonna be deviations in all the planes. Um, so in the frontal plane, the first thing we really look at is, do they have that two to four inches between their feet? Is it too wide? Is it more like 12 inches? Okay, and these are things that we note either mentally or on a piece of paper when we're doing gait observation with somebody with an amputation. Uh, is their sound foot at midline? Do have they brought that good foot and externally rotated it and brought it underneath their midline, underneath the gluteal cleft? They may have two to four inches, which is good, but they also may have a sound foot that's midline, which usually means that the prosthetic foot is a little bit too abducted over to the side. This is not uncommon. I, locked, I recently helped out with a study where we watched a lot of very high level walkers. Many of them had nice narrow bases of support. Many of them had their sound foot at midline. Is their step length now in the sagittal plane? Is their step length at least 12 inches bilaterally? Okay, if it isn't, if they have a shorter sound limb step than their prosthetic limb step, this could be because they're not balancing over that prosthetic toe, all right? If they're not balancing over that toe rocker of their trailing prosthetic limb, they're not gonna be able to take a nice long step on their sound limb. It's gonna shorten that sound limb step length, and that's pretty common. So hopefully they're in PT or they're gonna go to PT to learn how to balance and feel confident in bringing their center of mass over that prosthetic foot and using those prosthetic toe rockers and forefoot rockers. Additionally, in the sagittal plane, how much prosthetic knee flexion do they have at pre-swing, at initial swing, at loading response? Those are the three big phases where we can really take a look at knee flexion. At loading response, we should have 15 to 20. Again, if they've got a prosthetic knee, we might not see that. But if they're a transtibial and they have their anatomic knee, we should see it. Are they getting 30 to 40 degrees at pre-swing? Are they getting 50 to 60 degrees at initial swing? Easy to see in the sagittal plane. And the more that you look at gait, the more you're going to be able to tell um, what 50 degrees looks like. And again, on your phone, you can get different apps where if you can videotape them, you can take a look and kind of draw a line, pause the video, draw a line, and it gives you what angle you've drawn. So if you're pretty good about lining up your lines on the phone, um, it'll give you what angle it is. And it's a nice nice application to have. Um, some of those uh, uh, dart fish, I think, is one, and then the huddle technique was the other. But you can Google different ones to use. So if they don't have enough prosthetic knee flexion, take a look at their pelvic rotation in the transverse plane. Are they getting forward pelvic rotation in the transverse plane? If they are not initiating forward transverse pelvic rotation, it's probably gonna be reflected in decreased knee flexion. Are they able to, to load their prosthetic toe, balance over their prosthetic toe? If they're not using their forefoot and toe rockers, they're probably not getting enough knee flexion in pre-swing and an initial swing. Then we're gonna go back to the frontal plane or you can assess this in the frontal plane when you're first there assessing um, some of the other deviations. Is there a pelvic drop? Do we see contralateral pelvic drop on the sound limb side? So they're balancing in stance on their prosthetic limb. Is the sound limb side pelvis dropping? Again, this could be due to not only uh, muscle weakness in the AV ductors, but it could be due to that lack of bony lever arm. It could be due to decreased proprioception. It could be due to poor prosthetic fit. It could be due to the, uh, the amount that they can uh, uh, contract their muscles, how quickly they can contract. And again, if they've got that pelvic drop, that contralateral pelvic drop, 
they are also likely going to have that trunk lean over the prosthesis. So that pelvis is going to drop and they're going to throw their prosthesis or their trunk over their prosthetic limb to counterbalance that drop. Remember the video of the lady in the yellow shirt, my, my gym teacher lady. She had that pelvic drop and her trunk went over to the side. And then we also wanna take a look in the frontal plane at trunk rotation. Actually, I guess this is transverse plane, but we view it from the frontal plane. Are they rotating forward or backward more on one side than on the other? So if you remember back to the pathological gait lecture, I actually showed you one of my former amputee patients and she had a lot of rotation backward over her right side, which was actually her sound limb side. It wasn't her amputated side. But taking a look, they should have even rotation in the trunk bilaterally. If they don't, there's different things that we can do in therapy to encourage that. And so all of these deviations, I can help fix in therapy. You guys aren't gonna learn how we fix them um, just because we didn't have lab today. Uh, the other prosthetic students that I've had in class before, we, I go through all the fixes for these things because you are gonna have your hands on these patients in your clinics. And I would love to be able to teach you some of the techniques that we use to help, to help fix some of these things. Um, it's just too hard. Um, it's hard to do virtually. Um, it's much easier to do in person. And so the hope is that later on this semester, possibly, or later on this summer, we can have a lab where we can actually get some hands-on practice of some of the techniques I use to fix these different deviations that we see. Because I'm not sure how much you guys get in prosthetic school on how to actually treat the deviations that you see. So when we start to look at somebody walking with the prosthetic limb, I like to start in the frontal plane usually because it's easier for me. But what do you think of his base of support? You think there's two to four inches between his feet? What's the vote? Does it look appropriate? Kind of, yeah. To me, it does. I think maybe yeah. I'm wrong. No, I think it. I think it looks pretty good. Anybody else have a vote? Uh, yeah. I, think I it thought it was good. a little bit of a wider step pattern. He might take a From little bit of a wider. Contact, it looks like it's a little wider. He might take a little bit wide, but it's not too bad. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a major yeah. issue that's noticeable, but it's enough and to certain, say more than four inches. Yeah, and certain steps look wider than others. And so when we grade a gate deviation, we tend to try to see something that's happening consistently. So if we see that it's just happening every few steps or things like that, there could be various reasons for it. Okay, so we've looked at step width. Now, other things that we can look at in the frontal plane before we move on. He has really um, good toe off with his prosthetic. You can't tell from this angle. Does he have a little bit of a lateral thrust on the, on the prosthetic side? So he does have maybe just a little bit of a left lean. Can you see how his head kind of goes over that way? A little bit of a trunk lean? Yeah. Not bad, not like the last lady we saw. But yeah, it's there. Do I see a little bit more of a drop on his contralateral side than on his prosthetic side when he walks in the pelvis? Uh, it looks to me like there's more of a lack of forward rotation on the prosthetic side. I can see that more than the drop. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can pause it here a like little a bit. Like a shorter step length. But yeah, I mean, you can you can see it. Uh... So it's not bad, and I caught him pretty good here. Now, we expect a little bit of a pelvic drop as he's coming down into initial contact on this side. Because remember, our center of mass is lowering toward the ground. He's probably around mid-swing right now. So I think he's got a little bit of a pelvic drop right here. You see how that's just... And again, we're looking at five degrees being normal. He's got a little bit of a drop. That's where I think we see a little bit of that left lean right here. It's definitely less, um, more subtle than the woman that we saw previously. But if I was to grade him, if I'm looking and I'm being picky, that's something I'm gonna pick on, okay? 
So there's a little bit of a pro a little bit of a contralateral pelvic drop. There's a little bit of a trunk lean here. Now, in talking about the rotations, I think they're a little easier to see from the sagittal plane. Same with the rolling over of the toe and the and the forefoot rocker. And so we're going to go to the uh, to the sagittal plane view at this point. So one of the things that I like to start to look at is what is his knee flexion? It's so easy for me to start with. What is his knee flexion at pre-swing and initial swing? Is he getting 30 to 40 at pre-swing? Is he getting 50 to 60 at initial swing? What do you think? Um, it's really kind of hard to tell because the video is pretty choppy. Oh, is it? Ah. Dream, but I mean, it yeah, it looks like, like he gets at least 40. Looked, yeah, it looks. But yeah, I was uh, at least getting 45 on the pull off. I'm not sure about the, the 60, though. Yeah, he's, I think he's doing good. And so I know I apologize. I didn't realize the video was. Have, have all my videos been choppy? Yeah. Yeah, ah. for the most part. But most of them are like, you know, you can tell. All right. What's going on? But this one like chops right at um, initial swing, a pre-swing kind of. So here he is at initial swing. He definitely has enough. If yeah. we're looking, oh darn it! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting frustrated at my drawing tool. Be behave. It's not behaving doesn't like me today no and all right so i caught him in a little bit so he's actually probably a little bit past initial swing right now um but if we take a look at this he's got plenty of knee flexion okay so again this is the line that we draw uh oh i'm losing my line here straight down we're looking at this angle right here He's definitely got a good 50 degrees of knee flexion. So he's right on with that. And this gets easier to view with the naked eye the more gait analysis you do. But that's why these like phone applications are nice because you can pause the video and then you can take your finger and you can draw and actually get a visual of what you can see. All right, let me get rid of my drawing there. Okay. Um, all right, so he's getting enough knee flexion. What about as he comes down into loading response? As he gets ready to put weight on that leg, what do you see with him? Um, not enough hip flexion, it looks like. Okay. Or I, I think probably still just what I was saying, the forward rotation of the pelvis, because his prosthetic step is shorter. It is. Now, if you watch him as he comes down into initial contact, he actually doesn't get to zero degrees of knee extension. Watch his prosthetic knee. It never fully extends, which is unusual with him. That's why he's getting that shorter prosthetic step length. He doesn't have full extension at that prosthetic knee. And yes, I agree that he's got some issues with the forward rotation of the pelvis. And so that might be something that I would work on as a PT. If we could get his pelvis to rotate forward a little bit more, maybe we could get full knee extension at initial contact and get that longer prosthetic step length. Um, would a heavy prosthesis affect the forward rotation? So the studies that have been done on prosthetic weight um, have determined that prosthetic weight really doesn't affect functioning. Um, okay. Yeah, and so as long as the prosthesis is aligned properly and the knee and whatever prosthetic components are set up appropriately, it actually enhances gait and actually functions as a little bit, making the leg feel a little lighter. Even though if you hold a prosthetic limb, you know how heavy they can be. They're not as heavy as an anatomical leg. Um, and convincing your patients of that is the fun part. But yeah, all the studies have shown that the weight of the, uh, the prosthesis does not make a difference. Okay, so we looked at knee, 
Um, we looked at the pelvis. I think that was a good observation that his pelvis is not coming forward in the transverse plane like we would hope that it would be. Um, I lost my cursor, there it is. Um, and so hip flexion looks pretty good. Hip extension doesn't look too bad. It does look like he's lacking a little bit of hip extension. I'm not convinced that he's rolling over his prosthetic toe <clears throat> as far as he could be. I think you could get a little bit more into hip extension. Um, but again, I am uh, I know this gentleman from conferences that I've been to, but I'm not sure exactly what his pelvic alignment is or what his uh, his prosthetic alignment is either. So, so that's if, sorry. yeah, go ahead. Um, so if he were to extend the hip more, then that would put the knee into more flexion or more extension and help him roll off the toe too. That's the idea. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It would also give him a longer uh, sound limb step length, but right now his step length is longer on the sound limb side anyway. Um, so again, you know, I said that a lot of times we see that the sound limb step is shorter. That's not with everybody. Um, but if they cannot balance over that prosthetic toe, um, we do tend to see that. Okay, and what about trunk rotation? We talked about that a little bit. Probably gonna be able to see that one a little bit easier in the in the first video. Do you see if one side rotates backward or forward more than the other in his shoulders, in his trunk rotation in the transverse plane? Left side comes forward more. I think that's what I see as well. And again, this gentleman's a pretty good, pretty high functioning walker. I think I took this video when we were out at an amputee coalition conference in Tucson. He was climbing the mountains out there. I ran into him one morning, like all the cactus and everything around. So pretty, a pretty high functioning guy. He lives in San Antonio, um, super active guy. If you ever go to an amputee coalition conference, you'll probably run into him. All right. So this is another gait observation. What do we think about with a base of support? wide it is wide now it might be due to a little valgus at the knee yeah yes so this is a case of a new amputee getting learning how to get balanced over prostheses so he is in bilateral satch feet and oh oh i was gonna say i thought i looped this video and Purposely, the feet are outset to give him a wider base of support while he learns to walk. This is my gentleman who had bilateral frostbite. Hmm. Lost his limbs. Remember how I showed you that picture the other day of frostbite? That weren't his feet, but that's why he lost his legs. Um, he lives in Detroit, and he refused an opportunity by a drug dealer to sell in his neighborhood. So they the drug dealer and his buddies came by and tied him up and left him outside in the winter mm. wow and he friend. lost yeah i don't think they were friends i think they were just inhabitants oh. of his neighborhood um, um oops i lost my video. it also looks like his prostheses are said to be shorter which i know is pretty common when trying to train bilateral amputees on walking the the prosthesis will make the legs like probably two inches shorter than he would normally be yeah it might be i can't because he does have a long trunk or it looks like he has a long trunk right now i can't yeah. remember if they made him closer to the ground or not especially in older guys and, and girls he's he's young this dude was he was i don't even know if he was 30. Yeah, he looks young. Yeah. By the time I moved from Michigan to Florida, oh, your guys' video is really choppy, isn't it? Darn it. He was climbing hills. Like, I mean, he was doing great with his prosthetic legs. Um, yes. But uh, one of those cases where, you know, unfortunate incidents for sure um, can end up making a, making a huge difference in, in, in somebody's life. All right. You're gonna go ahead and just move on here. So these are just a list of the exercises that I do go through. These are the ones that we would have went through if we were there in lab. We teach weight shifting. So the first thing I do is get them in the right posture, get them in the two to four inches 
I make sure that they've got a good trunk, good uh, no trunk rotations, no pelvic rotations and standing, and I'm gonna teach them to shift to their center of mass over the right foot, over the left foot. I'm gonna teach them to shift it over their toes. I'm gonna teach them to shift it backward over their heels. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm giving them a lot of feedback. I'm telling them to press down into their prosthesis, or I'm telling them to tighten their buttocks. Um, there's different verbal guidance that I give during these exercises, but learning to weight shift from side to side, first with both hands on the parallel bars, then with just one hand on the parallel bars, and if they're a unilateral amputee, the hand that stays on the parallel bars is the hand on the side of the prosthesis, always, because that forces them to put more weight on their prosthetic limb. Um, so then again, I teach them if they do fine with one hand on the parallel bars, then I have them practice with no hands on the parallel bars. Then we work on forward backward weight shift. I tell them shift your weight forward over your toes and I give them a visual. I tell them to imagine that there's a marble in the very center of their pelvis. And I usually use my hands to help them kind of visualize that or feel that. I say, if there's a marble in the very center of your pelvis, I said, visualize that. That's your center of balance. And I tell them to take that marble and I want you to shift that marble way to the outside of your right foot and way to the outside of your left foot. Then after they practice that exercise, I tell them, I want you to shift that marble in the middle of your pelvis. I want you to shift it over your toes. And then I wanna shift that marble back over your heels. So it gives them sort of a visual of where their center of balance is. Um, and that's a really good exercise to start with, especially if you can get them to do it no-handed in the parallel bars. It gets them pressing down into the prosthetic limb. I make sure they're not leaning their trunk over too much. Their whole body should be moving as one, over to the left, over to the right, moving forward, moving backward. I go on to give them some resistance at the pelvis if they get really good at it. Um, and then we progress to a stool stepping exercise where I have a stool in front of them, usually about nine inches high. I have them stand on their prosthetic limb. I have them, or I stand on both limbs. I have them tighten their glutes. So I tell them to squeeze their butt. I tell them to push down into their socket and I give them some input through their pelvis to push down into their socket. And I say, as you're pushing down into the socket and as you're squeezing your butt, I want you to slowly step up onto this stool with your good leg. So they have to balance on their prosthetic limb while holding onto the parallel bars. They've tightened their butt, they're pressing down into the socket and they're slowly stepping up onto the stool with their good leg. And then they slowly step down from the stool with their good leg. No stepping up with their prosthetic limb. We want them balancing on their prosthetic limb as they step with their good leg. That can be a very challenging exercise and I introduce it on day one in physical therapy. Most people look at me like I'm crazy. Um, most of the patients do, but they end up doing it. Um, but it's an exercise to really, really force them to put weight on the prosthetic limb while they slowly and controlled move their sound limb up to the stool and then back down. That is an exercise I like to send them home with and have them practice forever. I um, bet that also helps when you um, start like, performing like load response and more weight bearing parts of the gate on the prosthetic leg too, because they'll trust it more if you start them on like the trusting phase, I guess, of PT. And that's the, the thing. This exercise is, is, is designed to help them balance over the prosthetic limb during gait so that they can take a nice long step with their sound limb during swing. So these exercises, and again, I work on uh, training transverse pelvic rotation. These, this list of exercises right here, when I go over it in my continuing ed courses with patient models and with physical therapists, just going through this list of exercises takes a couple hours. So actually performing them with hands-on. Um, so hopefully it's something that we can do in person. There, I don't have any videos of me doing this. Um, if you look online, and I want to say it's it might be on YouTube or on OSER. O, OSER is the prosthetic company, O-S-S-U-R. It might be on their website. There are some videos of Bob Gailey doing some of these exercises with patients. 
Now he's changed his techniques over the years. Um, so th they may all not be there or they may be a little different than what he's doing now. Um, but I personally don't have videos of these mostly because they're a little bit proprietary on Bob's part. So I perform them in person or I would teach you guys in person, but I don't have video of them to show you. I can guide you though, to take a look for them online because I'm pretty sure that his videos are online somewhere under OSER gait training exercises or something like that. You'll be able to see some of these videos until we can hopefully practice in person one day. So again, I train transverse pelvic rotation, uh, which takes a lot of time. Um, I train trunk rotation, and I also start to train them how to balance over the prosthetic toe with walking. I put a gait belt around their hips, and I actually hold them back on to, into terminal stance over their prosthetic limb as they're walking. So it forces them to balance over their forefoot rocker and over their toe rocker of their prosthetic limb. Um, so just some neat exercises and there is ongoing research right now through some of my colleagues at Miami to show that some of these exercises that we do with our subjects are really, they do make a difference in their outcome measures. All right, on to outcome measures. We're gonna get in what we can in the next 50 minutes or so. All right, let me end my show here. Uh, all right. Okay, so use of outcome measures in prosthetics, certainly, like I said in before, in physical therapy, we've used them for a long time. Um, it was just good practice. It, it, you know, in my mind, if you don't know that what you're doing is helping, then why are you doing it? You gotta show that it's helping. I'd feel useless if I, if I didn't know that I was actually making a difference in somebody's function. And so that's why we do outcome measures. And I think they're really important in prosthetics and it's gonna come, become more important as you all move forward in your practices in the coming years. Like I said, at conferences, this is what we're talking about. At least this is what I'm presenting on a lot of times um, and many people, other people as well. So reasons to use outcome measures. Well, the big one is to be able to assist in determining and in justifying to the insurance companies why you've assigned a certain K level to a patient. If you wanna get reimbursed for K2 or K3 level componentry, you better have an outcome measure. It'd be a good idea for you to have an outcome measure to back that up. To help describe their functioning, outcome measures help you to, to tell what level your patient's functioning at. Um, to examine your effectiveness of treatment. So this is a big one for me. In PT, we do outcome measures every two to four weeks because we're seeing the patient two to three days a week. You all aren't seeing the patients that much. So my recommendation is usually making sure you perform the outcome measure at least once a month if you're seeing the patient on that type of basis. So do it when you first start them, first put them in their prosthetic or their orthotic. We're gonna talk about orthotic outcome measures here as well. Um, and then retest them again. Once you've made an adjustment or once you, you've had them go home and practice for a month, or maybe they've gone to therapy for a month. If they're doing outcome measures in therapy as well, then you can call the PT up and say, listen, have you been doing the AMP or the Berg on this patient? Can I have the results? So work with your PT because if they're in physical therapy, I can guarantee that PT is doing outcome measures with them. But this also helps to prescribe the appropriate interventions, especially when it comes to physical therapy interventions. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll get some of that research out on prosthetic interventions as well. As well. But outcome measures provide objective data about patient functioning. It isn't just you saying, hey, Mrs. Jones, do you think this prosthesis is improving your function? Or how much do you like this, this orthosis? Oh, I like it a lot. That's not an outcome measure. That's patient report. And you can put, you can take it with a grain of salt. So you've got to use validated, reliable outcome measures to back up your reasoning, especially when it comes to reimbursement. So there are two main types of outcome measures, self-report or patient report measures, where we actually give the outcome measure to the patient. It's usually paper-based or it can be on a computer or, or an iPad. And we have them report how they're feeling or, or their perspective on things. So this gives you a perceived um, perception of ability 
based on the patient's report. A performance-based outcome measure is going to directly assess how a patient performs. These two correlate moderately, meaning that how somebody reports they're doing moderately correlates with how they're actually doing in general when we look at the research. So somebody might tell you that they're really confident in their balance by a patient report measure, and then you actually put them through a balance test, and they probably are overconfident because they fail the balance test. So there is some correlation, but it's not a very strong correlation between the two types of measures. We use both of these in good practice. You should use both types of measures, both patient report and performance-based. There's also clinician report measures, and we'll talk specifically about one of them. I am um, I'm not as big of a fan of clinician report measures, because as a clinician, I think you might overrate how you think you're doing with the patient, and you might think your patient is doing better than they are because you're the one treating them. So I never use clinician report measures. I only use patient report or performance-based measures. So in this, this is a great article by Born Paul, and I think Matthew Major's on it out of Northwestern and out of the VA up in Chicago. Um, again, I didn't list in references. If you want any of these report or any of these manuscripts, I certainly can send you the citations for them. Um, but these, these guys did a, um, a study back in 2016 where they surveyed a lot of prosthetists and they took a look at how much they're using outcome measures. And it certainly is improving. So 90% of prosthetic practitioners said that um, they were involved in K-level assignment, which is good. We want practitioners that are making prosthetics involved in K-level assignment. And 70, almost 78% of them reported using outcome measures to help determine that assignment of K-level. Um, they collaborated at 43% with other professionals. Many of those other professionals, I think 87% of the other professionals were physical therapists. So collaborating with physical therapists is a good idea. Um, it looks like 60% or so or 59% use performance-based measures and 34% use self-report. I prefer to use both, and we're gonna talk about both. Um, and 75% of them believed incorporating outcome measures would enhance the objectivity of assessment. And so when we take a look here at, um, at, at the levels over here of how, what patient factors are considered when assigning K-level. So what are prosthetists looking at when they're assigning K-level? So previous activity of the patient, obviously the current health status, the patient's motivation, here's outcome measures down here. Um, so all of these things are taken into consideration. Many of these are very subjective. Patient motivation. I mean, the patient's telling you how motivated they are. There's not really any other way to measure it besides patient report. Um, another thing that I find interesting with this one is that muscle strength is considered when you all are assigning K-level. I ask prosthetists, how are you assessing muscle strength? And they say, well, they're doing a manual muscle test. I will tell you from a PT perspective as a researcher, manual muscle strength testing is not a valid measure. Um, we know it's not valid. And so it's hard to base um, the validity of K-levels on a lot of measures that really aren't valid. Um, outcome measures, and the ones I'm gonna teach you about today, the ones I'm teaching you about are all valid and reliable to use in the amputee population and in some of them in the orthotic population as well. But this was a good study, I liked it. And so if you're interested in it, you wanna look it up. Um, so the current trends in clinical use, there's no consensus on which outcome measures are best to be using to decide K-level or to decide, uh, in, to decide how you're treating your patients in, in your clinics. Um, there's no standard protocol for documentation of mobility and for rehab potential. So I think these things are changing in the prosthetic field, but as of right now, there's no standardization on how you all should be doing this. I'm hoping I'm not the only one in this program of yours that's gonna teach you about outcome measures. I have, I lecture on it when I go to national conferences. I was just at the North Carolina conference in the fall and I was up there in Tampa last spring to talk about outcome measures to prosthetists. Um, so again, um, there's a lot of research going on on prediction. Um, 
on, on what how to predict mobility uh, later on after prosthetic prescription. And so some of these look at um, predicting K level and how outcome measures can predict K level. So using the amputee mobility predictor score and patient characteristics like motivation, past medical history, all these things need to be taken into consideration when you're looking at predicting K level. You can't just say it was one thing that, that played into their K level. So there's a lot of different factors that goes into it. This article did find though that the amputee mobility predictor score alone was able to, at 80% of the time, predict K2 and K3 level um, K3 level uh, ambulators. So again, there are flaws with the amputee mobility predictor, and we'll talk about those when we get to it, but it is a pretty good tool. A lot of people, I think this article over here um, set out to demonstrate that it wasn't a good tool and, and kind of found that it, it was, at least for people at the K2 and K3 level. This is another recent um, publication. It was um, published not too long ago, Comparative Effectiveness Review. If you wanna read it, it's thick, um, but it's online and it talks about every outcome measure in use and its validity and reliability and application to the Medicare population in prosthetics. So it is a really, um, I enjoyed reading it. I use it as a reference a lot. It's something for you to maybe keep as a reference um, somewhere on your computer uh, when you go to use outcome measures. When we talk about outcome measures, I know you've all talked about or heard the words reliability and validity, but we want to make sure that the measures we use are reliable and are valid. Um, those are called psychometrics of an outcome measure. And as a researcher, we work to establish psychometrics. We work to establish tests that can be used that actually tell us what they're supposed to tell us. So when a test is reliable, when we administer it to somebody, does it is it always recording what it's supposed to record consistently every single time we use it? If it does, then it's a reliable measure. Does that measure record what it's supposed to measure though? Is it measuring, um, if we're looking at a, uh, a six minute walk test, which is essentially a, uh, a measure of endurance, how, some, how far somebody can walk in six minutes, um, do we wanna use it as a measure of endurance or are we looking at it as a measure of lower limb strength? Well, it's validated as a measure of endurance. That's what it measures. Does it measure lower limb strength? If it does, there's no studies saying that it does. So it couldn't be a valid lower limb strength measure, not at this point anyway. Um, but we want measures that are both reliable and valid. And so the ones that I'm gonna talk to you about today mostly have those psychometrics behind them. We also talk a little bit about minimal detectable change. So basically, this represents the magnitude of change required to exceed error. It means that when we administer a test to a patient and then we administer it again at a later date, is that difference in those two uh, measurements, is it due to error or is it real change that the patient is showing us? And so these are just some typical um, numbers that we use. I like using, um, for example, the six minute walk test. The six minute walk test, we're gonna talk about it, it measures how far somebody can walk in meters in six minutes. If you do the six minute walk test with Mr. Jones on the first day you see him, and he walks 200 meters in six minutes, and then a month later, after, after um, giving him a, a prosthetic and letting him go home and practice, he comes back and he walks 235 meters in six minutes. Now that's an improvement of 35 meters but statistically, he did not reach the minimal detectable change of 45 meters. So yes, he walked 35 meters greater, but that change in different, uh, the change between the two times could be due to error. He needed to walk 45 meters further for us to say this was a real change in how he performed. So it's important to keep some of these statistics in mind when we're looking at change in our patients. Not every change is, is significant. It could be due to error. Maybe he was having a better day one day versus the other day. Maybe he you know, ate too much the day before or was having prosthetic pain. Um, so there could be differences that we see just due to error. We wanna make sure we keep that in mind. 
So again, these are um, just some graphs of the common outcome measures that are used in prosthetic practice. Um, we can see the amputee mobility predictor is always the main one, followed closely by the PAVIT. That to me is a little disheartening. The PAVIT is a patient assessment validation evaluation test. From my understanding, it is mostly used by practitioners who practice at hangar clinics. It is a clinician reported measure, which again, I'm not a fan of. There is no reliability or validity studies done on this test anywhere. So I know, from my understanding, the hangar clinics cannot prescribe a microprocessor knee to a patient unless they do a PAVIT, but I do not know why insurance companies are demanding to have an outcome measure used on patients that is not reliable and valid. If there are studies being done using this outcome measure, I do not know of them. So I personally don't know anything about it because it's not in the literature anywhere. I would stick with the ones that I know. Um, do you have something, Alex? Yeah, um, right before I came down to school, we had a patient who had come from Hangar and in their like file history, they had done a PAVIT test and were assessed at a K3 like three months before we saw them. And we did the amputee mobility predictor test and they were a K1. So like, <laughs> it's- uh, You know, and I don't want, and I'm usually I'm giving this lecture or this this presentation to prosthetists and, and some of them work for Hanger. And I just want to look at them and say, please don't use this. Not until there are more studies done on it. There's no reliability or validity studies on this test. Yeah, um, but that just goes to show how you need multiple yes. uh, sources. Yeah. yeah, so the amputee mobility predictor, the timed up and go test, your 10 meter walk test, your distance measures, your six minute walk test, your two minute walk test. We're gonna talk about those. We're gonna talk about some tests that are really good. I am not gonna recommend to you guys to do measures that I don't believe in. So again, we're looking at that amputee, amputation continuum, and the only measure that can be done prior to prosthetic prescription, prior to you giving the um, prosthesis to a patient, is the amputee mobility predictor no pro, so with no prosthesis. Um, one of the things I'm going to do for you guys, which I haven't done yet, is put up on Canvas the actual amputee mobility predictor PDF and the instructions for it. There are a lot of bastardized uh, versions of it online and I wanna make sure you guys get the right version, um, right from Bob Gailey's uh, actual, you know, uh, actual dissertation. So I'll make sure that I throw that up on Canvas over the weekend so that you have that as a future reference for you because um, there are some online that are not valid. Um, so incorporating outcome measures into daily practice, working on incorporating self-report measures and performance-based measures, rehabmeasures.org is a great resource through the Shirley Ryan Mobility Lab or Ability Lab up in Chicago. Um, they have tons of outcome measures. Not a lot of them talk about amputees, but the ones I talk to you about here, there are going to be links to those outcome measures on rehabmeasures.org. So it's a great reference. Self-report measures. So these can be administered right in the waiting room while your patients are waiting to come see you. You can hand these to them. I'll have prosthetists tell me that they don't have time to administer outcome measures. Well, give them to them in the waiting room. Well, they don't wanna fill them out. Well, guess what? I go to my doctor's office and whenever I go, they make me fill out a bunch of paper I don't wanna fill out either, but I do it because I'm supposed to. So tell them they have to do it. Make it part of their chart you have to do this outcome measure. It's not like we're asking them to answer a million questions. We're gonna give them outcome measures that are done in a timely manner. So the OPUS is a measure that is used with prosthetic patients, or I'm sorry, um, orthotics and prosthetic patients. Personally, I have not used it very much, but I did want you all know to know that it does exist. Um, it is reliable for use with patients with orthotics and prosthetics. So there is reliability studies done on this. It looks like there's several subscales that can measure lots of different things. So again, if you're interested in the OPUS, do a little bit more research on it. I believe that it is accessible online. Um, this one looks like I downloaded from the Rehab Institute of Chicago. So it's probably on the, the rehabmeasures.org site. Um, 
There is a scoring guide that goes along with it. This is a little bit longer measure, depending on how much of it you want to administer to your patients. It takes 10 to 15 minutes for them to fill it out. Um, but again, there's variability in the literature and how this has been administered. Now, there are psychometrics available. Again, I have not used it personally um, because I don't do a lot of orthotic outcomes, but I just wanted you all to know that it does exist um, and you might want to take a closer look at it. This is a new one that I found just last year, the orthosis comfort score. So basically this is based on the socket fit comfort score that we use with our prosthetic patients. But basically it's a simple question on a scale from zero to 10, if zero represents the most uncomfortable orthosis fit you can imagine, and 10 represents the most comfortable orthosis fit, how would you score the comfort of your orthosis at this moment? So this might be with somebody who comes in wearing an AFO, complaining of comfort, you guys do an adjustment, have them do this before the adjustment, have them do it again after the adjustment. If the score is better, you've, you've essentially shown that you've made an improvement in the patient's at least self-reported comfort. Maybe you didn't improve their function, but you've at least reported, you've at least improved their comfort, which is a good thing. This does have correlations with the opus, um, but there is a weak correlation with how much these people are wearing their AFO. So we might see that people are um, people who report a lot of discomfort may not be wearing their AFO a lot of the time as well. So again, taking a look, I do put the reference down here in the study at the bottom of the slide if you want to take a further look at some of these studies. You've heard me mention this one a bit, activity-specific balance confidence score. This is one that I like to give in the waiting room for people. It's 16 questions asking them how confident they are in keeping their balance while they do these 16 different tasks. 0% is they're not confident at all. 100% is they're very confident in keeping their balance during these 16 tasks. So if they score 100% on this test, it means that they're confident in their balance while wearing their prosthetic limb 100% of the time, no matter what they're doing. Most people don't score 100. Um, so some of the things to keep in mind is that when we looked at, when people, when researchers have looked at geriatric patients, it showed that a score less than 67% on this test means that they were an increased risk for falls. And Brian Hafner out of Washington just released a study late last year that showed if amputees score less than 80%, which isn't that bad if you're considering it's out of 100. If they score less than 80% on this test, they're at an increased risk for falls. So that's something to take into consideration. This is the first time somebody's really taken a look at this with our amputee population. So that's a cutoff score. If you give this to a patient and they're scoring a 73%, you might wanna consider having them go for a balance assessment or if they're not in physical therapy, get to physical therapy because their confidence is showing they're at an increased risk for falls. And again, this one's quick and easy to do in the waiting room. The PLUS M, the Prosthetic Limb User Survey of Mobility. Again, this is out of University of Washington. Um, again, one of Brian Hafner's studies. Uh, this is an ongoing study, uh, terrific psychometrics, very stringent, went through a lot of validity testing, went through a lot of reliability testing. PLUSM.org is the website. Very, very informative. All the, all the instructions on how to use this are there. All the actual tests are there for you to print out. They're free, um, which isn't the case with every single outcome measure, but these are free to everybody. Um, pretty easy to use, pretty easy to score. They have a seven or a 12 item survey. I always use the 12 item survey. Um, it asks how they do with, um, do, how they're doing self-reported mobility with a prosthetic limb. So asking how they're doing with their prosthetic limb. There is a computer-aided testing version, um, which you can purchase. Um, that definitely, there's more information of, about that on their website. Um, Hafner has also talked and published on about what the minimal detectable change on this test would be. Um, and it only takes, it's quick for the patient to fill out, and then it takes the, the clinician just a few minutes to score the test. Um, it's a really good measure of prosthetic mobility. The PEQ, um, the original scoring test, uh, this is used a lot in the literature. Personally, I have not used it um, in research or in patient practice, but it is uh, seen a lot in the literature, and I know lots of people who have used it. 
It originally was 83 questions, but they've got nine subscales. And you can look at all of these different things when it comes to wearing a prosthetic. So it can give you a lot of information. Again, there's some good psychometrics published on this. It's used a lot in the literature. It has been um, modified a couple of times though, um, but in general is a pretty good test to use if you're looking for a self-report measure for your patients. The Houghton scale is another one that gives some interesting information. It's pretty short, just these four questions over here to the side, um, uh, scored between zero and 12. Essentially, if people score greater than a nine, they're considered an independent community ambulator. If they score six to an eight, limited household, less than five, um, I'm sorry, six to eight is unlimited household. That's a typo. Um, uh, less than five is limited ho household ambulator. So there's a lot of um, research that has used this as well. It's a short, quick measure to take. If you don't have time to do the amputee mobility predictor and you wanna have an idea of where your patient might fall with ambulation, this might be a quick one to do just for self-report measure. The LCI, um, again, this is a 14 item subscale of a longer test, but this one um, you tend to might want to use with people that are a little bit lower functioning. Um, your higher functioning ambulators are gonna, are gonna top out on this test probably the first time they take it. So you don't wanna actually reevaluate it with them the next time because they probably topped out the first time. So this one is a good one to use with more of our lower functioning ambulators. I would not recommend it for somebody who's a high K3 or a K4 for sure, because um, they're probably gonna score really well on it initially. All right, I know I'm going through this stuff fast. So your performance, those were all self-report measures. Those were all given to the patient. Patient reports how they do. The next ones we're gonna talk about are the performance-based measures. This is really sort of my specialty area. This is what I have done in um, research. So again, the amputee mobility predictor, I will put the full test on uh, Canvas this weekend, but it helps to assist with K-level determination. And right here are your scores for K-level. AMP No Pro, the scoring is a little different than with the AMP Pro. All right, so no pro again, remember this is their scoring before or without a prosthetic limb. So somebody who takes the AMP no pro before they, this can give you an idea before you actually prescribe the prosthetic limb of where they may fall. And again, you take this into consideration with a lot of other things like comorbidities, like age, like previous, um, previous functional status. Um, but the amputee mobility predictor is 21 functional mobility items that covers constructs like balance, like gait, like turning. Um, it goes from easier to harder as it goes up the scale. Um, it can be performed with or without that, uh, with or without the prosthesis. And there is an amputee mobility predictor bilateral. If anybody is interested in having that test, I can put that one or I can send that one to you. Um, as well, that is used specifically for people who are bilateral amputees. The scoring is adjusted for them if they are um, if they are not bilateral transtibial. Bilateral transtibial um, tends to not get much in the way of scoring adjustments. But the AMP requires minimal equipment. It does take at least 15 minutes to administer, so it's a longer test. This is where you might want to use a local physical therapist to help you. If they're taking, doing the AMP, see what their score is. I think we talked about that a couple of days ago or in the last session. Um, requires this list of equipment here. So nothing that's too out of the ordinary um, when it comes to equipment. Again, the AMP is gonna ask you, do they have a minimum of 12 inches of step length bilaterally? And uh, that's item 15 on the amputee mobility predictor. So remember to take that into consideration when you're looking at their gait. There's also an app that I think is for purchase on the, i. It, you can't get it on iPhone. I think it's only iPad. I think it's 50 or $55. The nice thing about the app is it has built-in timers. The scoring is recorded right away and you have the K level right away. So it does kind of things automatically. It has standardized, um, standardized instructions for the patient. So it's kind of a nice app to have. If you're doing the AMP a lot and you have an iPad, I would suggest you get it. It's a nice, it's, it's, it saves some time. 
The Berg Balance Scale, this is one that we look at when we're specifically wanting to see how they perform with their different balance um, tasks. And so again, there's 14 items. It's gonna look at transfers. It's gonna look at turning and stepping and single limb support. Um, the maximum score is 56 points. Um, there has been more research on this. Again, a lot of these outcome measures come from the geriatric literature, and then they're applied to amputees. And so, um, again, this has also been used with people wearing AFOs, and it does show that people, while they're wearing AFOs, do perform significantly better on certain items. And, and so, again, showing that the AFO that you've provided for this patient helps to improve their balance function could be pretty important um, for you to know. It is a longer test. It does take about 15 to 20 minutes to administer. Um, so again, if it's being done in physical therapy, you might wanna pull this test from their physical therapy practice. The timed up and go test or the tug, again, pretty easy to do, requires minimum space. This is done a lot in prosthetic clinics. Um, you need a chair, some tape or a cone and a timer. So I've thrown some, um, some previous times over here. Uh, it's a variety of times in the literature as to what we're looking at. If we look at a younger population, obviously the times go down for the tug. I will tell you that per the CDC guidelines, if somebody performs the timed up a go test in less than 12 seconds, I'm sorry, in more than 12 seconds, if it takes them longer than 12 seconds to do the tug, they're at an increased risk for falls in general. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to know because a lot of our amputees, even high level amputees, take longer than 12 seconds to perform the timed up and go test. So for my dissertation, I did the component timed up and go, which is a regular tug test, but I was able to, to actually record five different component times. I recorded how long it took them to go from sit to stand, how long it took them to walk to the turn, how long it took them to do the turn itself, how long it took them to walk back from the turn, and how long it took them to turn to sit. And so that way, if it took Mrs. Jones 30 seconds to do the tug, I have a way of knowing if it took her nine seconds just to get out of the chair. So it helped me to record these different components of function while I was, um, while I was doing the standard tug test. And if you're interested more, I have published on this test a couple of times, this is both of the, uh, I looked specifically at the turns in amputees and we did find that amputees turn differently than people with two legs. And we also found that amputees at transtibial level turn differently than am amputees at transfemoral level. Um, so these are articles that I've published that talk a little bit more about this test. I am open to talk to you more about it in the future if you decide you wanna use it in clinical practice. I think it gives some really good in information. It tells you how long it takes how long it takes them to stand up and how long it takes them to turn. That can be very important information. We also had them perform it turning to the prosthetic side and turning to the sound side. We had them perform it twice to take a look at those differences in turning. The 10 meter walk test, this is a good one to incorporate into clinical practice. You do need a fair amount of space. You need about 33 feet of straight walking path. And basically you're gonna put a tape mark at the start two meters in from the tape mark, you're gonna put another tape mark. So from start to finish is 10 meters, but you are only timing the middle six meters of that test. That is where you're gonna get gait speed from. This is a nice way of showing that your patient has variable cadence, okay? That they actually can increase and decrease their gait speed is going to be a way, oh. I, are you getting an amber alert? Sorry that my husband's in the room. I think he's getting an amber alert. <laughs> um, so I think that this is a nice way to show that they're, that they're able to increase and decrease their speed, which is a qualification for a K3 level component tree. Again, this one's used a lot um, in prosthetic practices. Have you all... Has anybody used any of these in the prosthetic clinics that you've been in besides the AMP? Yeah, I've, I've done the tied up and go and 10 meter walk tests. Okay. Are you doing them the same? Are you doing the 10 meter walk tests this way where you're timing the middle six meters? Yeah, yeah, okay. we have the, we just have tape on the floor that stays there in the gate room. Right, okay, good. 
yeah, it's a nice way to sort of reinforce um, again. And if you end up seeing the patient, you know, first time, uh, one of the first times you've seen them and you have them do the 10 meter walk test and you know that they're getting better and more used to their prosthesis in a month, you do it again and see if it's changed. It's just a nice, quick, easy way to measure improvement. The two are the six minute walk test. So again, with this test, there's no standardized path. Sometimes it's around two cones and you have them just continue to sort of walk this kind of circular path around these cones. In, um, in my practice and with research, we like to set up more of a rectangular path. However you do it, just make sure every time you record it with the patient that you're doing it the same way, that you're doing the same distance in the same area and that you're recording it that way. And essentially, you're just measuring in meters how far they can walk in six minutes or how far they can walk in two minutes. The tests are highly correlated, um, over 90%. So essentially, it tells you that whatever the person can do in two minutes, it's going to be able, they're going to be able to, um, it's gonna correlate with what they could do in six minutes. Um, if you have somebody who you don't think can walk six minutes, because of endurance issues, then you're gonna to wanna to do the two minute walk test. But if you have somebody who's gonna be expected to go back to a job, maybe as a nurse, where they're on their feet all day long, I think doing the six minute walk test might be a little more appropriate assessment of their endurance. So both assess mobility and cardiovascular endurance. With this type of test, would you have them just walk a complete circle in one direction or would you have them do kind of like a figure eight? type of thing okay. so they're on and off the prosthetic limb yeah so no it's in one direction just to, no figure eight with this one there is a figure eight test that i don't really talk about um but no this one is staying in the same direction the whole time um dr clements yeah can you also do this on a treadmill no okay <laughs> treadmill walking is just different besides yeah. the fact that they can hold on I mean, if you want to train them on a treadmill just to work on their endurance, that's fine. You don't do the six minute walk test on a treadmill. Good question though. So here's the correlation of six minute walk distance with K level because Bob Gailey did do this when he did his, uh, when he did the AMP study. Um, so K ones are walking at about 50 meters during that six minute walk test. And the way for me to easily remember this is K2s walk about 200 meters, K3s walk about 300 meters, K4s walk about 400 meters. So it gives you a ballpark um, what they do during the six minute walk test is gonna, going to correlate some with uh, their K level as well. And able-bodied during the six minute walk test is about 600 meters or more. I certainly have had amputee patients who've blown through a thousand meters during the six minute walk test, mostly because they they like wanna challenge themselves and wanna work out. But you have them walk as quickly and as safely as they can. The instructions are cover as much distance as possible in these six minutes. So they can't run, but they can walk as fast as they can. The four square step test is another nice one that I like to use. There's more literature coming out on this test and there's more being done in the research. Um, basically, I used this test first with my stroke patients and then noticed that it started being used with my amputee patients as well. And so um, basically in the PT clinic, we set down four canes on the floor and eventually we used it so much, we just set up a, a PVC, a small like half inch PVC pipe grid and we laid it on the floor. And the person starts in square one and they essentially have both feet. Oh, I have a video of this one, I think somewhere. And I didn't load it up. Or right, I might show you at least the four square step test video. I, I can see if I can post that. Um, but they essentially start in square one. And when we say go, they step to square two with both feet. They step to square three with both feet. They step backwards into square four with both, both feet. They go back to square one and then reverse to four, back to three, back to two, back to one. All right, so um, yeah, I'll see if I can get a video of this. You might even be able to find a video of this online. It's, it's starting to be used a lot with different populations, but they have to step over the canes or step over whatever you have laid on the floor. 
I stay very close to my patients during this test. They always have a gait belt on. Even my high level patients have difficulty stepping backwards when they're an amputee. Um, they are allowed to turn around during the test if they need to, but if they can face forward the whole time, it usually makes for a quicker time. Um, so again, earlier studies showed that people with transtibial amputation were at increased fall risk if they performed the four square step test in more than 24 seconds. But a recent study just done in 2019 showed that um, a group of trans transtibial and transfemoral amputees, if it takes them more than eight and a half seconds to do this test, they're at an increased risk for falls. That's not a lot of time. So, but some people can perform it faster than that. Hopefully you and I can perform it faster than that. Um, and then for stroke patients, so again, if you're using this to assess people wearing an AFO, um, you might wanna take a look at the fall risk cutoffs for that group as well. And again, there's more and more literature coming out. And I think you, one of the things we were gonna do in one of our labs is you have an instrumented mat there that measures four square step test. So you're gonna to get to do this later on in the semester or sometime this summer, hopefully. So basically incorporating outcome measures into best practice. That was the list of outcome measures I suggest that you guys look to use in your practices. The pros are gonna reinforce your documentation. It's gonna make a stronger argument for what you wanna do with your patients. Um, it's gonna establish the efficacy of your treatment. It's gonna show that what you do is making a difference. And it's gonna reflect, um, be a reflection of your treatment goals. What are your goals for the patient? What are the patient's goals for themselves? Um, so it's gonna be a reflection of those. The con is it can um, take, take patient care time away, but the solution is trying to give these to them in the waiting room. Maybe you can mail them to them prior to the visit and have them fill them out at home, have a PT that can do some of these for you, or if you've got a resident or a student available that can perform them while you are seeing other patients, that's another way to save time. They do require space, some prep and some equipment, there is a learning curve. You've got to learn to incorporate these into your practice. It's, uh, it's, it's something you're going to have to do. It's harder to get prosthetists who've been practicing a long time to do these because they don't want to do it. <laughs> um, but it's a matter of learning how to incorporate these into practice and accommodate your routine to it. Um, perform them if you can initially at baseline and assuming that their core is gonna change upon reevaluation. And if you can reevaluate them once a month, that'd be great. Again, in therapy, we're doing a reevaluation, reevaluations every two to four weeks with our patients while they're in therapy. If we don't, insurance won't pay us. All right, so we're gonna quickly go through a little bit of falls in people with lower limb amputation. Um, I don't even know what I wrote here, I gotta move my thing. Okay, so just looking at some of this, um, this was a study that was done to just the biomechanics of what they saw in people who were fallers versus non-fallers. So something to look at for your own knowledge. Um, again, this is another study that took a look at with specifically with amputees, what were some of the causes of falling? They're starting to try to figure out classification of falls. You know, was it an issue of the base of support? Did they, did they trip over their toe? Or was it that somebody pushed them? Was it that their center of mass got knocked off balance? So this was another interesting study. I don't expect you to know this information. These are more for your reference um, to take a look at if you're more interested in falls with amputees. So when we looked at starting to try to figure out how do we train people to fall? One thing that we looked to was sports and martial arts. Watch as the football player gets knocked out of the bounds. What does he do? He tucks and he rolls. Is he hurt? Does he get back up with broken bones? No. Yeah, he's young and he's athletic, but relax, roll, and round. So these are things that we're going to talk to our patients about and specifically teaching them how to make themselves round if they feel like they're going to end up falling toward the ground, um, teaching them to tuck their chin, teaching them to turn away from the direction that they're going to fall is important. Uh, I lost my cursor, there we go. So again, taking precedent from martial arts and um, from the military as well. So being able to, this is how paratroopers are taught to land. So again, 
thinking about looking away from the direction that you're gonna fall, tucking the chin. A lot of times we teach landing on the soft parts of the body. So you'll notice they land on the thigh, buttock, and then roll to the back part of the shoulder. So yes, teaching patients to do this. If you've got young active patients, it's gonna be easier than you have an elderly patient who's got vertigo issues. So the first time you try to lay them on their side to teach them to roll, they're gonna to start to get dizzy. But these are the things that we're starting to teach patients in therapy on how to mitigate, mitigate injury with their falls. Tuck yourself in, tuck your chin, look away from the direction of the fall and try to make yourself round. And no, it's not easy to know when you're gonna fall, but at least educating the patient on some of these different techniques, we hope helps to influence what happens when they go to fall. Getting them, um, having them avoid what we call a foosh, which is a fall on an outstretched hand. How many times has a patient fallen or a person fallen and broken their wrist or toned the rotator cuff or ended up with a shoulder fracture? So we wanna avoid having them fall with that arm stretched out. We wanna have them land on their thigh, land on their buttock or the side of their hip, roll to their shoulder. If they try to stop themselves with their arms, they're likely gonna break a bone. Um, so in, in therapy, we try to incorporate floor transfers right away. If they can't get on the floor and get up from the floor, I start by showing them myself how to get up from the floor. Um, and so again, usually um, they're hopefully learning this in physical therapy. If they're not, then as the prosthetist, you need to talk to them about recovering from a fall and how to get up from the floor. And so usually what we'll do is um, we have the patient start on the floor. I try to get them into quadrupeds to so try to get them up onto their hands and knees so they can either crawl or get over to a chair or to a couch or to a bed. Once they are at the chair or couch or bed, I have them put their hands up on that bed or chair and I have them stand up tall on their knees. Then I will have them take their good leg and I will have them bring their good leg up into this position where this woman is. Their prosthetic leg stays down into this bent position. So hands are on a chair, good leg is up in this position and I have them try as much as they can to simply just swing their butt up onto the bed or up onto the chair. So again, going online or going to YouTube to look at how to get up from the floor is not a bad idea. Um, having you, know, you yourself doing it so that you're able to talk to your patients about it or having your patients look on how do I get up from the floor myself. Backward chaining is something that we incorporate um, into our practice. So instead of starting on the floor, I start with the patient in the chair. And so what I'll do is have them up in their chair. And I know you guys can't see me all the way here, but we'll back it up just a little bit. So I'm up in my chair and I will have the patient simply just practice trying to come down off the chair. I'm just realizing you're not gonna be able to see me here come down off the chair just a little bit, bring their foot or their knee down towards the floor and then come back up into the chair. So I have them, depending on how active they are, I have them try to get this knee, their prosthetic knee to the ground and then come right back up. So I'm not having them get all the way down to the ground, I'm having them do it in short spurts. If they can't get their prosthetic knee to the ground, if they're too scared, I'll bring like a bolster in front of them and I'll say, okay, just put your knee on that bolster and go back into the chair. So it's just tiny little practices down and back. If they're able to get all the way down to the floor, then I have both knees come down to the floor. Then I have them bring up their good leg and then I have them get back in the chair. And so we backward chaining is just a matter of breaking it down into tiny little steps, but giving the patient an opportunity to feel like they've achieved something. And so again, hopefully we can have a lab where we talk a little bit more about this. And actually, I don't think this was originally what I was gonna teach you guys. So this is sort of like additional bonus information that you can have. All right, so different interventions that we use. We teach the patient to do log rolling. We teach mat exercises. We teach them to get into four point. We teach them tall kneeling. But most importantly, tucking their arms and hands, 
look away from the direction of the fall, tuck your chin, let the knees buckle. You want to be able to make the body be soft, almost like a crumble zone. Those are things that you can start to talk to your patients about. If you don't remember, come back to the slides and remember these little things. And I'm always going to be a reference for you all if you have or you need more information on these type of things. This is just a nice sheet to have. It's from the British Association Back Park. Just talks a little bit about how they do guidelines for, for prevention of falls in amputees. Some of the studies they cite are geriatric studies and not necessarily amputee studies, but it's something nice for you to have as a tool. Okay, oh, that's it for a lecture. <laughs> I know it's a lot of information um, in a mm. short amount of time. And again, the outcome measures um, were something we were gonna do in class anyway, but we were gonna do them as more of a lab. Um, and then the fall stuff is just sort of bonus information. Um, I think that it's good information to have. I think it's good information to know, or at least to know that you have as a reference. Um, again, like I said, I haven't really written the entire test yet. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna look at is gonna be based on the amputee stuff that we talked about, um, volume, changes and how you accommodate for those what might be causing are the causes of particular gait deviations what might be prosthetic causes what might be patient causes um, maybe what intervention you would use to try to correct that gait deviation prosthetic intervention i'm not going to really expect you to know physical therapy interventions even though we talked a little bit about them um, when it comes to outcome measures I do think that it's appropriate for you to have an idea of what an appropriate outcome measure would be for a particular patient. Um, and then the fall stuff is, I think is gonna be more just for your own general knowledge. I'm probably not going to assess your, we went through it too quickly. Um, and I, so don't worry too much about any of the fall stuff being on the exam. So any questions about anything? I'm going to be available, I'm working. <laughs> because I've got other stuff to do. So anytime you guys have questions, again, you can just email me and I will get back with you um, with answers. Uh, Dr. Clemens, on the, I guess I did want to ask on slide, well, on the um, on the PDF, it's slide 31, but on of outcomes and measures, but what does MWD stand for? Six MWD and corresponding K level. When there's like the K levels and it's got, says six yeah. MWD meters. So meters. Six, minute, six minute walk distance. So it's okay. the distance they walked in six minutes. Sorry about that, yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Anything else at this point? Again, feel free to get a hold of me. Oh, I'm sorry, did you, Victor, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Sorry, your microphone's over. Okay. Um, again, any questions that you have, I will um, be available over the weekend by email for sure. Um, I will go ahead and post the amputee mobility predictor and the instructions for it, just for your own knowledge to have as a future practitioner. I wanna make sure you guys have the right version. Um, the other versions that I showed you on the slides are current versions. You know, like I said, plusm.org is a great reference. Rehabmeasures.org is a great reference for outcome measures. But I want you to, outcome measures is my thing. So, you know, have an idea about what we talked about when, with outcome measure use. All right. Then I think we're done for now. Um, I think that uh i gotta check with emily but i think that on tuesday also we'll do some sort of a review over the exam um and uh we'll kind of go from there okay and i need to talk to her anyway about adding that extra point um to you guys on that exam i forgot to tell her that i will make sure i do that all right so have a good weekend stay healthy you said on tuesday we would have a review for the exam no tuesday i think we're going to review the exam the review. Okay, okay. I thought the, I was like, oh, I thought it was Monday. Yeah, the exam's Monday. We'll review <laughs> any concerns on the exam Tuesday. Gotcha. Yeah. If you have any questions over the weekend, just get a hold of me. Cool. All right. All right. Sounds good. All right. Sounds good.
Okay. All right. Talk to y'all later. Bye. 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 Uh,